Welcome to the 34th Annual Research Seminar. It's really very nice to see the Hall School after three years. We are pleased to start the inaugural session. So I now invite on stage the dignitary. Forest Service. He's also held many posts in the academic sector. He's the first registrar of the ISER uh, Tiruvananthapuram. He was the social welfare director of social security in Bihar and the tourism director of Bihar as well. Without uh, further delay, I would now request our research coordinator, Dr. Bitapit Sinha, to kindly uh, deliver her welcome remarks. Thank you, Vishnu. Good morning to all of you and namaskar. Uh, on behalf of the Director Wildlife Institute of India, I welcome you all to the 34th Annual Research Seminar. I welcome Dr. Rajesh Gopal, Chairman Training Research and Academic Council, as the seminar chair. Shri Bharat Jyoti, Director IGNFA, as the guest of honor for this event former directors and former faculty members of the Wildlife Institute of India, chief wildlife wardens, members of the TRAC, chairman of ICSAP, forest department officials, colleagues from sister organizations, guests from civil organizations, faculty colleagues, officer trainees of the postgraduate diploma course, presenters, researchers, and students, welcome to one and all. It feels great to be back in this auditorium after a gap of three years. The annual research seminar began in 1986 with the objective of showcasing the research initiatives of the Institute and disseminating the research findings with the academic fraternity and field managers. From a handful of presentations and about 100 participants, in the FRI auditorium, we have come a long way to 74 presentations in different categories and themes and approximately 700 participants this year. This is a testament to the Institute's commitment to advancing the wildlife research and conservation for decades. The annual research seminar is also a platform for discussions on the outcomes and implications of the research being carried out by the Institute. The technical sessions focus on ecological studies, conservation and development, long-term research on large mammals, technological interventions in wildlife conservation, 
and aspects of reintroduction. I'm confident you all will enjoy the breadth of research ideas and multidisciplinary approaches used in solving various conservation issues across the country. Once again, I welcome you all to the 34th Annual Research Seminar. Thank you. Thank you. I now request our Director Shivendra Patrick to kindly deliver his address. Good morning to all. Chairman Track, Dr. Rajesh Gopal, Director IGNFA, Shri Bharat Jyoti Sir, Registrar and Dean, Dr. Satyakumar, Research Coordinator, Dr. Bitapi Sinha, Esteemed Members of Track, Dr. Eric Bharucha, Chairman ICSAP. Distinguished guest, ex-director Dr. Mathur, Dr. Mukherjee, retired scientist from WI, retired faculty members, all the partnering states, my faculty colleagues, officer trainees of diploma course, all researchers, MSc students, representatives of media, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to 34th ARS. The ARS started in 1986, so we are meeting after a gap of three years. The last ARS was in 2019, and now we are back again. Uh, sir, for your information, we had internal ARS on uh, 12th, between 12th to 14th, we had about uh, 60 presentations. And now here we are presenting most of our research, which, which is almost complete or on verge of completion. WI's research agenda is decided and guided by track, which is comprising of eminent conservationist, academician, representative of scientific organization as well as state wildlife department. It ensures that we conform to the national conservation priorities. Of course, it depends on the funding agency or the source of fund and major funding agency is MOEFCC, National Campa, Ministry of Jal Shakti, Department of Science and Technology and of course many state governments also sponsor the projects. Track meets twice a year to oversee and review the ongoing research and set tone for the future programs. We adopt multidisciplinary landscape approach involving studies of ecological, biological and socio-economic parameters related to ecosystem and species. Preference for studies on species that need attention, especially those facing or in imminent threat of degradation. Also species recovery program, adhering issues of wildlife crime through wildlife forensic research and development, studies addressing protected area and people interface, mitigating impact due to developmental projects are also high on our priority. Emerging infectious diseases and animal health monitoring, management of wildlife in captivity, that is also the area where we had been working. WI has super headed monitoring of large carnivores in large landscapes use of modern tools and technology in wildlife monitoring, management of conflicts and landscape level research and management. We had also been working in the area of reintroduction of tiger, cheetah, 
gaur and other herbivores for next two days our scientists and researchers shall be showcasing our work through their presentations speed talks and poster presentation so this year we also have uh, second uh, also uh, merged with us and uh, we have scientists and students from sekon also who will be presenting their work it is a good opportunity to learn discuss future course of action and progress further i compliment our research coordinator dr bitapi sina and all my faculty colleagues who are involved in organizing this ars i once again welcome you all to wis 34th ars thank you thank you sir as is the tradition i now request our dean dr s satyakumar to give his presentation on the research activities and accomplishments of wis activities Thank you, Dr. Vishnu Priya, distinguished dignitaries on the dais, distinguished guests, uh, my faculty colleagues, diploma trainees, researchers, students, ladies and gentlemen. It's my privilege to make a short presentation about the research activities and accomplishments at the Wild Rivers of India during the last year. We have been mandated to nurture the development of wildlife science and promote its application and conservation. and research has been a very integral part of our activities in institute for the last three and a half decades research to help wildlife management addressing research gaps and also looking at keeping abreast of ourselves with the latest tools and techniques and also trying to align our research in coordination with the national wildlife action plan as of as on today we have 79 research projects that are ongoing of which about 50% are externally aided or 25% that are funded by the ministry and about 10 11% by the national tiger conservation authority and the rest by the department of science and technology uh, we have a very strong force of 660 plus research scholars who are working in the various projects at the institute looking at the footprint WI continues to do pan india research we are doing work into the entire length and breadth of this country all the blue dots you see here on the map are areas where we have worked for more than 5 years and the red dots indicate areas where we are working for about the less than 5 years so the current themes of research that WI is involved in is about monitoring large animals we are continuing this and for the last 5 6 years special species conservation programs landscape level research planning and management ecology and behavior of species mitigation of impacts due to uh, developmental projects human wildlife interface issues and management planning to begin with wi npca and the ministry and all the forest departments of tiger range states have actively worked together for estimating tiger population and monitoring them since 2006 in the last exercise which is the fifth in cycle over 6.4 lakh band days 6.4 food surveys that food surveys 3.24 lakh habitat plots over 40 million photographs of wildlife based upon 32000 remotely triggered camera traps obtaining about 98000 tiger images we estimated the tiger population of 3682 and the rate growth rate of tiger population since 2006 is about 6 per annum the leopard population estimation analysis also is nearly complete and the figures will be out by the end of this year in the last uh, survey uh, m snipes app was extensively used about 24000 android phones were used by all the staff 
in the for the phase one data collection for carnivore survey as well as these line transect for herbivores. This actually reduced a lot of human error and manual data uh, compilation efforts. MSTRIPES is an informed decision making system that has been used by uh, in ECA and WA in all the tiger results since 2011. And it is a very useful tool to understand the patrolling efforts of our wildlife staff in all the tiger results. The map to your right shows the extent of patrolling done in the different tiger results by the field staff. WA also coordinates the national level snow leopard population estimation assessment in collaboration with WWF and the Nature Conservation Foundation. We have completed exercises in four states and three union territories, and the numbers will be officially announced uh, in the next month. Moving on to the four major projects that CAPA has funded for recovery of endangered species. The first one is of the British Indian Bustard, followed by Dolphin, Dewbong, and Sangai. With, in collaboration with the Rajasthan Forest Department, Wildlife Institute of India has established three conservation breeding centers. We have a founder population of about 29 GIB and 14 lesser production as on today. Uh, in the Desert National Park, information on population status and breeding patterns of GIB and uh, lesser floristan are being monitored through telemetry. Uh, the critical threats to GIB, that is nest predators, that is uh, the foxes, and also the power lines. So efforts are uh, being taken up to mitigate these by removing the uh, whole, uh, foxes and also advocating on the power to mitigate uh, the power line uh, threats. Uh, Ganga Dolphin Project has completed more than five years. So we have now standardized the protocol for monitoring them. So a combination of dolphin recordings across the monitoring, uh, visual, uh, visual encounter surveys, and uh, estimation of fish catch per unit volume, all three have been integrated in trying to understand the dolph uh, uh, dolphin abundance along the river stretches. And this methodology is now be being used in the Ganges and Brahmaputra systems to estimate uh, dolphin abundance and their monitoring. Based on the recommendations of the Wildlife Institute of India uh, to pr protect dugong and its tree grass, tree grass habitats, about 500 square kilometer area in Park Bay has been declared as a dugong conservation reserve by the Tamil Nadu government. For Sangai, based on our six years of study and the earlier studies by WII, an integrated management plan has been developed. Population monitoring of Sangai and Hongbear has been completed and also for establishing a conservation breeding center has also been developed and they are all in uh, uh, being impl under implementation. Moving on to the reintroduction programs, again, uh, under the collaboration with uh, the Ministry, NTCA, and uh, the State Forest Department of Madhya Pradesh, WA has provided technical inputs for the cheetah reintroduction program. My colleague will be making a detailed presentation on this in session one. The other program is of gaur reintroduction in Madhya Pradesh. A food, 16 gaur from Sakura and 28 from Thana were recently relocated, and two Sanjay where they were uh, exterminated some years ago. And this was a very successful uh, program, and the reintroduced gaur are being monitored now. Impacts of climate change on wildlife and their habitats in the Indian Himalayan region is being carried out. Uh, for the last six years now, the phase two of the National Mission for Sustaining Himalayan Ecosystem is underway uh, in four river basins of the Indian Himalayan region. Very useful information on the species, their climate uh, impacts on these species and habitats, and using ensemble models to understand their uh, uh, future uh, habitats or refugia and management plans are in place. The other larger project is the National Mission for Clean Ganga, NMCG project which has got six components, and we are in the second phase of the project, and excellent work has been done uh, under this project in, uh, for the conservation of Ganga using biodiversity, biodiversity as indicators. Another project along with Ganga is a jealous project. It is a concept to link, link local communities with the biodiversity of Ganga through livelihood diversification, promotion of local produce, and strengthening women participation. Other rivers like Kaveri, Narmada, uh, Barak uh, and other rivers in South India are being monitored now and so ecological assessment of these rivers have also been made and uh, documents have been submitted to the uh, Ministry of Jal Shakti and uh, concerned forest departments for monitoring. The first ever range-wide survey for river dolphins is currently underway under the Dolphin Action Plan. About 8,500 kilometers of river have been surveyed Around 29 rivers uh, spanning across 200 days, and uh, 
all this information is being currently analyzed to help us understand about the uh, population estimates of river uh, dolphin in both Ganges and Brahmaputra. Apart from the four species, other 18 species identified by the Ministry of Environment for Sea Climate Change are being monitored. Population monitoring of these 18 species and their habitat are currently underway uh, in collaboration with all the forest departments where WI is trying to standardize methodologies to monitor these populations in these areas. Uh, and this is being under, uh, carried out under the integrated development of wildlife habitats. Now moving on to the various ecology and behavior uh, research projects, we are looking into movement ecology of wolf, parasit cat, marmot, ecology of fishing cat, clouded leopard, status of swamp deer in Uttarakhand, distribution of pangolins and hispid hair and so on and so forth. And uh, uh, regarding birds, we are looking at house sparrows and uh, uh, barn swallows in the Indian Himalayan region and trying to understand their population. And also looking at the migratory patterns of vultures in Pongdang area of Himachal Pradesh and also of the rain birds. And which is uh, migration into India is also coinciding with the monsoon season. Uh, 25 co king cobra nests have been monitored by our research team to understand about the preferences of uh, temperature inside and outside the nest. Our uh, data logger monitoring indicates that the temperature inside the king cobra nest are maintained at a norm of 24 degrees, which is warm and constant, whereas the external temperature keeps fluctuating despite the different elevation ranges and habitat types. Uh, we have the largest genetic database of Indian one-horned rhinos, and uh, 25 rhino poaching cases have been solved successfully by WI uh, through this uh, project. Uh, and uh, we also have identified the rhino populations based on their body condition and health, and also assess the rhino evolution. And all this will be presented in the ARS. Based on genetics, software population has been estimated as about 10,000 animals in the tiger range states of India. Uh, there has been a six uh, decline signal uh, around 15,000, 10,000 years as well as 500 years in all areas and most uh, significantly in the Terai region. The most diverse areas are Central Indian and the Eastern Guards of Swartberg populations, which seem to be also indicating that there was a region of evolution. Some years ago, we had geotagged tagged polyvagal turtles in the east coast of India. Recently, in collaboration with Mangrove Foundation, Maharashtra, we had uh, collared seven tag, uh, tagged seven polyvagal turtles and looked at their movements. And very interestingly, yes, all of them moved down south up to the coast of Sri Lanka, and such useful information is being uh, compiled for the use of uh, monitoring these polyvagal turtles in the, along the Indian coast. In the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, WI is doing excellent work, particularly on the monitoring mangroves uh, using. Uh, the sediment rates in Indian mangroves using broad surface elevation tables uh, in 17 monitoring sites. This is a new methodology and we hope to get some good results in this area. And also in a very interesting study on the reticulated pythons from the Nicobar Archipelago. We hope to get some interesting results from this study too. Uh, our studies on the alpine plants continue. Uh, survey for rare, endangered and aromatic plants. Uh, their exploitation, their status are all being done in the high altitude area, documented and reports submitted. The influx of uh, invasive plant species in the uh, areas is being investigated intensively in Rajaji the Tiger Reserve, where we understand that uh, the lantana is showing complex effects on soil nutrients and native plant biodiversity, and the only way to deal with this is control and also restoration of habitats side by side. Uh, contributing to mitigation planning of impacts is one major uh, area where WI has been contributing. And as you see from the map here, there are several areas starting from uh, Mandaltan firing range in Ladakh to railways to roadways to airports to uh, Indo Nepal uh, roads, uh, also uh, leaf flows in Arunachal and so on and so forth. WI has been actively getting inputs uh, for mitigation of these impacts. A few examples are here. Uh, in Jerovin Airport, WI investigated the impacts of uh, birds to uh, flights, and our studies indicate that at the airport itself, uh, parakeets and host crows are going to be a major threat because they use those areas intensively and can be a major risk for air operations. But if you look at the larger area around the airport, up to 10-15 kilometers radius, which is the garbage dumps, 
and black tanks and other volatile, other raptors that are operating in this area could be a major risk for uh, the air, air operations. We have informed the mitigation measures to the airport uh, authority in their uh, in Arunachal Pradesh, in uh, for the Nam, Nam Chang Chu hydropower project, uh, we calculated the inflow in the areas where black lake plains are wintering, and we specified it as 22 months in the uh, mean season winter. But the project proponent could not meet this criteria, and hence the project was dropped, and we have saved the wintering grounds of the black lake plain in Arunachal Pradesh. Also, looking at gibbons which suffered from habitat fragmentation. We have given a report to the Assam government of using, designing and using artificial canopy bridges that would help pull up gibbons to move across areas where we have got areas uh, fragmented due to railway lines. Moving on to the central and southern India, we have done again a few works. We continue to monitor the underpasses of National Highway 44 range in Maharashtra, where 21 wild animals use the underpasses and over at least 20 unique tigers have used these areas. To cross the, uh, these areas. The Samridhi Maha Mark uh, that does not intersect any of the protected areas, WI has provided inputs in at least uh, ensuring that there are eight wildlife underpasses and overpasses. And this has been integrated in the planning stage itself. For instance, India will get its first wildlife overpass in this area. A detailed presentation is slated in the session one on this. Also, we have an opportunity to offset. 150 years of ecological harm with science and state of the art knowledge in the project that is the doubling of Yanaiga to Kulam railway line. This is a pictures area, and this area is going to have get us double tracking very soon. Management planning is something that we do in, uh, very seriously in our diploma program as well as trying to help the forest departments in every state. Uh, here, under the support of NTCA, uh, Landscape level management plan for the Kane Betwa and Panda Tiger Reserve, Kajuranga Tiger Reserve, and Baksa have all been carried out and the report submitted to the Forest Department for implementation. Human wildlife interface issues are being, uh, are, are being investigated by the Institute in all the areas, ranging from the mountains to the coast, and uh, uh, site specific measures are being suggested for implementation. We also have a, uh, do the regular uh, analysis of wildlife forage samples referred to us by the forest department, courts, police, and customs. In the last five, six years, we have been regularly getting around 200 to 250 cases, and we have now cleared almost 93% of the cases and only uh, about 7% is pending. This year, we also inaugurated the Pashmina uh, Certification Center. Uh, Honorable Minister was here to inaugurate the center. This is to support the exporters of Pashmina uh, shawls. Uh, and WI now authenticates the products and issues unique IDs so that the traders can now export them easily. And this center is now started examining shawls by the businessmen for exports. Coming to the significant contributions made by WI, we have contributed 12 new species to science including the Patai green tree frog, newly discovered in Namdapa Tiger Reserve. Two new reptile snake genera have been added, rediscovered 10 species that are thought to have been lost, 12 new country records. Also, we have settled the taxonomic dispute of the, on the Mahanadi Mahashi based on genetics and morphological uh, taxonomy. As on date, 196 PhD thesis in wildlife sciences have been awarded. 21-22, we had uh, 26 students getting their PhD, and uh, this last year, uh, about 13 students were awarded with their PhDs, and 23 have registered. We also did very well in publications in national and international peer reviewed impact factor journals and our cumulative impact factor is 170. Our research-based communications are also guiding policies. For instance, we published these two communications in the journal Science to talk about protecting the headwaters of uh, the Himalayan rivers, as well as trying to suggest some rerouting of railway lines for conserving the India's gibbons in northeastern India. As mentioned by our director, Saturn has been merged with WIL, and uh, we now will have a significant uh, footprint now, as well as our volume of work, particularly research, 
will be enhanced by our colleagues at SACON. So we are looking forward to, and you will be hearing more about WI SACON, our South India Centre's work in the next year's ARS. So the path ahead is WI will continue to strengthen conservation by linking science with policy and practice. Our activities uh, would be to generate uh, science-based information and share it with our partners, major stakeholders of the forest department, the ministries, the state government, and so uh, our decision makers and policy planners can use this information and all our national conservation agencies and partners will be working together. So ultimately, we are looking forward to improving the quality of science, integrating science with conservation, and influencing policy and action in the field. With this, I thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I'm sure that no means need to summarize all the research activities in such a short term. Uh, we will now have a release of publications that have emerged from the research activities carried out by WIR. So um, I request uh, the dignitaries and thanks to kindly come forward for the release of the publications. Presentation. The first publication is Understanding the Amur Falcon uh, Breast Stop Over Sites in Nagaland and the Tracking Migration Route for Better Conservation Planning. I invite uh, the principal investigator of this project, Dr. R. Suresh Kumar, researchers Amarjeet Kaur and Alex Jacob, to kindly come on the board. To address the issue of large scale hunting of Amur Falcon in Nagaland in 2012, MOSPC directed WII to initiate a study on this species, which is a long distance passage migrant to parts of Northeast India. Given very little was known about this species, satellite tracking of Amur Falcon was taken up in November 2013 to understand their stop over sites in India and their migration. This was also taken up to support conservation efforts to create awareness among local people and bring a halt to the hunting of the birds. The Amur Falcon Conservation Initiative gradually evolved into a long term study and, along with the conservation efforts in Nagaland, spread to other parts of Manipur state where again hunting of falcons was a major problem. Today, there is a complete stop to the hunting of the falcons and has become the biggest conservation success story in the world. Year after year, since 2013, the falcons now fly free on the passage to Northeast India. The next, uh, the next publication is by Dr. Abhijit Das and Vishupat Barwa. It's a perfect guide to amphibians of Namdaka Tiger River. This booklet showcases the incredible diversity of amphibians from the easternmost Tiger River of India. I request the PI and the researchers to kindly come on stage. It has live photographs of 37 species representing all amphibian orders. Natural history photographs depicting eggs, tadpole, and breeding behaviors, and QR codes for amphibian calls, including two endemic frogs of Namdaka. The next publication is by Dr. Riti Uniyal, Distinguished Professor, Rotak University, Haryana, and Dr. Amit Kumar. It's on Haryana State Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan 2021 to 2030. I also invite researchers Dr. Vikram Prabhu, Mona Chauhan, and Ivana Das Sarkar to kindly come on stage. The Wildlife Institute of India and the Haryana State Biodiversity Board jointly prepared Haryana State Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan 2021-2030. The action plan has been prepared in accordance with Convention on Biological Diversity Guidelines, Biological, Biological Diversity Act 2002, and post-2020 global, global Biodiversity Framework. The action plan will serve as a roadmap to arrest and reverse the loss of biodiversity and ensure its conservation in natural ecosystems. 
protected areas, Ramsar sites, important bird areas, key conservation areas, and urban environments besides taking care of agrobiodiversity and agriculture dominated state of Haryana. The next publication is uh, on the status of threatened medicinal and aromatic plants and their use by Bokeh community in Niti Valley, Nanda Devi Biosphere Reserve, Uttarakhand. I invite the principal investigators Dr. Ramesh Kumar and Dr. B.S. Adhikari to kindly come on stage. The Wildlife Institute of India explored the cold, arid, and trans Himalayan region of Nanda Devi Biosphere Reserve to study threatened and high yield value medicinal plants with a focus to assess the population status, abundance, and their use. The study highlights that the population of the threatened species are rapidly declining due to excessive exploitation, unscientific, illegal, and premature harvesting. Considering the threats in view, WIA has developed a sustainable harvesting and cultivation framework for the threatened species of the cold area of Nanda Devi Biosphere Reserve. We now have the next publication on artificial canopy bridge design to facilitate western goal of ribbon crossing over Mariani Big Brother Broadway's single track railway line in Shilongkar Bhuvan Sanctuary, Assam. I invite Dr. Gopi Jivi and Rohit Jha to kindly come on stage. On the request of the state for, uh, of the Assam State Forest Department, the Wildlife Institute of India provided specific design input towards the installation of artificial canopy bridges at the Hulongar Bhuvan Sanctuary. This report provides design guidelines and considerations as well as specific location-wise details of seven potential sites within the sanctuary for such canopy bridges installation. Following thorough literature survey, team data collection and interaction with stakeholders such as forest department officials, team staff, railway officials, consultants, and local conservationists, we recognize and emphasize that the design, successful installation, and post-installation monitoring of canopy bridges requires the involvement of several individuals with professional expertise in fields such as forestry, ecology or climatology, engineering, and mountaineering or climbing. Post installation, monitoring of the canopy bridge structures, both behavioral observations of animals around canopy gaps and installed structures as well through arboreal camera traps to assess bridge use is one of the most important aspects of this project. We now have the influence of tectonic shift, uplift, and subsidence on the carbon stock dynamics of mangrove forests of the Andaman Islands. I invite Dr. Nehru Pravakaran, the principal investigator, and Anu, Tirumurugan, and Shamna to kindly come on to that. This study has taken advantage of the sea level change scenarios available across the Andaman Islands to elucidate the dynamics of carbon stock and above ground biomass in mangroves under varying sea level change scenarios. Also, it provided important management recommendations and emphasized on the capacity building of forest department staff to scientifically recover the pristine mangroves of the Andaman Islands. The final publication of today for release is the ecology of clouded leper in an East Himalayan biodiversity hotspot. The PI, uh, Dr. Salvador Lindo, uh, can you please kindly come up on the board? The main, the main and clouded leopard Neophilus nebulosa is categorized as vulnerable on the IUCN red list and considered at high risk of extinction in the wild. Despite this, knowledge of its ecology and population status remains limited. The study investigated the population density, habitat utilization, and spatial and temporal ecology of the clouded leopard in Manus National Park, Northeast India. This study contributes to our understanding of the main and clouded leopard population and its behavioral ecology. The study has led to one PhD seven impact factor articles, two international abstract presentations, three national presentations, and one NFC. I now um, request for the next agenda meeting. Uh, invite Shri Bharat Jyoti Ayate, Director of IG Metro, the guest of honor for today, to kindly deliver his remarks. Dr. Rajesh Gopal, Chief Guest of today's function, Sri Tiwari, Director, Wildlife Institute of India, 
डॉक्टर सत्य कुमार डीन एंड रजिस्ट्रार डॉक्टर बितापी सिन्हा रिसर्च कोऑर्डिनेटर वाइल्ड लाइफ इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ इंडिया एस्टीम मेंबर्स ऑफ ट्रैक वाइल्ड लाइफ इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ इंडिया माय सर्विस कोलीग्स वेटरन फॉरेस्टर्स एंड वाइल्ड लाइफर्स एंड प्रीवियस डायरेक्टर्स ऑफ वाइल्ड लाइफ इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ इंडिया माई फैकल्टी फ्रेंड्स ऑफ डब्ल्यू आई 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 कैन कॉल दैम फ्रेंड्स एज आई एम ए फैकल्टी ऑफ आई जी एन एफ ए रिसर्च फेलोज एंड स्कॉलर्स एंड द प्राउड प्रजेंटर्स ऑफ एनुअल रिसर्च सेमिनार आई एम रियली डिलाइटेड टू बी अमंगस्ट यू एंड ग्रेटफुल टू डायरेक्टर वाइल्ड लाइफ इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ इंडिया टू ज्वाइन दिस इवेंट इट्स अ occasion of celebration of the scientific and professional pursuits associated with that uh, i think half a dozen uh, 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 research reports are also on human social dimension i find and i feel that policy and governance issues in the research area is still lacking and i would expect or i would uh, 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 you can say uh, uh, recommend wildlife institute of india to take up that gap area also in a big way in coming years and make a beginning right now because policy and governance issues 
are also very important in these days to real to really make changes in and come out with impacts that is required for uh, the this the the transition and the transformation of the state that the nation is undergoing all the pressures and demands and imperatives of economic and infrastructure development so uh, i think ministry has also taken up uh, not many uh, transformative changes and initiatives however i feel that still there may be areas of gaps areas of deficits and deficiencies and the research and investigation in policy and governance issues in the wildlife and conservation arena is important and that would unravel and maybe the the balancing would also be done in a uh, effective manner re-strategization of our conservation uh, focus reordering of priorities also i think is an area that is required to be addressed in substantive manner through research in policy and and uh, 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 governance issues in wildlife areas as a as a nation uh, on the conservation uh, arena uh, our our accomplishments are really outstanding but at the same time uh, 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 that uh, that that feature of outstanding comes out when we compare with others of course we must compare with others and have a sense of comfort and have a sense of self accomplishments to move ahead but at the same time we also need to compare with our own performance and try to outgrow our own uh, 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 credibility our own accomplishments our own endeavors because the the challenges are also daunting and the challenges are also expand day by day and another 3 to 4 decades what i foresee would be something uh, how we actually in the conservation arena how we perform how we strategize how we set our priorities that will have a long term impact maybe for another 4 to 5 decades or for this 21st century so when we talk of mainstreaming we also must think of broad streaming and a lot of importance is also to be given while the annual research seminar and while the research outputs they 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 come out with research findings uh, but there is always a need for uh, you can say reducing the gap between the practitioner's perspective and the researcher's perspective of course it is a continuous process we have made a lot of progress in that direction but still i feel that that meeting ground has to be strengthened have to be firmed up and more of actionable outputs have also to be delineated in recommendations in consultation in dialogue and discussion with the practitioners so that would give uh, a real utilitarian value to most of the research works and i find that this this the, the abstracts are really most of them are very uh, action oriented very very action oriented and wildlife institute of india delves into that only but at the same time it is also for the state forest departments and other agencies uh, uh, not only for the department but other agencies that handle so many land areas and the projects to really make the best benefit of these research outputs and Uh, and both way traffic is necessary i think uh, with these few words and remarks i would uh, close whatever i had to say and would like to uh, by myself and the house to listen to our uh, uh, chair person of this
uh, event, Dr. Rajesh Gopal, who has been an uh, inspiration to me and to many of us in this hall. Thank you and Jai Hind. Thank you, sir, for your observation, and it certainly gives us a lot of thoughts for introspection and re-evaluation, especially on bridging the gap between practitioner's perspective and research perspective. I'm sure we'll be working towards that. I now request the chief guest of today, Dr. Rajesh Gopal, IFS and track chairman, to kindly deliver his inaugural address. My dear colleague, uh, Shri Viren Tiwari Ji, uh, Dr. Bharat Jyoti, Dr. Satya Kumar, Dr. Bita Pishina, and um, Dr. S.K. Mukherjee Saab, was we have had a very long association, was director and prior to that DDNR, so I just I, uh, really I am uh, honored to see him here. So it's good to see him and of course Mathu Saab, both of them, Tomar Saab, Dr. Flekar and uh, Dr. Barucha, Vinyal Saab, Negi Saab. Um, our uh, esteemed colleagues, others might have missed out. It's very good to be here and all young scientists who are out there. So I'm really delighted. I'm grateful to the government of India for um, giving me this opportunity to be remain associated with Wildlife Institute of India uh, as the chair of the track. So, and I'm also, of course, <laughs> Uh, grateful to the director and his dedicated team for giving me this chance. <coughs> Thank you so much. I have seen this institute literally grow. Why I say this? Because I did my fourth diploma when there was a director in one of the wings of the FRI. The fourth diploma course we did, the most important thing, you know, professional thing that was in my career. Very enriching and we, have had, we had a lot of committed people, uh, we now have them as well. So then subsequently the institute, the foundation was laid in the 80s and so on and so forth. So much has been done. And people have spoken before me about the research seminars which were held in the past. Of course, there was a break because of the COVID and all that. I'm glad it has resumed and resumed in a big way. I was going through that uh, document and what Vishnu Priya had sent, Dr. Sinaji has sent, had sent to me. A lot of thematic areas. So much has been uh, are listed out there. I'm eagerly waiting to hear you guys. It's uh, very interesting. I'm sure it will be rewarding and for us to shape up the future map, roadmap. So one or two general things. Um, uh, the thematic areas are excellent. So if, uh, if I remember, we have a lot of lead talks and they cover several uh, thematic areas which are very relevant and in the present context. Then we have a very important session on carnivore ecology, avian eco, then followed by avian ecology, some speed talks, then aquatic habitat is not left out. It is also discussed. It's a mixed bag of articulations covering so many different themes which are interlinked to each other. Great. Uh, so it sounds very good. and. Uh, I wish to add that the track, whatever we discussed in the last track meeting, uh, we have received subsequently based on the observations uh, emerging from the track. They have synced the agenda with the, of the, uh, the National Wildlife Action Plan drawn by the, released by the ministry. 
and also it's in sync with the SDG goals and the other related CBT targets and so on. So it's very important because uh, whatever we do here, uh, whatever insights we gain from this, this research, which are encompassing several thematic areas, those insights uh, will help us to do more, more for these species. And we need to we need to see these species. We need to tell people these are not just species which we, we are investing or we're trying to <coughs> save for someone to come and photograph or someone to see and enjoy. That of course remains that you could do them and all that, but they are sentinels of climate change, bulk of them, most of them rather. And what needs to be impressed upon the, uh, in every research project, uh, irrespective of the thematic area, whatever you are covering, ultimately the, the one major overarching gain uh, which would emerge is that uh, the species uh, which you are projecting or which you are which you are regarding which you have added more or the theme on which you have worked and got some insights will um, strengthen the roadmap for a multi-dimensional surrogate indicator whether it's a plant whether it's an animal uh, it is the in thing you see we are undergoing we are living in an era where we are changing uh, our landscape. And no country is an exception to this. It's a global phenomenon and uh, uh, the developing countries are, uh, I mean, changing fast. What was there 50 years before is not there now. Case in point are your tiger reserves. Um, yeah, I mean, it's almost 38 years have been associated with this tiger reserves. If you do the simple uh, 10 kilometer uh, remotely sensed in data analysis, you know, fragmentation analysis, the distance of 10 kilometer from the boundaries of these reserves, the core area, uh, see the kind of metrics which are emerging. So much of patch density, what was there intact is not now intact, bound to happen. So much of pressure, so much of development agenda. So the challenge is the research, uh, the research is required to uh, uh, conserve species which are conservation dependent species. Bulk of them are conservation uh, demanding species, how to save them so that the conservation is not seen as a drag on development. That is usually the case. When we present something, when we say something about a go area or a no-go area, then people say, I mean, this, is, um, this has to happen. And they may be right because economic development is important. So uh, we need to, all our projects, whatever insights, whatever findings are there, they should tell the policy makers and the general public as such, they should convey the message that this is something which is going to bring gains not only to the biodiversity at large, but also to the well-being of society. So it's a multi-dimensional index. In that way, we present it, it gets into the CBD targets and also the climatic goals. Whatever um, habitat, um, after gaining insights through your research, plant or animal, whatever habitat you are conserving, See, it's going to lock up carbon, it's going to do so many things. So saving all these species means, it's a ma I mean, you have to project them as a mascot for livelihood. Uh, most of us may, some of us may be aware that more than 50 lakh man days are generated annually through tiger investment. Uh, um, recently, um, in the last session, perhaps last, last session, the looks and uh, in, in a reply to a question, this was given by the ministry. Uh, center and state so shared responsibility, so much of investment is happening. Now this is, uh, I mean, the gains on tiger front means so much of tiger bearing forests you are saving, so much of undergrowth you are saying, you are, the carbon gets locked up above soil, below soil, uh, the sequestration processes are there. So, and then you have the ecosystem services, the multiplication effect of these services, the gains to the society, and then uh, so many other things, you know, like uh, 
Um, uh, the people get the uh, money for going around along with the forest front line, the tiger front line, community stewardship, the eco-development which happens in the periphery, that's again a gain to the society and then the engagement with all the different business groups and other stakeholders, eight or nine stakeholders are there, government stakeholders, non-governmental stakeholders, so research is required. The more you generate these uh, uh, insights, you know, valuable information from field research, so much the better. So the Amrit Kalka vision, which was released by the Honorable Prime Minister during in the, in the Mysore Tiger Meet recently, uh, the Tiger Vision document is there. So much has to happen more. What has happened is commendable, what much needs to happen. Because the challenges are there, they'll remain there. So the research becomes very important in that context, the themes which, you have, which I saw, uh, which, uh, which, have been, uh, which are there in place, including the poster sessions, they are very timely and good. And uh, I'm really delighted to see all young people uh, taking interest and the faculty working hard along with the director and his team to put this in place. Um, only one thing I would like to touch upon because we have to manage the time. Um, see, uh, the source areas, these protected areas uh, coming to, there is a carnivore biology session, so I won't encroach upon what are those themes, but broadly speaking, you know, uh, the protected area investment is happening so that you have an exclusive in agenda for in-situ conservation of those species which are out there. In the contest tiger, it's a umbrella tiger. As a species, you are doing that, and by doing that, you're saying so many things. But it may be a, a, a general ecosystem approach as well, but you need to have a reproductive surplus vis-a-vis uh, -vis the inherent biological carrying capacity of that habitat, so that you are in a position to uh, supply uh, to the sink areas where the habitat value is not all that good. So this needs to happen, otherwise they won't go to the other source. So you have the uh, general decline in the uh, and linkages. So the research, the themes, whether it's about a plant, whether it's about a grassland, or whether it's about a herbivore or a carnivore, the insight should help us to save us, uh, save these species beyond the portals of the source area, that is a centrifugal approach. It's not new to us. Uh, so far, we have been just doing um, based on whatever insights we have from or from other secondary data done elsewhere outside the country. But I urge that in in 18 or in 35 of our states in UT, including the seascapes, uh, how best to adopt a landscape approach? You need to help us because you need to help the government with some valuable data. What is the, what is the uh, multi-dugong value for dugong or for that matter, any other mesopredator? We have been focusing on large predators, large carnivores, but uh, we are trying our best uh, along with the ministry and the UNDP to provide some, through a project, to provide some uh, um, I mean, uh, advice so that the concerns of small cats and other mesopredators get factored into the working plan code as well as the guidelines for the protected areas. Now, uh, you need to do this, uh, gain a lot of insights about these mesopredators because that the kind of niche they are where they uh, 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 appropriate and where they live. You know, and they are sentinels of so many things. They zoom out and tell you what's going okay, what's not going okay. So their sustainability means a lot. And their release also means a lot. That's a signal that your big predators are coming down. So much to learn from these things. So applied research is required in a big way for us. And I'm glad the themes which are there in the um, seminar document and the uh, details which have been shared with me, they uh, encompass also all those things which are crucial to us to shape up the field agenda. So whatever we generate here, uh, apart from get, knowing more about the species, plants, animals, and the management, and the safeguards, and the mitigations, and the 
the biology of uh, of the species and the ethology of the species and the restoration part of it, the movement part of it. Uh, the overall uh, takeaway should be something which should help the management for in situ conservation. So I wish you all the best. So once again, and uh, uh, I mean, so much to talk to you, but we'll do it on some other occasion. Thank you so much. God bless. Thank you, sir, uh, for touching upon research theme prioritization and aspects that need focus, and also on guiding us on the way forward and how important and relevant research needs to be focused on futuristic goals, especially related to policy. I, uh, we will now end the inaugural session, uh, first with a group photograph outside, and followed by tea. There are people everywhere around to help you, guide you on where tea is arranged, mostly in the library walk and some part here. So we will have uh, tea, but first group photograph. So I invite you all to kindly join us outside. Uh, we will uh, meet back here at 11.15. We'll start the next technical session at 11.15. Yes, sub table, not chair. ये माइक का इशू नहीं है वाका रुक जाना माइक का इशू नहीं चलो एक्टिव हो जाता है उसमें एक टाइम में अभी इसमें दोबारा नहीं लगा अभी दोबारा निकालना पड़ेगा ये नहीं और ये दोबारा लगना नहीं करना पड़ेगा क्या करना है हाँ ठीक है फिर यहाँ पे ये तो बंद है और आप देखो किन्होंने किधर गए लाइट चेंज अब जो है ना वो एक एक कहते हो इतनी फोन ना बाहर तो जब हमें कश्त करना पड़ेगा पीपीटी किसको खोलेंगे तो पीपीटी में खोलूँ है ना अगर आवाज बुक नहीं तो वहाँ बंद करना पड़ेगा हाँ उसपे लाइव स्ट्रीमिंग से कोई नहीं कोर्ट आया नहीं यार एक कोर्ट आया हाँ नहीं नहीं कर 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 आई तो कर चेक तुम देखो ना यूट्यूब खोलो ना यूट्यूब खोलो ना तो ठीक कर रही है यार ये बहुत नहीं है यार तेली बढ़िया आ रही है तू रिवर्स ये तो Hello. Hello. Uh, one to three testing. One to three testing. One to three testing. One to three testing. Hello, one, two, three, testing. Green pie, what? 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 Green pie, 
माइक ऑन करके हेलो माइक टेस्टिंग माइक टेस्टिंग माइक टेस्टिंग माइक टेस्टिंग ऑन करके बोलो हेलो माइक टेस्टिंग माइक टेस्टिंग भैया मेरा वो दिया नहीं देखा नहीं ये रखता हूँ लेकिन वीडियो में तो ये ले रहा है वीडियो में तो ऑन है इसके लिए नहीं हेलो हेलो माइक टेस्टिंग माइक टेस्टिंग
हेलो 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 आप आवाज माइक टेस्टिंग माइक टेस्टिंग माइक टेस्टिंग आवाज बताना आ रही नहीं आ रही माइक टेस्टिंग हेलो हेलो माइक टेस्टिंग हेलो हेलो वन टू थ्री प्रेजेंटेशन चेक करूं नहीं एक अच्छा अच्छा क्या कर रहे हैं सब लोग ये <laughs> सर का है आपका सर का है पहले सर का है मेरा पर मैंने चेक नहीं किया है प्रेजेंटेशन अभी प्रेजेंटेशन तो चेक कर लेते हैं मैडम मतलब बात करते रहूंगी धन्यवाद मैडम प्रेजेंटेशन चेक कर लेते हैं पहले तो तो पैनल लगा दो अच्छा अच्छा वो लाइव आ रहा है ठीक है चलिए अगली बार थोड़ा सेटअप हम पूरा स्टूडियो सेटअप करना पड़ेगा कोई बात नहीं अब इट इज मच बेटर देन यस यस आप सीन शिफ्ट करोगे अभी तो पैनल ही लगा है अभी तो पैनल लगा है प्रेजेंट दो टाइम कर दो कितनी बात करता है भाई देख रहे हैं ना आपका
stage the chair of the session, Dr. Erak Barucha, the co-chair, Dr. S. Satya Kumar, and session facilitator is Dr. Anupul Khan. Sir, I request the chair and co-chairs to kindly take their place. Dr. Anupul is also requested to pass me here. Yeah. Anukul, Anukul, on cut the mics. We're handing over the session to Dr. Ellen We begin this session on lead talks and we have five presentations each about 15 minutes each and uh, so without wasting any time I invite the first speaker Professor Kamal Qureshi, Scientist G and Nodal Officer of the Tiger Cell in WIN. Uh, he will be making a presentation of status of uh, tigers in India. Over to Professor Kamal Qureshi. Namaskar, I'm going to talk about status of tigers in India today. Dr. Rajesh Gopal and Dr. Negi are here. We started this journey almost 20 years back in Kana about uh, putting in place how to monitor tigers in the country. A small story before that, tiger is an enigmatic species. And I realized that when I was sitting in, uh, in a ground hide in Dudhuwa Tiger Reserve, uh, watching Bengal Florican, and tigers walked in eye to eye next to me and probably I forgot to tell tigress teri aankhon ke seva is duniya mein rakha development is is crucial it is very important in country like us we can't afford not to develop we have more than 40% people living on the margins so if you see these two maps, 1992 and 2022, how we developed over time. But with this development paradigm in place, we need to ensure that our ecology and our habitat is intact. I'll not take much time here. Dr. My colleague, Dr. Satyakumar, done a good effort on that about sampling. But just to give you an idea uh, that Project Tiger do this monitoring in three phases. Phase one, uh, that is ground surveys. There are almost 40,000 people of forest department involved in collecting this data. It's a humongous exercise, one of its kind in the world. Phase two is done at Wildlife Institute of India, where we use satellite data for looking at habitat uh, conditions. And phase three is a camera trapping done. And I'm very happy to say that when we started, most of this work is actually being done by researchers over here. And now, by and large, this work is done by forest department. Now, this entire exercise is not possible if I don't have colleagues with me, like Dr. Jhala, Dr. Vishnu Priya, Dr. Rujwal, Dr. Shikhar, Dr. Dev, 
uh, Dr. Swati, and my more than 100 young colleagues who made this possible, and as I have told, more than 40,000 forest personnel. So I'm talking today on behalf of them. So there are a lot of questions that how we estimate the population. So if you'll see this last part, each one is a landscape, that is Shivalik, Central India, Western Ghat, Sundarban, and this is India. Almost 86% of the tigers uh, are enumerated. Only 14% is what we extrapolate. How we do that? If you see on the left side, tiger signs, prey density, human disturbance, this is coming from phase one data, which is collected by forest department. And the camera trapping data, as I've told you, where both forest department and researchers are involved. Now this we'll use to model using spatially explicit capture recapture. Uh, as you see uh, graph below, these are the three variables. Tiger sign is positively related, prey encounter rate, and of course human disturbance. One good thing about tiger is that tigers don't like humans. Sometimes they eat them. That's good. <laughs> So we've done, this is an example of uh, Karai. The blue dots you are looking at are actually survey done by forest department. So you are here, uh, this is Rajaji, and you are somewhere here. Uh, this is Corbett, Pilibhit, Dudwa, Suhelwa, and Valmiki in Bihar. Just to get you oriented to that. And then what red dots you're seeing is basically tiger presence. A very large scale camera trapping has been done here. Almost 4,000 camera trap stations in this. And we've captured 804 unique tigers in this particular landscape. And 819 is our estimate. So we only added 15 tigers. In the pink area which you are looking at on the, on the map, that's the area where we extrapolated. So as I was talking about, we extrapolate very limited number. Uh, well, this is also told by my colleague, but I just want to draw your attention that when we started in 2006, the tigers were thought to be about 3,000, more than 3,000, and our population estimates got about only 1,400 tigers. Now, we are more than doubled. Now, this doubling doesn't mean that we achieved what we want. Yes, we have arrived, but it's a long way to go because China is still very active, as you know, in all fronts and they're still eating tigers. And we are losing a lot of tigers. Uh, in recent few months, there's a huge spurt in, in, uh, in poaching cases in the country. It's a warning signal for us to be aware of that. I'll be talking about each uh, landscape. So what you're seeing is a Shivalik Tarai, and this uh, small map which you're seeing, we've done in 2006. And pay attention here that this is a Corbett, and there is Hardly any tiger between Corbett and uh, Pilibhit. If now you see how Corbett has acted as a source population, it's filled up entire area from Rajaji, uh, Chilla part of Rajaji, all the way to Dudhwa, uh, Pilibhit and Dudhwa. So source population play a very, very critical role. There are about 820 tigers in this particular landscape. This is the second largest population of the world uh, around Corbett almost 800 tigers in this landscape. Valmiki is also filled up now. There is no space in, when we started, there are only five, six tigers uh, in this area. And Bharat Jyoti Saab was there at that time. He did a marvelous job in improving this habitat. And now there are about almost 60 tigers. Central India is very interesting. It is a melting pot of India as far as tiger genetics is concerned. Tigers are coming all the way from Tarai uh, East, and going to Western Ghats and Eastern Ghats. I want your attention here. If you look at this part, if you'll see this part, and I want to see this part over here, Odisha, Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh. There are small populations of tigers all over there. Unfortunately, we are losing small populations very fast. What you see is the consolidation of tiger population in Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, and in Rajasthan, a small population in Vantambur and Sariska. So this is the part where the population was doing, <coughs> doing good, they're still doing very well. But where the population was poor and small, they're actually declining very, very fast. Same is the case in Sayadri, where 
the tigers are not in sayadri but outside western ghats uh, remains almost consistent of course the population have increased in western ghat but this population uh, nagar hole satyamangalam madumalai vayanad this is the largest population of tigers in the world almost uh, 830 tigers uh, in this part and this is the cluster which ensured that tigers we are seeing now all the way to goa it's responsible to filling up bhadra and kali we almost have about 1000 tigers population is stable here uh, over time there is very little habitat left in western ghats to occupy that's why a lot of tiger movement is happening up northward sundarban was always challenging uh, to us and we not able to do in 2006 is 2010 onwards we able to figure out how to sample mangrove areas basically all these are baited traps and you'll see that tigers were only existing in this area now they occupy other parts of mangroves but the crucial part here is to remember that this is very uniquely adapted uh, uh, tigers and there is no habitat for them in india bangladesh is the only option which have the space and so trans boundary conservation is the need of the r northeast was always challenging we not able to do much in arunachal but assam population is very limited and fragmented kaziranga is the source population there are about almost 230 tigers in this landscape and tigers have disappeared from mizoram nagaland so we are losing tigers uh, pretty fast in this landscape the situation on other side of the border that's myanmar is worse myanmar has almost lost almost lost its tiger so situation in entire southeast asia is pretty bad we are still doing okay and i want your attention here if you see this map this is the map of chital and sambar in india and it indicates that entire wherever you see the gray area in largely tropical part of the country don't see chital and sambar and i tell you chital if chital and sambar are not there the large and and medium carnivore community will not survive in the country it is the most important uh, you know ungulate species uh, just to show you this is the tiger watch uh, sorry uh, forest watch map and you will see that is testament to that the forest loss is also happening where we are not seeing both chital and sambar the interesting aspect is that protectedness as protectedness decreases that is close to tiger reserve and national park you have ungulates you have tiger all wildlife intact as you move away from the park the tiger and other animals decline we also have a national repository of photographs of tigers which we match and i that's why i was telling in last 3 4 months we have a spurt of tiger skins coming to us uh for which are largely poached so this particular program uh, do basically identification of tigers we can actually match the tiger skin so we have a repository huge repository almost 44000 photographs of tigers in our repository to match uh, unfortunately poaching is largely happening on the margins that is in uh, territorial divisions it's happening much more source population i have told you is very crucial this is from corbett you see almost flat the population is not growing is not a bad sign which means it's sending lot of tigers in the surrounding and that's why if you see the map on the top that only corbett was having tigers and as the time progress you will see the tigers have actually occupied everywhere unfortunately at that time uh, in dholkan tiger populations declined and so also in haryana but now there are interesting signs that tigers are using largely the hilly areas and occupying they are in himachal and haryana so source play a very important role why because our average uh, from the looking at data of ntca around 3 to 4 tigers getting poached from a tiger reserve is a normal thing and 3 to 4 tigers getting poached can only be sustained if you have a population of 100 or more than 150 tigers only few in these i have what i have listed 7 8 tiger reserve in this country can only match this so if you don't have uh, intact population or large population what you will do we need to <clears throat> sariska before it happens uh, where population become extinct actually isolated population the, the sariska population was on its way out anyway poaching has taken care of it later on but the population was not doing well so corridor is the answer but the problem is this is uh, indravati tadoba kanha corridors the corridors quality is depleting very fast 
and so it's time that we should ensure that our development should make sure that this tiger uh, corridor remains intact, not only for tigers, elephants and any other wildlife you can think of. The forest department has done an excellent job in moving people out. Almost 34,000 square kilometer area was made available. But over time, if you see this is current expenditure, the expenditure is declining uh, uh, over time and we need that government should keep the focus and spend more money to make habitat available. Uh, just to tell you, a lot of people ask how many more tigers India can sustain. These tiger reserves which you are seeing uh, in pink, they are not in pink of health. They need a uh, lot of hand holding. We need to improve uh, these tiger reserves and we can actually accommodate 800 to 1200 tigers in these tiger reserves if we do management. Cheetal and wild pig are the only two species which are good for augmentation because uh, uh, they have a potential to grow very fast, 25 to 35 percent per annum growth can be, uh, can happen with them. So where we want our tiger reserve? We want our tiger reserves to be in the bracket of having four to six tiger per hundred square kilometer which I feel most of the tiger reserves can have and it's possible to have that. Uh, weed invasion level across the country is a major challenge. Uh, if you see this is the map of weed. So tiger monitoring is not only monitoring tigers, or it's, it's about monitoring habitat quality also. So we have done a survey, almost more than 40 weeds we have uh, a map <clears throat> and identified where country can invest money. So you see this, all these red areas on the map you're seeing on the basis of invasiveness and possibility to, re possibility to remove the invasion level and gain a lot. So these are the areas identified countrywide which will be helpful in restoring the habitat. Technology play a great role, artificial intelligence and MSTRIPE helped in a big way. Almost 100% data we've collected using uh, MSTRIPE app on the phone and we are improving it further. In the end, I'll say that to insecure the tiger population, we need to ensure protection. That's the most important thing now. Habitat improvement, prey augmentation, ensure landscape integrity. We're losing this very fast across the country, specifically in central India, and manage human wildlife conflict because poorest of the poor are actually dependent on that. And thank you. We are the next speaker. I invite Dr. Bilal Habib to make a presentation on development as a conservation opportunity, linear infrastructure through sensitive habitats. Dr. Bilal Habib is in the Department of Animal Ecology and Conservation Biology and uh, works on many aspects of large scale conservation as well as linear infrastructure. Over to Dr. Bilal. So, uh, good morning, uh, good morning everybody. So I'll be talking about uh, development and conservation. And as I was talking, this commercial has already set a tone that we as a country, we need development. We can't say no, because 60% of our population lives in rural India. But every time, even today is Hindu, if you read the newspaper, it tells that WI is compromising the railway track in Malayam National Park through, uh, through which is in uh, Goa. So I'll be just talking about, we can have two sets of a debate. One is, we can think of conservation and development, whether we want one or other, or we can pitch them to against each other versus. Or we also have an associated with this is economic development versus the environmental issues. So I will try to figure out, can we think of a developmental model which actually can help us in conservation in our country. And everybody wants to see a picture like this without a railway track. But what's happening in our country? All this linear infrastructure in our country is fragmenting all our pristine habitats. So how long we can effort and we can do this? And reality is this. We have fragments of the forests all across the country and we have new roads, which we call as a greenfield roads coming. We have a roads which are being updated across the country. And is there a hope or can we do something 
which can help us to manage this development which is necessary in our country. So this particular presentation is about that. And why is the biodiversity? Why we are worried? Now if you see this is the income wise distribution of the world. So we belong to a country which is not developed, which is developing. So it's our right to be considered among the developed nations. And this is where the biodiversity is. So if you see most of the biodiversity across the globe is in areas which are not developed so far. So which is around more than 60 to 70 percent. So 70 percent of the globe has to be developed. And once that, once that has to go to the develop, developed side, then there is a lot of things which, which, which are going to be changed. And this is how it looks like. So in spite of so many roads across these, what we call as a developing nations, but the aspiration is far beyond what we see in this particular map. And if you zoom in towards the country, it's again, in spite of such a huge network of roads in our country, people still believe that our road network is far less what is actually the global standards, what we have. And if you compare India, if we, come, if we put all roads together, 670,000 kilometers. And if you put railway lines, around 92,000 kilometers of railway lines. And we are in population it's increasing. There are aspirations, and there is a requirement for the more roads. And what are the issues? Why we, we can't stop the development of the roads, especially the linear infrastructure? 63% of the population is rural in our country. And if we talk about the road, road density, 1.5 kilometer of road is accessible to 1,000 people in rural India. Whereas in urban India, it's around 5 kilometers per 1,000 people. And if you talk, there's a 95% increase of roads in the last 10, five years. And most of it has happened in the rural India. And it's again going to change. And railway electrification has increased by 1,000 times. So visualize railway in increase of electrification. What, it, what does it mean? That we will have more faster and faster railway uh, uh, trains. And four lane highways have doubled in 10 years. 59% in national highways in the last 10, uh, last 10 years. So in terms of protected areas, and what we all well, we know that we have the largest global population of the tigers, we have the largest population of the elephants, and at the, at the same time we are saying that 30% of the global population of the tigers is outside protected areas. 30% of the population of the elephants is outside protected areas. So what we do, now see this rural versus urban divide. So in terms of a biodiversity and development, we saw this. Now you see that 1,458 kilometers per thousand square kilometers in rural landscapes, and which goes 5,000 to the urban landscapes. So almost 75% more roads in urban landscapes, in spite of the network of roads we have already seen in our country. And when you talk, how, how many people get an access to the roads? In rural India, it's 1.4 kilometers per thousand people, whereas in urban India, it's 5.42 kilometers versus uh, versus what we have in rural India. So we know that there is a gap. And we all know that this is, these are the areas which are rich in biodiversity. So there's a direct conflict between the biodiversity and wildlife. But the great news and great advantage is rural India is still conducive for the moment of the animals as of today. Today, if we look that elephants, tigers are still going from one protected area to other protected area. and we still, these are still conducive for the moment of the animals. So as on today, if we look the road densities, the urban areas, the rural areas in our country, we still feel that we are at that particular stage where animals are still able to walk from one particular landscape to other particular landscape. But what is going to happen? Is it possible to maintain this? We have 60% of the rural India as of now. In next 10 years, we will only have 33%. That means whatever is going to happen, in our country, it's going to happen in the next 10 to 15 years. So next 10 to 15 years is very critical for the conservation, especially when we talk about the linear infrastructure and the development. And when we talk about the divide, rural versus urban, 66% of the population in rural India with a road network of 1.2 kilometers per, per, uh, per, per square kilometer, we can't say them that you can't develop, you don't need, everybody needs a facility, everybody needs to reach hospital on time. We can't afford to say a villagers living in the villages that you don't have an access to the good road, you can reach hospital after 10 years. Those times are gone. And we can't stop 
people for asking those particular roads. So when we talk about the roads, there is a divide in our country. There are a lot of people who come and protest, who say that roads through sensitive habitats is not a good option. But can we stop that? Is there an option with us that we can tell them, no, it's not possible? So you can see protests all over country. You can see I have received more than 1,000 postcards from Goa. More than 1,000 kids have written those postcards saying that, please don't allow the double tracking of the Castle Rock railway line. So is it like, is it wise? Should we stop that or should we allow that? So we, will, we, are, we are coming to that also. So now based on this, can we think about a model where we think the development is a conservation opportunity for us? Can we make these roads in such a way that they help us to mitigate the losses what we have done in the last 100 years or more than that. So that is what I will be talking about. So we have, when roads and railway tracks, they come for the development, we have two types of options. So one we call as a greenfield development, which is totally new roads. New roads through pristine habitats or new railway tracks. So we have a brownfield development. This is a type, this is an upgradation. Upgradation of existing highways It's called as a uh, brownfield development. So when we look in case of greenfield highways, we have everything which we can do. We can think of avoiding uh, the alignment for sense to habitats. We can think of restore, mitigate. We can think of minimize the forest areas and we can think of offsetting. We have a lot of options available because these are the all, all the way they are the new roads and we can think what we can do. But, and one of the very interesting examples, which is of the uh, Greenfield Highways, the Samrudi Express. And believe me, this is, this is not somewhere in US or somewhere in any other country. This is what we call now as a Bharat. This is happening in our India. So this is one of the largest overpasses. We all put the overpasses of the Canada in our photographs, in our presentations, but it's proud that the largest overpass as of now is in our country. And these are the viaducts. So imagine the Samrudi Highway, which is, an, which is a highway from Nagpur to Mumbai, does not pass through any protected area. It does not cut eco-sensitive zones, but in spite of the, that, because of the commitment of the government for the green development, 1,800 mitigation measures were proposed on this highway, only to make it green, to think about a wildlife which is outside protected areas. So if we have a green highways, and if the right people are involved at the right time, probably we can visualize a greener infrastructure in our country which can mimic this. So this is again 300 meter underpass between Bohr and uh, Mail Guard connectivity in the Samaruti. So brownfield upgradation projects is what the problem is. We can, we can, we can think about the uh, green fields, but brownfield is why there's a problem because these are the existing highways. Now, a lot of people are of the opinion that we should not allow upgradation of the projects or we should not allow let these projects be as such. That's what 90% of the people think. So for that, this is what is the issue. If you keep these highways, there are 20,000 kilometers of roads through our tiger reserves. There are 19,000 kilometers of roads through sensitive elephant habitats. Now, if we keep these highways as such, this is what is going to happen. We have more issues because it's not the road or the railway track which is, which is a problem. Roads and if, if there is no traffic on the roads and railway lines, I think animals will love to cross on them. So it's a traffic. So we, we can stop upgradation, but can we stop people buying cars? Can we stop people walk, traveling on those highways? It's impossible, nobody can do it. So the issue is if we keep these highways as such, it's going to be more troublesome for the problem. So when we talk about the mitigation, the most important is, I think many of you have uh, known about the NH44. It was more than 15 years the case was in the court. And what was the issue? Somebody was talking about we will go for the underpasses, somebody was talking about we will go for the overpasses, and somebody was talking about we will take an alternative alignment through Chinwara. And imagine a 15 years lost for the construction, not only for in terms of wildlife, in terms of resources we, we as a country use for upgradation. So, when we talk about the brownfield highways and when we talk about the mitigation, you have to be very specific, okay? 10 years before, when I started road ecology, I started with an idea, bigger the better, okay? That's why I talked about some 700 meter, 1.5 kilometer overpasses. 
at the time. If you call me now, I will say that I was wrong. Only because of the science which has been developed over the last 10 years, which has helped us to do better. So they have to be measurable. You should be able to measure the success. They should be achievable. I can tell, please upgrade this railway track for next 50 kilometers. Do you think that is possible? Upgradation of a railway line for 50 kilometers will cost 50,000 crore rupees. Okay, and that mitigation is never going to happen. And what's going to happen? The, the trains are going to run as such, which is far more damaging to us. So we have to be achievable and they have to be realistic. And they also have to be timely. We can't fight for the mitigation measures in courts for 20 years. And at the end of the day, there will be a mitigation measure. So we have to think about these particular aspects. And very important, we take road ecology very lightly. Okay, we say that, are 50 meter ka bana do, 100 meter ka bana do. When you make any structure, the life of that structure is 100 years on an average. So if you make any underpass, if you make any overpass on any road or any railway line, that's going to be there for 100 years. You can't undo. So one wrong mistake about the size, about the location, is going to be against us for next 100 years. So you have to be very thoughtful when you talk about suggesting these mitigation measures. So at the beginning of my road ecology research, when I started in WI and Matha was the first person to allow me to shift the domain to, into the road ecology subject, was, is bigger better? Is one large better than five smaller ones? Are multiple mitigation measures better or just the simple one? Should we think about the target species or just at that time, we were just fighting for mitigation measures for tigers. Cheetal Samar barking there was not even counted to be part, to be considered for the mitigation measures. So then, is there a different rule for wildlife inside uh, protected areas versus the mitigation outside protected areas? Should we think about that particular aspect? And I will now just pass on you a couple of examples. So this is a very recent example, okay? Now, when the first mitigation measure, first proposal goes to the managers, you know, what's the first thought process we think? The diversion of the land should be less. That's, that's the first criteria. We should give less forest land. And this is a very classic example where less forest land is detrimental for the conservation. Maybe we may save a hectare of a two hectares of the land, but it's compromising the, the, the connectedness of that particular protected area. So that's why I have put this. And why this is important, I think Dr. Tirtho will be giving you a presentation. We are doing fantastic in GIB recovery. Once there will be a lot of GIBs, we need these habitats. So if we don't protect these habitats right now, which are outside, we probably may have a GIBs in captivity, but we may not have a habitat to release them. That's why it's very critical. So these are the three alignments which we had. The first one, the second one, and the third one. The first one alignment was cutting through the protected areas. The forest was, how much forest was required? Just 30 hectares. The second alignment, but it was cutting in the center. So the local authorities have decided we will not go with this alignment. The, the second one was 42 hectares, but it was asking for a more, more, uh, uh, this one, more uh, area, very less area from the uh, protected area, whereas the third one is asking for the very large area. So the people compromise it got from the second, second alignment. But actually, the third alignment would have been far better. So this project is already approved by NBWL. But we have given in our report, it's better to relook the alignment, even if it's more area, but this area, because on the, on the right-hand side is the Gawalyar city. So if you will build your road at the edge of the protected area, you are going to save encroachment towards the road, towards the protected area, and you are going to save the road cutting through the protected area and a bigger grassland patch of 150 square kilometers will be intact. So we don't have to always think about less area, smaller area. We always have to think what's going to be beneficial for the protected area. And I talk about the elephants on the railway tracks. Now imagine this is outside protected area. If we talk about the elephant corridors, if we talk about the elephant protected areas, probably we will not have a mitigation measure on this railway track. So there is a far more wildlife outside protected areas, which we have to think. And NH44, where it started, I will go the fast. So we have tigers crossing on, and it's one of the success. We have more than 22,000 animals crossing in NH44. So I'm not talking about these are animals crossing. 
I'm saying that we have saved 44, 22,000 accidents in a year. Imagine if there were 22,000 times animals crossing and the number of vehicles on that particular road, we should have at least 11,000 accidents. So we have saved that because of the mitigation measures. I will talk about the Dehradun Highway. Huge debate. Everybody is, when you go to that particular area, everybody is saying that, oh, Shivalik is very sensitive. We should not dig the Shivalik. I'm also of the same opinion. And people are thinking that, oh, entire road is being damaged. There are 7,000 trees lost. This is a bad development. But do you visualize that the forest beyond Rajaji up to Kalesa, I, I, I consider them, they are just trees. But after this mitigation measures, they, that, those trees will be converted into forest. So sometimes we lose trees, but it's very important to enhance connectivity. So we will have a connectivity till Haryana, till Kalesa. So the tigers and elephants are going to use that thousand square kilometers of the landscape, which is going to be there. So entire this area, and we have now connectivity going far more. And you see the amount of the traffic which is on this particular road. So imagine 100 year old road with 27,000 of the vehicles on, on that particular road will not allow any animal to cross. Now, if we are sacrificing 27, 5,000 5, 5, or 7,000 trees for the connectivity, it's not a bad development. So this conservation opportunity only came when this road came for the development. So if this road was not for development, if this road was not for upgradation, we would have never been thought of a connectivity till Kalesar, Kalesar connectivity till Himachal Pradesh. So that's what, it, what is important. So can you visualize? Dehradun is the only railway station in India where 18 coach trains can come. We have upgraded all the railway stations across India. Now we have a capacity of 24 coach railway trains. Now imagine if you are boarding a train in a Calcutta and coming to Dehradun, you have to only board 18 coaches because 24 coach cannot come to Dehradun. What's the reason? Because we have a single track from Haridwar to Dehradun. And once we have a single track, then the tracks stop on the railway stations, can't stop another. And the loop line of those railway tracks can only accommodate 18 coaches. Now, if we, if we increase the loop lines to accommodate 24 coach railway track, we will have a 24 coach railway line. And I will tell you the mitigation measure for railways is far different than our road network. If we are able to tweak the timetable of the railways, say for example, we know that most of the animals are active from six to eight, and that's when maximum number of trains pass through Rajaji. If we are able to manage our timetable in such a way that the minimum number of trains should pass through Rajaji forest between six to eight, we can probably save 80% of the problem on the railway tracks. And very interesting with the railway lines is, there is no back-to-back affect what is in the road. So if you are on the road, you can have a vehicle coming in, but railways give a little bit of a time for the animals. So the different behavior of the animals are, go are, are going to get killed on the railway tracks. So we have to think what is the area and what type of animals are in that particular landscape when we think about the mitigation measures on it. Just, just one minute. So this is what is, uh, this is 150 years old railway line, right? And everybody is talking about that we should not do this railway line. But I'm of the opinion, we will do the railway line, which is going to the negative impact of 150 years. This is what is there on that railway line, if you go as on today. Do you think any animal, god, samba, cheetah, or nilga, or tiger, are you going to use the standard passes? But our mitigation measures are going to be such that the existing railway track, at least 60% of the existing railway track should be permeable. So we are asking a seven kilometer long tunnel which is going to replace all the existing uh, railway track, which is visible uh, as of now. So we are thinking about that. So good science, yes, definitely can. If, if you have a good science, it's an opportunity for conservation. Roads without mitigation act as like a death trap. So that's what we have to think that. Faulty misinformation. So we have to think about the mitigation measures. You know, the first mitigation measures happened 20 years before in Sholapur, uh, Pune railway line and the mitigation measures were for black buck. You know what was? Five by five meter underpass for a black buck. I think no one person in this hall will say that that five meter underpass is good for black buck. When we know that black bucks can jump up to six meters and black bucks can, and they as a group can't go inside a five meter culvert. So there are mitigation measures. So now these mitigation measures are there from 35 years. 
and not a single black buck has used utility. So if you do one mistake, you are with that mistake for the next 100 years. And a lot of us, we talk about just two more minutes. <laughs> Sorry for this, but. So, a lot of people, when they go to the field, they think, we do a roadkill survey, we will, we will know where the roadkill hotspots are, and that's the best mitigation measures, why we should go to mitigation measures. No way. Roadkill hotspots are very deceptive. Don't, don't, under, don't identify roadkill hotspots and suggest mitigation measures, because roadkill hotspots are dynamic. They are dependent on the density of the species. As soon as the density of the species will change, roadkill hotspot is going to change. So there are a lot of ecological insights which are coming. We're talking about the ecology and traffic engineering. We are talking about the different sizes and the behaviors of the species. So mitigation measures in disturbed areas. If there's an underpass for elephant inside Rajaji Tiger Reserve, I will say go for 30 meters. But if it's, there's a mitigation measures outside protected areas, in disturbed areas, go at least three times the size. Because the mitigation measures in disturbed areas should tolerate disturbance. And you know we as a country, there are so many people, there is going to be disturbance in these areas. So we have to mitigate those, 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 that disturbation also. So underpasses, if you make smaller underpasses, they act as a death traps. The, the predators stop there and they kill the, those animals there. And then actually animals they stop using. So we have to think that also. So existing road that were in India, if it is not available for upgradation, we don't have a conservation opportunity. So I wish that all the existing highways in India should be upgraded, because that gives us a conservation opportunity to rectify what the wrong is there. If they are not available for upgradation, we don't have a conservation opportunity. That's where I see that there is a hope that if we are developing, and there's an opportunity for conservation which we have. And I acknowledge all of them. Thank you so much, and so for taking. habitats teeming with wildlife. We have called them Westlands following an unfortunate legacy of the British colonial period. Large chunks of these habitats, more aptly known as the open natural ecosystems, have been also used for intensive agriculture, infrastructure and power generation. Among the many species that are unique to them, the odds are stacked against the great Indian buster the most because they are particularly sensitive to such habitat modifications, require large landscapes that are difficult to protect and cannot bounce back from critically low numbers. Yet, we have to conserve the species while the country develops. As a result, the species has declined over the last five years, 50 years, and currently there are 140 individuals left. The numbers are about 128 in Thar, three females in Gujarat, one in Solapur, six in Pilar. And if you see this map, their distribution fits perfectly with the open natural ecosystem map of India. Our research in the past from 2007 to 11 highlighted the plight of the species and it led to the development of the ministry's national bustard recovery plans. This plan recognized that the slow life history of the species vis-a-vis -vis threats is a bottleneck to its recovery. Being ground dwelling, the eggs and the chicks suffer heavy predation and the females can raise only up to one chick in a year. But once the chick crosses this initial vulnerable stage, adult life expectancy is long. 
for such species when adults are additionally removed from the population, such as through poaching or power line collisions, the decline is inevitable. Hence, the plan recommended a multi-pronged approach. On one hand, it recommended enclosing known breeding sites by fencing so that livestock and predators are kept away, the vegetation can recover, the insect population can recover, and the birds can breed therein to improve recruitment. On the other hand, it recommended mitigating critical threats in prioritized areas, thereby creating safe habitats. However, this would take a long time because bustards inhabit vast, unprotected, multi-stakeholder landscapes, and the species was running out of time. So the plan also recommended an insurance to secure a captive founder population so that imminent extinction can be averted and the birds can be released in the wild if the future fails. This decision was unanimously supported by India's conservation circles in a follow-up workshop in 2014, although there were some apprehensions among international communities. These efforts and events led to the Busted Recovery Program in 2016. WII was commissioned by the Ministry to implement conservation breeding and provide scientific guidance for in-situ management with national camper funding. It took additional two years of dialogues with Rajasthan government to commence conservation breeding and finally it started in 2019 under the current dispensation and as a joint activity of WII and Rajasthan. The International Fund for Hubara Conservation also joined board who are the largest breeders of bustards in captivity. Our conservation breeding approach involves collecting eggs from the wild, hatching them artificially, rearing the chicks, and creating a founder population that would be bred in captivity and the progenies will be released in the wild. When we started, each of these actions in this long chain were a big hurdle to cross because there were no blueprint to rear and breed these birds in captivity and we had to develop every approach de novo. This was done by starting from other busted conservation breeding techniques, such as the Hubara and the Kodi, make, make informed modifications to them bit by bit, retaining those changes to which the birds responded, the captive birds responded favorably, and thereby moving ahead to creating an approach that is tailored for the great Indian busted. However, for such long living and slow breeding species, effect takes a lot of time and can trickle down. So this is a long time learning process. And we have been generously supported by our partner IFHC in this through regular consultation and training. To inform these decisions of ZooTech, we continuously monitor the health status of our birds through their fecal conditions, body condition, body weight, bi blood biochemistry, and so on. To give you a glimpse of the conservation breeding pro process, we start with searching nests. And that is like finding a needle in the haystack for one of the rarest species on Earth. Our field team soon started identifying nesting females from their unique behavioral signature. We will collect some of these eggs in thermally insulated and shockproof boxes, and we'll then transport them to our center in a soft suspension vehicle to avoid damage. In the conservation breeding center, these eggs are then artificially incubated in machines that can regulate temperature and humidity. We would continuously monitor the egg development and will steer them towards appropriate development by changing the incubation parameters. A GIV egg hatches in 23 days, and after that, it is shifted to these transparent boxes in a temperature controlled room because they cannot thermoregulate initially. There, they will be hand reared, intensively cared, and will get imprinted on their human mothers. And this bond will help us to manage these populations with minimal space in captivity in the future. After about 45 days, these chicks are shifted outdoors in juvenile cage, where they gradually acclimatize to the external environment. The intensity of hand rearing is reduced, and the birds become autonomous within four to five months, when they're shifted to the adult cages. The rearing continues. We rear our birds on nutritionally balanced diet that comprise of balanced pellets produced for baras and other bustards in IFHC and are shipped to us. And we supplement that with live feed such as mealworm, 
cricket, mice, alfalfa, and vegetables that we produce organically in huge quantities to feed these birds. Some of the birds in our center have become sexually mature and have started breeding. And while this entire process is going on, simultaneously, we develop two facilities to house them. One, the pilot one at Sum, near Desert National Park, and a long-term one at Ramdora. Over the years, in this way, we have found about 97 eggs and have missed many more, 80% of them in enclosures of Desert National Park that highlights how important these grassland enclosures are. We collected 38 eggs, hatched 36 of them, and we now have a surviving founder population of 29 birds that includes 18 females and 11 males. Now, bustards are known to be difficult to rear and breed in captivity. They have issues such as trauma, stress. So we need to understand how this program has performed with respect to similar conservation breeding programs. And we were warned at the beginning that we must be within the top 25% of the international conservation breeding programs if the busted conservation breeding has to succeed. So here, we compare the founder establishment rate, which is the product of survival from egg to chick to juvenile adult in captivity between the existing busted conservation breeding programs across the world that was published earlier in a previous assessment. And we find that the GIB program has converted about 60% of the eggs into adults, which is higher than the top 25% of the conservation breeding programs for busters across the world, which is about 48% of founder establishment rate. In this way, we have been able to secure a founder population, minimum founder population of 20 birds, within the lower limit of the prescribed egg collection in the agreement between partners. Secondly, we have been able to commence captive breeding, where birds that were reared in captivity from eggs from the wild have laid eggs and we have hatched those chicks. And for all other large busters, this typically takes about four to seven years. So it seems that the program is on track. However, the ultimate success would depend on establishing self-sustaining wild populations from these captive great birds. One would think that collecting the eggs instead of the adults would be less detrimental to the population However, it can still reduce the in-situ growth, and particularly for such a slow breeding species. These were our initial concerns, but, but we could test them because we had captured and tagged 10 females after egg collection. And we found that, contrary to the earlier belief that these birds lay only one egg in a year, the tagged females laid about four to five eggs within a breeding season, typically more in good rainfall. As we collected the eggs in the early breeding season, typically before July, the females were relaying eggs in the later part of the breeding season and recruiting chicks simultaneously within the same year. And because of this, the impact of egg collection on the wild population was, would be low. Today, the Buster Recovery Program has reached the base camp of Mount Everest. It has been an arduous and challenging journey. Milestones have been reached, we have established conservation breeding facilities, sourced founders, developed an approach, preliminary approach for rearing birds, and have even commenced captive breeding. But the climb ahead is far more challenging and difficult. In the next few years, we have to develop artificial insemination techniques to scale up reproduction. Once surplus birds are produced, we need to rear them in a different approach that avoids imprinting and instills the fear of human and threats so that they can be released in the wild. But most importantly, we have to restore vast swaths of habitats where these birds need to be released. And to inform science-based habitat restoration, another arm of this program have been continuously studying the critical ecological requirements of the species. The ecological history of Great Indian Buster is lost from all over its range, except for Rajasthan and Thar, where natural habitats still exist. And much can be informed, much can be understood by studying the birds in this region that can be implemented to the other range states. For this purpose, we have been carrying out large-scale sur surveys, telemetry, and intensive observations of individuals and populations in Thar to understand their habitat use, space requirements, and demography. I will orient you to this map of Desert National Park 
where you can see these green grasslands within the uh, in green. Uh, you, the yellow indicates agriculture and the enclosures, the, the protected enclosures are indicated in this red outline. When we look at the breeding usage of the species, you will see that they are intensively using these protected enclosures, the grasslands. You can see very high intensity of use within these enclosures over here in blue. Elsewhere in the range, the last few remaining individuals of the species are found to occur in modified agricultural habitats. But this should not be misconstrued, misconstrued as a liking. They are out of choice. Where the choice exists, such as in Thar, they choose grasslands and they choose protection. Much like the tigers, they are indicators of good habitat quality. In the non breeding season, they still use these protected grasslands, but the ranging, they also range within the, in the surrounding agriculture, agro-pastoral landscape. So we ask, why is the Great Indian Bustard so dependent on protected grasslands, especially during the breeding season? There can be many possibilities, but insect resources can be a key because they require high protein diet for breeding. So we sampled insect abundance across this landscape and we found that the insect count, insect density within the grasslands, which you can see in this cyan color, is much higher than the other land covers during monsoon when they breed. In other seasons, the insect abundance becomes almost uniform across the land covers. And this insect count is largely governed by grasshopper abundance. Grasslands are nurseries of grasshoppers. Even within, even there is a distinction between protected grasslands and unprotected grasslands, and you can see much higher grasshopper density in enclosures of protected grasslands than unprotected ones. By protecting grasslands, other lower taxa can also be benefited. We found the double the richness and abundance of spiders within the enclosures than outside of it because of vegetation recovery. Thus, the Great Indian Bustard plays a flagship role. By conserving and protecting grasslands, when the open natural ecosystems are being intensively used for agro-pastoral uses, we are leading to ecological restoration and benefiting many lower taxa that otherwise wouldn't have received this conservation focus. Now let us examine the space requirements for the species. These birds range over large areas, typically from 100 to 1000 square kilometers, but there is a difference, variation within. In areas such as Desert National Park, where there are protected grasslands, the home ranges are typically less. They do not, birds do not move too much, take too much long distance movements. Whereas in areas such as the field firing range, where protected grasslands are less, they have to range over a much larger area and take more frequent movements. And when they do that, they come across hostile infrastructure and power lines, which are a critical threat to the species much more. So by conserving contiguous habitats with protected grasslands, we can probably reduce the movement of the species and reduce the mortality due to by crossing through this hostile landscape. This long-term research is now creating a blueprint for ecological restoration of bustard habitats. In all the other range states, we require a minimum of 300 square kilometer of contiguous habitat with at least 25% of area under grassland and a few more than 10 square kilometer of enclosures for breeding. Less than that can trap chicks and are not good. The species has large home ranges, but home ranges are relatively smaller with, it, with such areas have protected grasslands. Such habitat restoration will also benefit associated biodiversity. So for the range states other than Rajasthan, conservation breeding is not scientifically feasible or practicable due to limitation of founders. But if these habitats are restored following the above prescriptions and in foreseeable future when captive bred birds are produced in larger numbers, they can be released in these restored habitats as per the agreement between partners. However, Rajasthan shines bright for bustard conservation and should continue to hold the main role. And here we need to secure multiple patches of 500 square kilometer that are free of detrimental infrastructure and intensive land uses. It will be key to underground the identified 250 kilometer of high risk lines over here and install diverters on the rest of them, continue managing the breeding enclosures and continue conservation breeding with the hope that after five to six years, we may be in a position to start releasing a few birds. 
This program, this challenging program, has been implemented by a large set of wildlife professionals spanning multiple institutes, Wildlife Minister of India, Rajasthan Forest Department, International Fund for Rupara Conservation, and Rene. We have received abundant support from the Ministry of Environment, Forest, Climate Change. Such programs require a strong institutional support, which we have found in the director, Dean Registrar of Wildlife Minister of India. I would like to thank Virendra sir and Mantu sir for their tremendous role. I would like to sir, uh, thank Parindam Tomar sir for his vision and helping the project. But the core of the project is constituted by the research team that work with an obsessive dedication 24-7, 365 days in the And on behalf of them, I thank you. I thank all of them who have supported the project. <laughs> and I hope the future favors the species. Namaskar. Thank you. The uh, next speaker is Dr. Vishnu Priya. She's going to make a presentation on the applying sentiments of India's rivers, status of river dolphins in India. Dr. Vishnu Priya is coordinating the project dolphin in the wildlife in Star India. Over to Dr. Vishnu Priya. First off, Dr. Good morning, everyone. Today, I will be talking about, as the norm is, you've seen talks mostly focusing on the terrestrial ecosystems. And I would like to bring to focus your attention to the blind sentinels of India's rivers, a, mask a mascot of the aquatic ecosystem of Indian rivers. Aquatic ecosystems are the most stressed habitats in the world. All of us are highly dependent on aquatic ecosystems for our basic minimal needs. And even if you look at in ancestor, ancient civilization, you will see that majority of the civilizations have sprung up on the banks of rivers. Evolution has started in aquatic ecosystems. So it is uh, very little for me to start talking about why aquatic eco ecosystems are important. But you'll see that they're also very highly stressed. Um, the map here shows how the aquatic water stress will increase by 2040. And here, I'll draw your attention to the Asian, uh, Asian continent, as well as South America, where some of the most endangered species also are uh, living in these stressed ecosystems. The river dolphins, which are obligate freshwater species, are part of these aquatic ecosystems and are under threat, and their population is severely declining. We have also witnessed, uh, we are also witness to extinction of one such species, the Yangtze River Dolphin, which we have witnessed in our lifetime. This only goes to show the kind of conditions that these species are currently surviving under. One such species which we uh, can witness in our country is the Ganges River Dolphin. There's another, uh, which was considered to be another subspecies, the Indus River Dolphin but is now delineated as a species to the status of a species is the Indus River Dolphin as well. They are highly endangered and they're protected under the Wildlife Protection Act under Schedule 1. They're considered to be endangered and they are uh, partially blind. They use echolocation for all their life history traits. While they're distributed across the Ganga, Brahmaputra and Karnafuli Meghna river systems, and Indus River Dolphins are distributed only in the Bias River uh, part of the Indian subcontinent. They're also present, majority of the population is present in Pakistan. So we have a very small population of the Bias, uh, Indus River Dolphin in our country today. A little bit about its ecology. Um, the females are larger than males. And one of the most important characteristics of this species is that it hardly surfaces. The surfacing time is very, very short. One, one thinks of dolphins, what we remember or what we think of is these playful creatures which are jumping up in the air and which are highly communicative. However, river dolphins, especially Ganges and Indus river dolphins, differ in this where the surfacing time is hardly two to, one to three seconds. So it's very difficult to notice them when you're traveling on any of these rivers. And when we looked at the status of this species in the country, Given that they are the apex predator, 
They also act as an indicator of the river aquatic ecosystem. The status of the species, very surprisingly, has not been established. No range-wide survey has ever been carried out, so we are unaware of what the current status of the species is. Several studies have been carried out, but without any proper methodology, which has not been standardized at all. This map shows you a review of over 100 uh, studies and reports which have been analyzed, and you can see that the studies have been focused on particular regions and never at the same time. So one of the mandates of developing, even if you want to develop a conservation action plan, is to first establish a baseline to understand what is the status of the species. For this, we realized that there is not even a method in place to robustly estimate the population of the river dolphins in our country. The work started in 2015, along with the Endangered Species Recovery Program. You've heard about the Great Indian Bustards, along with Dugong and Manipur Sangai, deer, Sangai uh, Dancing Deer. The project started at first estimating, what is uh, evaluating what is the best method to actually robustly estimate dolphin populations. Headed by Professor Kamar Kureshi, this method was established in several sites across the dolphin range. Assam, West Bengal, and Bihar were selective sites where this method was developed. As I spoke to you about how dolphin surfacing is very um, short, observing the species is very difficult. There are two biases that are involved. One is the ability of the observer to actually locate the dolphin when you're passing on the survey boat. The other is the fact that when the survey boat is passing, the dolphin needs to be available for detection. If it doesn't surface, you don't have the chance of detecting this animal. One of the advantages of uh, this species is that since it is blind and echolocation forms a very important part of its life history, it continuously clicks. So we used underwater hydrophones, you can see here, uh, to act as a third observer. So we had two decks of observers, two independent observers to correct for observer bias and a third observer for correcting for unavailability bias. Based on these, we develop a abundance estimation protocol uh, using the modified Lincoln-Peterson or Chapman estimator to come up with estimation of river dolphins. Following this, Project Dolphin was launched on 15th of August 2020 by our Honorable Prime Minister. The Project Dolphin detailed document was prepared at the Wildlife Institute of India with inputs from several faculty. You can see here Dr. Johnson, Dr. Shivakumar, Dr. Hussain, Dr. Ruchi Badola, Professor Kamar Kureshi, and Dr. Bitapi Sinha were part of this uh, endeavor. One of the main objectives of the Project Dolphin was inclusive welfare, which also meant that inclusive welfare also meant that the well-being of communities present on the rivers, because the poorest of the people are dependent on the rivers for their survival. Project Dolphin encompasses all of these activities with multi-stakeholder participation. But one of the first activities that was needed to carry forward Project Dolphin was to establish baseline data for river dolphins and to ensure continuous monitoring of factors that affect aquatic habitats. So dolphins were to act as the sentinels for our aquatic ecosystems. So taking this forward, the first activity was a range-wide river dolphin survey carried out with a massive effort, which took almost two years to complete, 8,590 kilometers of river surveyed across Brahmaputra, Ganga, main channels and their tributaries, the Bias River system for the Indus River Dolphin, 3,135 man days, 9,515 man hours, 28 rivers were actually surveyed by boat, and 30 rivers were surveyed for season, wherever seasonal presence was known across these two years. As you understand, the season is very short. Rivers can only be surveyed uh, during the high water season. During summer, it becomes really difficult. Most of the students had to carry the boat and walk across the rivers during lean seasons. So this was a humongous effort, uh, effort and the data that I present to you today is a result of this. Uh, I'm not, we are not talking about the numbers here, which will be declared soon. So one of the major uh, things we wanted to understand was what drives dolphin distribution and abundance. Without this knowledge, it's not really, uh, it is not really possible to develop a conservation action plan or to prioritize conservation. So we looked at factors driving dolphin distribution and abundance and wanted to understand what are the factors which influence dolphin presence as well as abundance. One, we used the hurdle count model where we looked at zero model or binomial model to look at what drives dolphin presence. 
and negative binomial model to look at what drives the abundance in areas where there is presence. What we found was increasing width, depth, and presence of certain river morphologies like braided channels or mid-channel islands, which create a diversity of habitats for fish, actually drove the presence of dolphins across its range. We also found that with increasing boat encounters, there is a lesser, lesser chance of dolphin presence in those areas. When we looked at abundance itself, within these areas where dolphin was present, it was largely width and depth that governed the count that, was, that we found for dolphins. We also wanted to understand that at a larger scale, we understand these are the factors that drive dolphin presence or abundance. But what are these responsive responses at a local scale? When we look at conservation management and prioritization, what do we see? How, what factors actually govern their distribution and the habitat use? For this, we looked at intensive site monitorings at two areas in Assam, Kaziranga and Golpara. Kaziranga is a predicted area with almost no human activity. Golpara is a high human use area where fishing activity is abundant. There are uh, ferry boats, there are motor boats flying. So these create a contrast because boat encounter rate was one of the factors that also drove, uh, that also influenced dolphin presence. What we found was the dolphin presence in Kaziranga was almost twice that of area, that of uh, the dolphin's presence in Golpara, which is what we wanted to understand what drove this difference between the two. And what was the habitats that were preferred by dolphins if we were to look at, uh, if we were to look at management implications. Mid-channel islands, meanders, and confluences are river morphologies that were largely most intensively used in respect to their availability for dolphins. Evlev's index gives you an uh, index of the presence of different morphologies and what is their use respect to availability. So confluences, as I said, because these actually create more habitat, microhabitats for other biodiversity like fish and plankton, which dolphin feed on. We also thought it is interesting to understand whether fish presence or plankton presence also drove dolphin distribution. Here I'm presenting you the graph for uh, fish uh, species richness. So Kaziranga had higher fish and plankton species richness when compared to Golpara. And this only goes to show the influence of the, how dolphin acts as an indicator species and protectedness actually does play a major role for dolphin distribution. And anthropogenic disturbances do actually negatively affect dolphin distribution and abundance. So we wanted to understand if dolphin presence is low in certain areas and human activity does impact dolphins, what are these factors and how do dolphins respond? Because it's not that they're absent from these areas, they are present there, but at much lower number. So as a species, how does, how does human activity impact dolphins? For this, we deployed underwater hydrophones in uh, Kaziranga, Golpara, and Hooghly, which is in West Bengal, and a high human use area as well. Almost 3,600 hours of dolphin recording was analyzed. What you do, what you see here is um, the activity pattern of dolphins across the day, across these three sites. Now, I'd like to emphasize that there is no baseline data for this species. So we, we did not know how dolphins actually, what is the dial activity pattern for dolphins. So first we had to establish a baseline, which was in the undisturbed area of Kaziranga. As you can see, the peak activity is in mid-morning. And when you look at Hooghly and Golpara, which is high human use areas, you, you see a dip in areas during the fishing times as, or boat traffic times, where uh, between 10 and 6, you see a dip in the activity. So dolphins do avoid using that area when there is high boat encounter and high fishing uh, activity. Now, the other thing that we wanted to look, out, look at was what happens with the such high encounter rate of fishing, which is probably the most uh, common resource for livelihoods across the river range. The most poorest of the poor depend, because all it takes, all it needs is somebody to go buy a net, to go cast a net in the river, which is a common, pro common property. So when you look at the fish, uh, fishing gear encounter rate across the country, the figures were alarming. In Uttar Pradesh, you will encounter at least one legal fishing gear, which is not mosquito net or other types of fishing which are illegal, at least one every kilometer. Whereas in West Bengal, you'll at least encounter almost four nets every kilometer. 
the picture below shows you the normal kind of a scenario that you will encounter when you go to these high fishing areas. You can see that no dolphin can escape from being around these nets. And the map shows you the intensity of fishing sites across West Bengal, and these kind of information is available ac across all the rain states for dolphins. And this fishing net are one of the major causes of mortality for river dolphins. In Assam, we did an intensive study where almost 80 net entangle, 80 mortalities were recorded for their causes. 61% of mortalities arise from net entanglements. You might you might wonder why, and the reason is that um, dolphins cannot detect nets because these monofilament gill nets are very thin, and because dolphins echolocate, the sound does not uh, come back, and so they cannot detect the presence of this net. So, dolphins are also poached for oil. So, the dolphin oil is used for uh, bait fishing. One of my colleagues, Dr. Sunny, will talk about this later in the day in detail. But this bait oil fishing is very extensive and it's alarmingly increasing. Our social survey through local uh, resource people and doing, this is a very unorganized trade. The Bin community fishermen from Bihar, who are originally from Bihar, but they're also very prevalent in Assam, are highly involved in this trade. Alternative oils have been proposed, however, they are not successful. In Assam alone, 1,164 litres of dolphin oil is required for oil bait fishing. And it's used, which is equal to almost an offtake of 46 dolphins a year. At the current rate of offtake, this population is at a declining trend. I'll quickly finish this. So, to solve the problem of non-visibility of nets, Pingas are proposed as a solution. My colleague Merin will talk about it later in the day. But all this is is a small device which pings at a particular rate and makes the net visible. And this seems to have almost a deterrence of 90%. Boat noise is another, another important anthropogenic factor that affects river dolphins. My colleague Dr. Gagi will talk about this also tomorrow. But what I would like to show you here is that dolphins are severely stressed when there is high activity of boat noise because underwater soundscape is really important. You can see here that Ganges River dolphins, the peak activity always avoids when there is high boat traffic. And they also use higher pitches when boat noise is higher and the rate of clicks, that is they're clicking at a much faster rate and leading to an increased energy requirement when there is high boat traffic and the underwater sound level increases. So for this, we create, looking at this data, we created a priority, conservation priority areas across the dolphin range where there are high dolphin encounters and there are high threats, where there are also high dolphin encounters but low threats because this will act as source populations and will ensure the connectivity of populations, where there is high neonate encounter rate and these should be at least one conservation priority area across every 200 kilometers of river stretch across spread over six states and a minimum of 50 to 100 kilometers as a consolidated stretch of the river for prioritization. Um, the conservation actions that, were, that are proposed from the science that is emerging from this project is that the presence of the forest department is very limited. Today we're talking a lot about conservation outside protected areas. Only 10% of dolphin population is within protection area, protected areas. So the staff is not oriented towards looking at managing aquatic habitats. And that was very evident in our river dolphin survey as well. Training material towards aquatic habitat monitoring is being developed and should be implemented. People should be trained in aquatic management. Declaration of dolphin conservation areas, which are not protected areas, but multiple use areas where incentivization, incentives should be promoted for uh, dolphin friendly activities. Adequate water depth, which is one of the most critical habitats, critical parameters for dolphin presence needs to be maintained. No plying time, especially in high uh, traffic areas, because now national waterways is also declared. There needs to be, at least in the hotspots, no plying time for, uh, to ensure that there is optimal habitat for dolphins. There needs to be a complete ban on bait oil fishing, because the way uh, the trend of bait oil use is increasing and it's very alarming. Pingers will really help in deterring dolphins from net entanglement. With this, I'd like to end the talk. Um, there is a team of almost 70 researchers, 
some of uh, whose names are here, who undertook the survey in very difficult conditions. Most of them had to spend almost 30 to 40 days on a single boat with a single bathroom, not getting off the boat. And it, without them, this um, work would not have been possible. And of course, the support by the state forest departments has been tremendous. They have uh, really supported us in carrying out these uh, surveys. And Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, our Dean Director and Research Coordinator, and especially our Finance and Administration, because our people are working in remote areas, but they ensured that uh, FAs reached on time, bills were passed on time, so none of us were kept hostage in any of the places. So I would really like to thank all of them. Thank you. He will be making a presentation on facilitating evidence informed decision making to conserve India's natural heritage, the interface of economic prosperity and ecological development. Dr. Gopi GV has worked on various issues in this country and now focusing mostly on environmental impact assessments. He is a noble author of the EISM and also works mostly in northeastern Indian region. Over to Dr. Gopi. Thank you, thank you, Satya Kapoor sir, and good day to you all. Um, today I'm going to be speaking about you know one cross-cutting issue that we saw right from the first presentation of Kamar sir, and then followed by uh, um, another um, few talks. One cross-cutting issue is development, which I'm going to be speaking about, and. Uh, what I'm largely going to well into this talk is, uh, if you look, and look into this particular image, uh, this image is from a particular landscape called as the Hasdi Orange coal fields in East Central region, that is uh, especially in the state of Chhattisgarh. India, um, you know, has about 115 billion tons of uh, coal in its uh, coal reserves. And uh, in, in terms of, uh, uh, in East Central region, especially Chhattisgarh, it harbors about 57 billion tons of coal. This particular landscape, the Hasdi Aran coal fields, has about 5 billion tons of coal in its reserve. And uh, this landscape does not, you know, not only have uh, coal, but also elephants. Now, by looking at this image, just imagine if this particular area has not been opened, if there are elephants in this landscape, and if the home range of these elephants are affected by this particular opening up of uh, for the mines, can conservation and development complement each other, or it will be a conservation will be kind of an island in the entire um, discussion about development. So my talk is going to focus on um, continue the debate of whether the conservation and development is either it is site specific or is it context specific or we can just on a broad brush stroke can say that conservation and development can coexist. I'm going to talk about with certain case studies. Before that, uh, uh, we all know that India is throttling up in terms of uh, development. We are one of the fifth largest economy now and we will be in a very short span of time in another by 2030 we will be probably with all the growth trajectory, trajectories, we will be the third largest uh, economy. <clears throat> now, having said this, development, of course, like Dr. Bilal, you know, um, Kamar Saab, everybody has said, is definitely essential. Now, uh, this development, by being the one of the largest economies, it brings in a lot of uh, improvements in the social and economic uh, performance indicators, like uh, social inequalities can be broken up, gender inequalities can be, you know, uh, broken up, uh, the health sectors can be improved, environmental sector can be improved, education sectors can be improved, and it is all, you know, uh, due to development, these all things can be improved. Having said that, at the same, uh, at the same, uh, uh, at the same uh, page, if you look at what uh, the intergovernmental science and policy interface uh, for biodiversity conservation and ecosystem services, what they have said is, uh, it's a well-established fact that in the last 50 years alone, the human populations have doubled. Uh, the growth sector the, has 
you know, many fold increased in terms of uh, the economy. The global economy has increased about four folds. The global trade has increased about uh, ten folds. And uh, they also point out that the rate of species extinction is much, much more higher. And uh, with all these statistics of both, uh, uh, you know, conservation and development uh, uh, scenarios, at, at is, it is this uh, interface that we are working in the, the EISL at this institute. Now, this EISL at the institute, the environmental impact cell at the institute was established way back in 1993. And it's almost, we have completed about uh, uh, three decades now. Uh, for the first uh, 27 years, it was uh, helmed by um, Asha Madam, Dr. Asha Rajwanshi, and also Dr. Uh, Mathur Sir was also part of this uh, cell. And uh, I came in much very later, only in, uh, after the uh, COVID in 2020, October, I took over uh, the cell as a nodal officer. And I'm going to be, um, you know, uh, sharing my experiences uh, of handling this particular cell. So in the last three years, in which about uh, almost about a year went in uh, COVID, so the cell receives a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of uh, requests, a lot of direct directives to handle various uh, issues pertaining to development. So in the last three years, we have received about 53. Uh, we have worked on 53 ecological ass assignments, and each of these assignments were of uh, magnitude of you know differing magnitudes, and we worked in about 15 states. And it encompassed about, we worked excluding the islands, about nine of the 10 biogeographic zones, the EISL at this uh, institute worked. And when we looked at, uh, we have been doing ecological assessments of various uh, uh, assignments, but we did not have time to assess our own uh, activities of the uh, WI EISL. And uh, as part of this annual research seminar, we just looked at our database and we found out uh, much of the uh, directives that comes to uh, to WI, to the, which is again, um, you know, assigned to WI, uh, to the EISL, is from the Forest Advisory Committee. Almost about 24 out of uh, 53 assignments were uh, from the Forest Advisory Committee, ranging from various issues, and also followed by the Standing Committee of National Board for Wildlife, with, who again directs and seeks uh, inputs from WI on uh, certain, uh, certain issues. And we also receive uh, inputs from um, a request from the Environmental Appraisal Committee, various state forest departments. Um, uh, a couple of ma couple of times we have been summoned by the uh, Honorable Supreme Court's uh, uh, CEC, uh, and uh, uh, we have also worked uh, with uh, Dr. Sutirth and uh, their busted team uh, for the uh, Ministry of uh, New and Renewable Energy Sources for some policy document, North Northeastern Fr Frontier Railway and the NHAI, National Tiger Conservation Authority, at least for a couple of times we have provided inputs, the National Thermal Power Corporation, and uh, NGT. So there are uh, several of these uh, matters that is referred to uh, the EISL, and um, much of the projects, mo most of them are linear infra. Uh, most of them were roads, followed by railway, and we, are, we also suggest a lot of uh, mitigation measures, review the mitigation measures uh, submitted as part of uh, biodiversity conservation plan or um, wildlife conservation plan. So by the project proponents are reviewed and we also have uh, worked on certain policy documents like uh, reviewing the uh, feasibility of extended uh, reach drilling, uh, mining for uh, riverwood materials, etc. And we looked at uh, the kind of assessments that we have done. Most of the assessments were site inspection visits and followed by short term assessment. And we also did the long-term assessment, long-term assessments in the sense some projects which are two years or older, and then some two cumulative, very important uh, cumulative impact assessments that we had carried out for two tiger reserves. One is Rajaji Tiger Reserve, and uh, another is uh, for the Rantampur Tiger Reserve with, uh, uh, with close coordination with the Rajasthan Forest Department with Tomar Sir. And um, the cell has, uh, for the past uh, three years, uh, has generated resources close to about uh, seven crores since October uh, 2020, and uh, so uh, yeah, the resources are good, but in the in the at the same time, uh, the stress levels are also very high. I'll tell you why the stress levels are high. With certain, uh, I'll be sharing some real life experiences uh, with some case studies. And we can also gauge, you know, out of the 53, I cannot, I cannot speak about all these 53 experiences here, uh, considering the time constraints. I'm going to, I've picked up 
few of them, very interesting case studies. We'll uh, try to go, go through one by one. The first one is the protected area rationalization. In the 65th National Standing Committee for National Board for Wildlife, uh, uh, an ag agenda was placed uh, that is about rationalization of a protected area called as the Karlapat Wildlife Sanctuary. This Karlapat Wildlife Sanctuary is in South Kalahanti Division of um, Orissa. Now, this proposal was approved by the State Board for Wildlife and it had come to Standing Committee for National Board for Wildlife for final clearance. And uh, so this proposal was referred to a subcommittee in which Dr. Sukumar was there, myself, who I was representing, Director WI in this committee, and then uh, there were a couple of other members from the State, state uh, Forest Department. So when we went for the site inspection visit, so the map, uh, you know, so they wanted uh, at couple of places they wanted uh, uh, see the, the earmarked ones at couple of places they wanted rationalization in the sense they wanted the area to be taken inwards. So these were two different reserve forests, and they were this this amount to about 4.2 or 4.425 square kilometers, and then they were adding on about 13 square kilometers. Whenever you rationalize any protected area, it is just not that you just give away certain areas; you also add in certain areas. So with this proposal, then we have we went uh, and tried to um, uh, logically, rationally look at whether this particular rationalization is uh, important or should we go ahead with this. And we had to submit a report and give a recommendation so that a final decision can be taken by the Standing Committee for National Board for Wildlife. And then uh, when you look at this map, it is okay. And then when we went and saw the biotic interferences, the justification given was the biotic interferences is very high, so that you know we want to, uh, you know, go, you know, denotify these particular areas and then maybe uh, add in more areas. But when we looked at a lot of documents, when we went through the chronological events of this particular uh, uh, particular case of rationalization of this protected area, and then somewhere somehow we read about bauxite mining. Bauxite mining. Uh, in this particular division. And then we asked about, we went and spoke to the uh, mining department asking for details about where exactly the bauxite mines are. It will be interesting to see the bauxite mines, where the bauxite, there are two bauxite mines, and that is exactly where the rationalization was sought after. And then you can also we can see that how the boundary was, you know, it does not follow the terrain features, natural terrain, terrain features. And it, it is also, with, this runs parallel to the another bauxite mine where it was also sought after. So then, uh, you know, we, as a committee, we put up this fact to the Standing Committee for Wildlife. We said that the rationalization doesn't seem to be very rational and uh, the proposal. And uh, so because it doesn't feature, you know, the, uh, uh, as I said, the natural features. So we asked uh, we, uh, the Standing Committee to refer probably considered deferring and this was deferred and the, this was sent back to the state government and the state government uh, had to rework on the proposal and then uh, it was submitted again back to uh, the National Board for Wildlife. The second case study in which I'm going to talk about is about the Hasdi Oran uh, coal fields. Uh, the Hasdi Oran coal fields also, if, if uh, we have to understand the conservation governance uh, through some case studies, I would suggest, you know, Hasdi Oran coal fields is one and then the Hubli Ankola uh, is a uh, railway line is also one uh, you know case study of understanding the conservation governance as in how different statutory bodies take decisions uh, and then but still the proposal is kept alive so the uh, hasdi oran coming to the hasdi oran coal fields uh, this particular uh, proposal was rejected by the forest advisory committee in 2011 subsequently within a couple of months uh, the uh, uh, the uh, the fac again it recommended the proposal uh, after a couple of months. And then after a couple of months, once it was recommended, and then immediately uh, a case was filed in the NGT. And NGT sent a directive uh, to, uh, you know, asking WI to conduct this study. So to look at how this area is important is Hasdi Oran landscape is sandwiched between a network of protected areas. Uh, like for example, north of north of the, the Hasdi Oran coal fields, the red one that you see is Chhattisgarh, and within Chhattisgarh, the, on the northern side, uh, on top of uh, this Hasdi Oran coal fields is protected area ranging from Madhya Pradesh, like uh, Bandhavgarh, Sanjay Gandhi Tiger Reserve, and then in Chhattisgarh you have this uh, Guru Gasidas, Tamur Pingla, followed by uh, Badal Coal and Samarsot, and below the Hasdi Oran coal fields you have this Achanakmar, Kana, 
and uh, Borondi uh, uh, network of protected areas. So this is sandwiched between you know, uh, plenty of protected areas. And then uh, we all uh, very well know that uh, the kind of uh, uh, the kind of conflict levels are there in East, East Central region. So East Central region harbors about 10 percentage of the elephant population in the country, whereas 40 percentage of the conflict levels in the country. So if you look at uh, there are about 3,000 odd elephants, but there are, if you look at, there are in the east central region encompassing uh, Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, Orissa, there are about 250 human casualties that occur. Within Chhattisgarh alone, annually about 70 human casualties occur. But in Raj Rajaji, very close to our western Rajaji, where uh, it, about 250 square kilometers, you have about, uh, you know, 500 odd uh, elephants, and then the human casualties are very less, you know, maybe one or two in annually. So, why is this so? So, you know, drastic where you have human casualties very less and in certain landscapes human casualties is very, very high. So, considering all this, you know, uh, trying to answer to the NGT uh, specific directives, we looked at uh, where all elephants are occurring and uh, we looked at the compartment data where everywhere uh, elephants were there in this landscape and uh, we uh, in submitted our report saying that uh, um, you know, no, this area, particular area has to be declared as a no-go area and uh, that is what the decision of the 2011 FAC as well. And we also, you know, considering um, there is lack of time, I'll have to mitigate myself, so um, I'll, couple, I'll slip, uh, you know, skip a couple of slides so that I don't take uh, time from uh, commercial for the next talk. We, we looked at riverbed material mining uh, close, to, uh, close to the institute. Um, in, a, in a river called as the Ravasan. And uh, Ravasan, the National Board for Wildlife had recommended a proposal for riverbed material mining with a condition saying that uh, from the summer months, which is the pinch period for elephants, where water shortage is there, from ap April to September, uh, the riverbed, materi riverbed material shouldn't be mined. But uh, government of Uttarakhand went with a request saying that they need to open it during this April to September as well. And then, uh, uh, based on this request, then WA was asked again conduct an assessment. We did an assessment and we found that uh, this particular area is very, you know, elephants are using there and especially in um, um, the, uh, the elephant cell of this institute, Dr. Nigam and Dr. Bilal, they shared the data with us and with this data we, we looked at and uh, we presented saying that uh, to the National Board for Wildlife, uh, these uh, elephants require these fluvial systems for move, moving in, in the landscapes to reaching uh, Ganges and, uh, and then and with all these evidences we, uh, we submitted a report saying that uh, we need to um, maintain status quo from April to September we need to, uh, we need to maintain status quo and should not open it. We also did an assessment uh, again uh, the Laldang Chilakal uh, uh, corridor uh, uh, assessment is one of one, another um, very interesting case study. So, wherein we assessed uh, the elephant movement here. There was a committee that was constituted, and WA was part of this committee. And the state government uh, requested certain modifications in terms of reducing the mitigation measures. Uh, and then WA was, you uh, know, asked to do an assessment as part of this committee. And then, as when the site inspection happened, we found a lot of uh, evidences of elephants right away during the site inspection. We had direct sighting of a tusker. And then we assess the mitigation measures which were already built before the clearance were obtained. And this being a barber tract, there are a lot of, you can see whether elephants can use these kind of mitigation structures. And these all have to be, what do we do once it is built? So much amount of public money has been invested. And then, um, so now, uh, go ahead is not being given for this. And uh, we had a differing opinion, WI and the National Tiger Conservation Authority, we had a similar kind of opinion. NHAI, they had different kind of opinion, but finally the WI's and NTCA's opinion were here to, here to and uh, it was done. And this is a very recent thing which myself and my colleague Dr. Ramit Kumar, uh, um, I'll just take another two, three minutes uh, with the permission of the chair and I'll just complete. Um, this is a very recent uh, um, assessment that we did. Uh, this again came from National Board for Wildlife. And in the 69th uh, meeting, so uh, in Himachal Pradesh, there is a Mandi district and there is a protected area called the Shikari Devi Wildlife Sanctuary. And in this Shikari Devi Wildlife Sanctuary, two approach roads were to be built. And uh, so after all the permissions and other things, when we went for site inspection visit, myself and Dr. Amit, and then we found that the road was already built. So we had no other go to, you know, we did not have, um, see, other than the black topping, the road is already built. And then 
uh, we had to uh, submit a report to the national board and uh, then we asked the PWD department as in how much expenditure for the last one year you had done. They have already then they submitted a uh, financial budget of the expenditure and we found that they had already spent about 14 crores and uh, about 50 lakhs were pending with them for black topping. We, uh, we had submitted this report to the National Board for Wildlife and the agenda minutes have come yesterday. The director sir also has circulated to me and we are very happy that the National Board had asked uh, queries to the state government asking uh, for and uh, for actions to be taken on violations. Uh, we had also uh, prepared two very important studies of preparing a holistic plan and a cumulative impact assessment for tiger, around Tiger Reserve. One is around Rajaji and another one is around Rantambo Tiger Reserve. Around Rajaji it is for uh, riverbed material and for Rantambo it is about silica mining. And then uh, these two studies were conducted within a period of less than six months time and uh, you know we assessed over more than 6,000 odd square kilometers. That means if 10 kilometer radius around a protected area it brings much more uh, much larger area and we have finalized and we have uh, given certain recommendations where mining should happen, where mining should not happen and uh, this again has been uh, accepted. Um, this study is well known uh, about the gibbons on the, um, uh, you know, we have suggested to build this artificial canopy bridges and then uh, the work has been uh, published as well. Uh, I would like to complete by uh, synthesizing what has been my learning for the last uh, three years, uh, three, three, three years. Uh, by October we will complete three years. There are some commonalities to all these assessments. One is time, the time constraint. So many a times you ask you, WI in the EISL, we get a request saying that you got to do a holistic assessment, cumulative assessment within two months. So, so this kind of time constraint, time restrictions are, uh, you know, uh, is slightly difficult. There are also complexities. There are uh, misnomers like, um, uh, like you prepare a wildlife conservation plan, wildlife action plan, wildlife mitigation plan. There is no glossary to, to all these terms. They prepare an indicative plan. We do not know what this indicative plan is, where to indicate, what to indicate, whom to ask. So, so all these things are there and we obviously need to have strengthen this particular uh, EISL and because it involves a lot of multidisciplinary aspects to it which we don't have expertise like legal issues. You know, we don't have a legal backing in the cell. Um, so, uh, you know, every case that comes into us, we have to do a lot of work in looking at the chronology of events. Even if you miss certain things, there might be some bauxite mines coming inside there. So, you got to be very careful with this. So, the cell has been there for the last 30 years and off late, we are not doing any impact assessment uh, assessments. If you, you know, look back and assess our cell, so that, you know, it is my humble suggestion as a nodal officer who has been looking after the cell for the last three years, that this may be renamed as conservation policy and advisory cell. The conservation advisory is what we are doing rather than doing a lot of impact assessments. And one other humble suggestion is resource allocations for the cells and labs may be based on resource generation and rigorous scientific and technical inputs. You would have, in the last three years alone, we would have provide, you know, we have produced more than about 50 odd reports, which takes a lot of, you know, effort. And uh, I'm just the face, this is my team. And uh, all of, you know, I thank all of them. And with this, I complete my talk and uh, I thank all of you. Thank you. I have to make an announcement. I request all the poster presenters to be ready because after this talk, you will be there out and the uh, posters will be evaluated at the time. If there are any questions for all the please send them to the stage. Thank you. Adar, I started and I am from the end of my talk. The project. Project Cheetah weigh heavy on me for two reasons. One, I'll tell you now. Ye kai logon ka khwab raha hai. Ye Dr. Jhala ka khwab tha, ye Dr. Ranjit Singh ka khwab tha, aur bhoat se logon ka khwab tha. Aur Cheetah, I found, is a very difficult species. Aapne advertisement suna hoga, Cheetah bhi peeta hai. It only drink dew, mountain dew. 
so uh, i'm going to talk about cheeta and i'm telling you it's very difficult to understand and unravel the mystery kahan uh, kuch numaya ho gaya lala o gul mein not everything is revealed in the beauty of song and beauty of nature kuch to hoga jo khak mein pina ho gaya there must be something which is hidden in dust so cheeta is like that lot is hidden the other part which i'm going to tell you which heavy we very heavy on our conscious is it with let cheeta go extinct in our country and many a time we create a very romantic stories uh, about our culture of course there is no second thought on that amongst all the cultures the way we preserve our uh, nature but when it comes to survival there will always be compromise and during british time thousands of cheetahs got killed if you look at cheetah were part of our history you can see them on the cave paintings uh, in madhya pradesh rajasthan this is driven all over the country akbar have about almost 1000 cheetah in his menagerie for hunting so cheetah conservation has started long back in 1952 when first indian board of wildlife met they decided that there has to be some done something for cheetah conservation and the plan was at that time that we discussed with shah firan and do a barter we'll give them lions and get the cheetahs from them but then iranian revolution happened and well nothing happened after that uh, it was revived in 2009 again uh, in a busted habitat in rajasthan uh, and they decided that we should bring back cheetah to india uh, and so several surveys have been done across the country uh, all over uh, to find out which is the best cheetah habitat and it is also decided that iran is no more possible so where we look for cheetah so decided that we look for cheetah probably from africa because genetically they are still very close so for any introduction this is not reintroduction this is basically we are talking about introduction of bringing species subspecies uh, intercontinental uh, movement so there is a very careful planning need to be done a several document has been prepared there is a document on disease risk analysis also uh, been done for this species and so the modeling has been done all of us to make pretty maps so this was one of them uh, comparison to south africa uh, we've included south africa and namibia's distribution there and how well it distributes so if you look at this picture it almost the model sometime give you truth so it is very much like what earlier cheetah distribution was and so we decided that kuno will be a right place and it's important that we should understand about kuno's history uh, millions of rupees have been spent to bring lions unfortunately we will not able to bring lions to kuno but i tell you one thing there are a lot of con- this is the most controversial project so far we are handling in terms of uh, conservation a uh, lot of uh, opinion about it a cheetah if cheetah would have not been brought trust me kuno would have been not saved and we also save in dream and it's very important if i say philosophically the guilt is the only thing we can harvest for conservation in the best way we can harvest it so if you can look at the kuno national park it's very large park almost 12000 square kilometer but the surrounding habitat uh, is almost 30000 square kilometer if we able to protect this dry grassland it will be the marvelous thing to happen to the country uh, many questions that india is not a cheetah habitat where cheetah were surviving in india if you will see this kuno this is kardahi forest or anagases savanna habitat open thorn forest so very much like cheetah habitat so memorandum of understanding has been signed between namibia and south africa to bring back cheetah just to give you a quick uh, review that once uh, how to bring cheetah once the cheetah is captured in the country of origin we need to keep them in quarantine for one month to make sure there is no disease a lot of disease investigation happened then then they will bring them and again we have to keep them for a month to make sure uh, that they adopt and there is no disease acclimatization of of them and then probably release in the wild i am going to talk about these this famous plane uh, is of mr hamish unfortunately he passed away in that accident which heard of going down uh, in a submarine to see titan so titan so 17 september cheetah has been brought to india uh, 
Prime Minister has released uh, Chita in India. Uh, and it is his support and the support uh, of highest political order which makes sure the Chita introduction can happen. Second time we brought Chita from South Africa in uh, Air Force plane. And they were released in quarantine bomas. Just to show you, quarantine boma is about 50 by 25 uh, meters uh, in area, which have, uh, you know, resting area also for cheetah. We modified the designs looking at our experience uh, from earlier, uh, you know, quarantine bomas. We put high mass cameras to monitor them. I'll show you some of the clippings of them. They actually see for quite long distances. And then what we have, we call uh, soft release or acclimatization boma because cheetah had never seen a cheetah in his life. They are seeing all the antelopes. So we have to tell them what the food looked like. So we made sure that the cheetah in this guy and all other species, so they can actually acclimatize. And we want to acclimatize them to Indian condition. So these are soft release boma, which was fairly big. And I just want to show you, within a month they adopted pretty well. So this uh, will show you how cheetah chase is chasing cheetah over there. The another footage, a quick one. It seriously moved with the lightning speed. This is all done with the high mast cameras. So they have acclimatized in this area pretty well. And uh, Cheetal is almost like a McDonald's burger for them. <laughs> <laughs> Engaging people is very, very crucial uh, for uh, you know Cheetah conservation. So like uh, Ganga Mitras, that concept is already there. Cheetah Mitras are made. There are more than 500 Cheetah Mitras um, in many villages around Puno. And it's a very poor area. Uh, very, very poor area and I think people have a lot of hope from this project and project has to deliver uh, surrounding villages uh, what we promised that Cheetah will uh, change their fate. So a lot of activities happened uh, in this area about awareness and people are pretty happy. The land prices have gone up 600% more than what it used to be. So we use dog and drone squad also for monitoring uh, cheetah and also for protection. Monitoring in uh, QB uh, for health uh, happens very often. All these cheetahs are radio tagged. And there is 24-7 monitoring uh, in free ranging environment. So we have a team of researcher and forest department staff which do 8 hour duty uh, throughout. And the cheetah is very, very uh, intensively monitored. We have too many people we can afford to monitor 24-7. If you look at home ranges uh, and uh, or ranges rather uh, and movement of Kuno, there is a lot of controversy that cheetah will, Kuno can't have that many cheetah because they range in a very large area. Uh, they spend a very small time, about a couple of months to few days only, depending on when they have released. But if you will see that on an average they move about 2 to 3 kilometer to 8 kilometer in a day. And the home range varies from 27 uh, to even 5,000. These two animals, female and a male, have ventured out. They were brought back uh, into captivity and released again. But India differ in many uh, ways. The controversial uh, study which is compared with us is basically that uh, cheetah need very large area, but those studies are largely from farmland. If you look at protected area studies from Africa, from non-migratory non prey, their home ranges are pretty small and Puno can have anywhere between 15 to 20 cheetahs. Just to show you, uh, this is the coalition males, uh, their home range, about 172 square kilometer. 
and the solitary female whose home range is about 74 km when we release them most of them try to hang around uh, to what we call acclimatization boma and they move slowly uh, outside their principal habitat use of course is grassland and mixed deciduous forest and grassland are more used so far they have predated on eight species cheetal blackbird chinkara sambar nilgai hare and peafowl cheetal predation is very high of course cheetal is also in, in a very high density uh, in this place on an average they make a kill at every 6 days but when we they were in boma the kills were happening at almost 4 day interval uh, probably we are missing some smaller kills uh, outside in the wild uh, so cheetah uh, has to hunt uh, within 6 days they can't go hungry for more than that the cheetah prey density is about 19 uh in this area uh and other prey is pretty poor so i was telling you why bringing cheetah is a savior for kuno and maybe will be the savior for dry grassland because when the when the forest department of madhya pradesh started investing we started almost at 2 to 3 cheetah per square kilometer it reached almost to 40 to 50 cheetah per square kilometer and start declining over time because lions were not coming and protection regime has actually changed also interesting part which happened here is the leopard population build up very fast in this habitat there are almost 91 leopards now here and we introduced about 14 cheetah each cheetah will require about 260 prey per annum uh this i am talking about interest this includes the capital and interest both actual requirement is about 90 to 95 individual per year but 260 means that it will produce enough cheetah so you only eating interest and not the capital just to show you this is the in the center is the leopard uh, distribution which is the main competitor and just to bring to your notice that a uh, lot of uh, death of cheetah happened in africa because of uh, leopard lion and hyena uh, indian hyenas are okay they are not uh, that aggressive as african hyenas uh, but so far uh, leopard uh, actually not uh, no interact interactions happen but not aggressive interaction rather the coalition has uh, uh, chase away the leopard and leopard are also confused who has come with the spots now which is different than mine <laughs> so uh, so far no mortality but if you see uh, most of the wildlife in kuno is in this area whether leopard or cheetah if you see here because cheetah distribution is largely centered around uh, which is a major prey and uh, outside prey is poor and we are hoping to augment uh, population in this area to bring more cheetah uh, cheetah and black buck and chinkara uh, to because of this part of the kuno and outside is very prey poor lot of cheetah deaths happen here uh, not lot some uh, some probably uh are failure one or two cases one died of kidney failure i mean that's condition nobody knew when we brought the cheetah uh and i tell you one thing uh, cheetah is very susceptible to the way food is given so very high mortality happen for cheetah in captivity uh, you need to give intact food you can't give a dressed meat to cheetah as we do in captivity to other animals uh, one female was killed by coalition three died of infection which never nobody knew remember that they are coming from southern hemisphere to northern hemisphere they are still wearing a coat uh, in summer imagine that in summer hot summer in kuno they are having a winter coat and that's why there are a lot of issues uh, we faced some of them died because of septicemia and that's why there's many who in cry and i lend my talk with this that we made to make sure that at least 50 cheetah will be there in different areas of india cheetah not 10 to 14 cheetah can exist in any one small area and we need to augment prey and generate livelihood for people thank you thank you
question is for Kamal. Uh, is there a hope of tiger population yeah. revival in Arkhan? Speaker room. <coughs> if so, then what should be the best immediate course of action? Yes, uh, it's very much possible. I think uh, uh, if you ask me this four years back, probably not. But I think for last few years, Jharkhand has started investing. Palamo is recovering uh, now and they are planning to do uh, prey augmentation. Uh, and they are making, uh, because prey augmentation is very, very crucial uh, in Palamo. And remember that half of the Palamo is still uh, not available because of insurgency issue, but I feel there is a hope in Jharkhand, in Palamo, definitely. Just a small interruption here, an announcement to all the poster presenters, please be near your posters because the poster evaluation has begun. Question for Bilal, how about taking the railway line outside Raja Sir, uh, I think that is the plan. So as of now, that's what we were trying to uh, try the government of India, that there is a no plan for double tracking of the railway line right now. As of now, there is no double line. But as soon as they will come for the double line, I think 99% of the time, this railway line is going to go from outside. on a global best example. These are reports of uh, Karnataka trying to uh, upgrade new conservation breeding centers for GIT. Your comments? Well, to have a conservation breeding center, we need a founder population. And a minimum founder population of 15 to 20 birds would require about 30 eggs. Where will these eggs come from is a big question, particularly for areas where there are no, you know, uh, large populations that exist. Um, on the other hand, uh, Karnataka Forest Department, uh, Karnataka has lost a lot of grasslands, but the Forest Department is actively involving CSR funding and trying to acquire lands. And uh, a good way would be to restore these areas into grasslands. Um, when the conservation, the National Conservation Breeding Program in Rajasthan uh, starts producing surplus birds, then as per MOA and as decided by the authorities, birds can be released in Karnataka. That might be a more scientifically feasible approach. That, that will take some time. That will take, that will definitely take time. Right. The next is uh, a question for Vishnu Prem. Uh, Please comment on the collaborative efforts of Dorfit Conservation with Bangladesh and Pakistan. Um, so, uh, it's a little tricky because when we talk about the Indus River Dolphins, majority of the Indus River Dolphin populations is in Pakistan. And the sole remaining population of Indus River Dolphins is in Bihar, separated almost by 600 kilometers and almost six barrages. So the only way to revive the population of Indus River Dolphins in India is by translocation. However, political climate does not allow that. There was a time when Pakistan was willing to uh, exchange gharias for Indus River Dolphins. But there have been talks recently, also as per the recent Project Dolphin Steering Committee meeting, one of the proposals was that maybe NGO partners can play a major role in uh, facilitating this translocation. As for Bangladesh as well, one of the uh, one of the points of the agenda of the Dolphin Steering Committee was to 
undertake a joint survey with Nepal as well as Bangladesh for the river dolphins and Iravadi dolphins, which are spread across Sundarbans. But so far, uh, this has just begun. So hopefully, we'll see some some progress in the future. Oh, thank you. Uh, the next uh, is for uh, Gopi. Gopi asks, why is it that the projects are directed to the NBWL and not the state by, uh, state boards? This would save time and money for the development projects and prevent wastage of money. So. So if it is uh, if it is in a protected area or within a tiger corridor or within an ecosystem zone and uh, the state board the proposal comes to the state board for wildlife and the state board for wildlife sends it to the national board for wildlife. So this is the process. I think we need to have this kind of process to strengthen decision making, conservation decision making which can directly you know impact the species and important habitats. So these processes are very important. It, they, they might slightly there might be a delay but uh, I think uh, we need to uh, tolerate with this delay it remind us to be a schoolboy again <laughs> Kamal, this is for you. In most of the cheetah eating countries, they are in conflict with uh, humans. As there are ample villages around Puno, conflict is inevitable with the increasing cheetah population. How are we going to manage it? Yeah, you are right that uh, from where we got cheetah, there is uh, conflict in the livestock conflict, uh, uh, both in uh, South Africa and Namibia. So far, uh, they have made only one uh, cattle calf has been killed. Uh, they come across many of them, uh, which is very, very interesting. Even outside, uh, of all the cheetah which were released, at least 70% of them venturing out, but they have largely killed black buck and chinkara and chosinga outside, but rarely they kill. But it is inevitable that will happen uh, soon. And I think forest department is geared for it. The compensation scheme is pretty good. Uh, and I think that's the only way. Compensation is the only way. There is no other uh, way out of that uh, to make sure that people will get timely compensation. Thank you. Thank you, my dear faculty colleagues. Uh, more questions, but we are running short of time. Thank you very much. All the faculty members, my colleagues, made excellent presentations, and uh, I will now request uh, our <laughs> session chairperson to give this comment. It's been wonderful to be back here with you guys, and uh, it's been a wonderful session considering that we've talked about the most. And uh, they were wonderful times because there were there was no data for us to go on at that time. And this is where you have a rich source of material now, which has come over the years. Use it well and have a wonderful life. Thank you. Thank you, sir.
Ich glaube, die nicht mehr. Thank you, sir, um, for conducting that session. I now request our session co-chair, Dr. Satyak Kumar, to thank the session chair with a small uh, token of our appreciation. Thank you, sir. Now we now come to the end of our first technical session. We'll break for lunch and we'll meet you back at 2.30. Thank you. Are you minimizing it? थोड़ा क्यों क्या सर में इससे इशू हो रहा है स्पीकर है है अरे अंकित दो मिनट यार अंकित सर सिम तो बंद कर दे
कर रहा हूँ हाँ वो नहीं लेगा करो आप ये दिखा रहे हो हाँ करो ना सेट करो ये हमें ये देखना है पहले इधर नहीं इसको नहीं उससे हैंडल से करो हैंडल से अब इसको मेरे को मेरे मेरी तरफ कर दो ये ठीक है ये व्यू है ये व्यू है अब अब छोड़ दो छोड़ दो इसको एक मिनट थोड़ा और टेढ़ा आ रहा है यार नीचे वायर आइए भाई दिस काटक गेम का 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 सेट आइए वो पर्दा पर्दा
नहीं दे रहे खराब होता भाई ये ये मुझे लग रहा गिरा है भाई ये नहीं तो चली नहीं रही तो यार मुझे डाउट लग रहा है किसी ने मारा है को लग रहा है गिर गया ये गिर गया ये मारा गया देखो तो उसको थोड़ा सा निशान लगा हुआ इसमें ये जीतू के हाथ में तो नहीं आया था
further ahead. And in the same uh, process, we would like to hear all the seven, eight presentations this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So this session is about uh, carnivores and uh, herbivores. We have uh, seven presentations. Uh, I know it's a post session, it may be tough, but I know some of the belly boys are here in this session who are going to be engaging you uh, more meaningfully. So I take this opportunity to introduce uh, the chair, and I know many of you know Dr. Chess Navy. He's a stalwart in himself. So he's an IFS officer of 98 batch. And uh, I think uh, many of you who worked in Kana would know and also in the NDCA. So he was one of the key persons who developed uh, Kana Tigers along with Dr. Rajesh Paul, who is our fact chairman. And he's also been involved in some of the pioneering work in India, like uh, rewilding tiger, reintroduction of tiger, and also the guard reintroductions happened the first time in India. So sir has been uh, very, very inspirational to you. And uh, the first uh, retirement, I think I, nobody would agree that he's retired, but look at his, uh, you know, he's still very young and he's working with the uh, Global Tiger Forum and advising on various things, including this very modern technology on trail guard, which you have seen in newspaper very recently. He is one of the persons involved. So, along with us, we also have our other co chair, uh, Dr. S.K. Mr. S.K. Singh. And I went Monday to tell you that uh, both of them have a connection in Kana. It's uh, the deer and the tiger, and it's uh, the land of the tiger we have. So he's actually a forest officer again. He's a very regular uh, coming wildlife in South India. He's a 2000 batch officer and uh, worked as field director in uh, Satura and is currently the field director of Kana. So without taking much time, I invite the first speaker of this presentation, another session, uh, Suman, uh, who's going to talk about monitoring of tigers, co predators, and prey in the landscape in Maharashtra. I request uh, Arun to introduce the scene. Suman did his bachelor's and master's from Calcutta University and joined W as a part of AIT in 2018. He's currently working with Dr. Bilal on long term monitoring of prey and predators in the Bilal landscape. Over to you. Hello. Thank you so much for, for the introduction. Uh, I'll be good afternoon, everyone. I will be talking about uh, monitoring of tiger, co predator, and prey in Vidarbha landscape, Maharashtra. Uh, on behalf of my project, long term monitoring of tiger, co predator, and prey in tiger reserves and other tiger rearing areas of Vidarbha, Maharashtra. These are project details. Our project started in 2019, uh, supervised by Dr. Bilal Habib and Paragniam, Dr. Paragniam and funding support uh, from Maharashtra Forest Department. We already presented few uh, presentation in IRS uh, 2023 from WII, uh, which highlighted uh, tiger cub survivability and influence of uh, high male turnover and tiger density in Tadawandri Tiger Reserve. Interaction pattern of large carnivores in male heart tiger reserve. The interaction between tiger and leopard densities across different tiger density gradient in uh, high and uh, different tiger density gradient. And uh, the distribution of tiger and leopard in uh, human dominated landscape. As we all know, tiger is a keystone species and it regulates many ecological processes. So tiger conservation is, uh, is actually means the conservation of the entire ecosystem including co-predator and the prey species and the habitat. If we look at Vidarbha, Vidarbha has many protected and non-protected area which are harboring tiger and leopard and other co-predator also in uh, different prey species. Monitoring of these prey and predator species in Vidarva is important for uh, getting uh, fine scale insights in population of uh, th their population status and their influence on, in the ecosystem. And uh, long term monitoring of these species is critical for understanding their dynamics and fluctuations in their numbers and prey, uh, their numbers and demographic parameters. If uh, in a in a multi predator landscape, predator often interact with each other in different levels, in space, in times, in terms of resource utilization. So understanding the uh, 
<clears throat> interaction pattern between major predator species in from in the landscape is necessary for different conservation strategy making and uh, policy developments so we have uh, two major objective for today's talk uh, understanding the status of tigers co-predator and their prey species in the landscape and we'll be also highlighting the interaction pattern between two major carnivore species tiger and leopard at the level of space and time the method we used we use line transect based distance sampling camera trapping following two square kilometer grid and all the analyses are performed in performed using ms excel distance arcgis and r coming to our study area as we are as i earlier mentioned uh, our study area has different types of and different wildlife sanctuaries and non protected areas which are having tigers and co predator in varying densities and varying number we estimated a total number of tigers uh, in uh, with our landscape is 446 but me the identified minimum tiger number is 390 and we identified minimum 706 leopards from this landscape and the population estimate in 9902 uh, we i uh, i will only highlight the status of tiger uh, and co predator and the prey species for today or uh, for the tiger is the for the five tigers the male tiger tiger the pinch tiger is of navigon axis tiger is of boar and tarawan tiger tiger is of Coming to the uh, first objective of our um, talk, that is estimating prey population, we used uh, line transect based distance sampling, and the data are analyzed in uh, distance software. We used 2022 data for this analysis. Uh, we uh, estimated the density of cheetah, sambar, nilgiri, and white boar, which are having higher number of observation in these. Uh, the tiger reserves we found a uh, high cheetah density followed by high sambar density in boar tiger is the high cheetah density and followed by high uh, moderate uh, wild boar density in pinch tiger is up and for the rest of the tiger is up are having moderate to low prey density In the second part, we estimated tiger and leopard population. We used camera trap data for uh, these. Uh, uh, we need we use camera trap data. We segregated the camera trap data uh, using mega detector uh, and SPSEC species wise, and then tiger leopard identification are uh, performed in horse spotter, and then we used a spatially explicit capture capture framework using our package CCR for estimating the density of tiger and leopard in different tiger reserves we used 20 20 2021 and 2022 data for this uh, analysis and we found uh, in case of all the tiger reserves the tiger tiger and leopard densities are more or less similar across the year uh, they are not much fluctuating uh, we identified Uh, Tarawa, there is TATR, and Pinch Tiger Reserve, Maharashtra, uh, is having uh, are having uh, higher tiger densities than other sites. And Tarawa and Pinch Tiger, Tarawa Pinch and Navigon Axis Tiger Reserve are having higher leopard densities uh, than other sites. Then we looked at the predator and prey densities across sites. using 2022 data we we found that uh, that under the is having more uh, moderate prey densities and high tiger and leopard densities and in pinch tiger is the we are uh, we we observe high prey densities and high tiger and leopard densities and in in uh, navigon axis tiger is the there is a low prey density and very low tiger density and higher prey density so we categorize tarawa andri tiger is the and pinch as high tiger density high leopard density area and navigon axis tiger is the 
as low target density and high leopard density area for our further analysis. We looked at the interaction pattern between uh, tiger and leopard in high and low tiger density areas in three different levels, temporal pattern, spatial pattern, and spatial temporal pattern. For temporal pattern, we used tem temporal uh, activity overlap between tiger and leopard using our package overlap. And for spatial pattern, we used uh, den generated density surface using spatial uh, explicit capture capture model. And then we looked at the relationship between tiger and leopard densities using quantum aggregation. And for the spatial temporal pattern, we used time to encounter model. First, the temporal activity overlap, we found um, near to 95% of the temporal activity overlap in all the tigers of be it low density or in high density. The, it is showing no temporal segregation between these two species. And then we looked at the spatial pattern of tiger and leopard densities in Tarawan 3 tiger is up. It showed that the, the areas with high tiger density are also having high leopard densities. That means there is less spatial segregation also in that level. In Paints Tiger Reserve, we also see the similar pattern. High tiger density areas are having high leopard densities. In case of Nagzi and Oregon Tiger Reserve, the tiger density is the tiger density itself is low, so low, and restricted tigers are restricted to a few areas, and the leopard are all over uh, distributed all over the tiger reserve. We cannot comment very well about the spatial segregation between these two species. Still, we found some areas are having uh, high tiger densities and high leopard densities. Further, we looked at the relationship between tiger and leopard densities, we found no effect of tiger density on leopard density in low density tiger reserve, that is nothing on oxida. And in case of two high density tiger reserve, Tarawa and Pench, uh, they are showing different patterns. In Pench tiger reserve, the tiger density, uh, the, the leopard density is declining slightly in the higher quantiles of tiger density. And in Tarawa and the retires, the tiger density or labor density is increasing with a higher quantile of so labor density is complete uh, different pattern. To look this further, we use uh, spatial pattern of uh, predator and prey. For predator, then, uh, predator spatial pattern, we use the density surface of tiger leopard. And for the prey species, we use capture rate of three prey species. Photogra camera photocapture rate uh, of the three space species, uh, Samba, Cheetah, and White. Here we can see the higher photocapture rate are pocketed. That means the distribution of the species are related to their preferred habitat. And tiger and leopard both are following their dis uh, prey distribution. As the tiger as the prey distribution or prey capture rate is higher in those areas, the tiger and leopard densities are also higher. We see a similar pattern in Tadova also. But uh, then the question comes when, uh, why the quantile uh, regression is showing different curves? Uh, the tiger and leopard both are increasing in uh, space in Tarawandiri, but are uh, uh, segregating in space to some extent in Pench. Uh, it, this could be the answer. The prey density in Pench Tiger Reserve is higher than Tadova Tiger Reserve. But the, uh, but the thing, the prey density in Pench Tiger Reserve is higher in Tadova, and prey distribution is also pocketed. So, the, in paint tiger reserve, there is a good amount of resources and hence less competition between tiger and leopard in those pockets. But in Tadova, they are following 
some may be may be there uh, both tiger and leopard following those uh, prime habitat of prey densities and maybe they are following uh, competition or uh, co-occurring with some other finer scale segregation strategies in uh, maybe in the spatial temporal scale or by the differential food choice food preferences further we used uh, time to encounter model to address this in finer scale uh, we calculated the time differences between first tiger capture and subsequent leopard captures <coughs> and then we use the randomization test to uh, obtain the p value which explains uh, spatial temporal pattern between these two species we got a mean time difference between tiger and leopard capture uh, in NNTR that is 56 hours and in TATR it is 111 hours and PTR it is 117 hours. We used uh, the randomization test. The colored dot here in the curve indicates uh, observed detection probability of leopard after the tiger capture and the black lines within the box in the uh, randomization, they, they are the randomized, randomized detection probability of leopard capture after the tiger capture. In this state, we in this state we have the hypothesis that uh, if a tiger is getting captured in a camera, the leopard capture probability should increase day by day. But here we cannot see that kind of pattern. That is why the, even the p value is uh, lower. It is non-significant. Uh, and showing and indicating no spatial second and temporal spatial temporal segregation in Naxira and Abhimotaiza. And in case of Pinch Tigerism and Tadova, both are showing similar patterns. There is no spatial temporal segregation because the P value is coming non significant. Further, we looked at uh, the Total location, calculated the total location of leopard capture in a 12 hour time window pre and post tiger capture. The number of leopard capture before and after 12 hours of tiger capture. Here we cannot see, here also we cannot see any significant difference between uh, these two species capture. To conclude, uh, prey density is varied across the tiger reserve and their distribution indicate prime habitats, those are used by the large carnivore species. Large uh, tiger and leopard densities across tiger reserve are dependent on local ecological condition, that is prey abundance, habitat character, characteristics. No significant spatiotemporal uh, segregation between tiger and leopard was observed at this scale. This scale of the analysis indicates co-occurrence uh, of these two species in the high tiger reserve and also in low tiger reserve, low density tiger reserve. To way forward, more fine scale analysis is required to understand the co-occurrence between tiger and leopard in high density areas. Radio coloring may provide better insights into the fine scale understanding of the species temporal pattern. Understanding of dietary pattern between these two large carnivores is important because uh, to understand their uh, co-occurrence or coexistence. Evaluation of density estimation techniques of prey species rather than line transit for estimating uh, for understanding the densities in more fine scale to, to obtain absolute densities in different areas. Habitat management and more intensive prey monitoring in uh, high tiger density areas is important for conservation of these species in long term. I acknowledge the following people for this study. Thank you so much. Very good. Thank you so much. So the next speaker is uh, Sutritam. We'll be talking about uh, decadal insight on populations of the tigers in Panna tiger, which is one of the successful introduction models in terms of tigers.
Supreme completed his master's from University of Calcutta and is currently registered there as a PhD student. His work focuses on large carnivore interactions in Panna Tiger Sir. Over to you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Today I'm going to talk about the decadal insights and population growth of panda tiger, uh, tigers in panda tiger reserves. So we all know that what happened in uh, Sariska and Panna in 2005, 6, and then 2009. So we lost all the tigers, and the one of the major reason was the poaching in behind that. Tiger skin, uh, dead body of tigers were recovered from in and around Panna. You can you know, see there some of the snapshots from the previously recorded things. So, in one hand. In India, the tiger number is increasing. Panna is also the safe home of 30 to 35 tigers within the park, always based on the pug mark analysis. So we don't know whether it is reflecting exact number or not. But you can see there is a certain drop down. From 2009, three tigers were reintroduced initially, and altogether seven tigers were reintroduced in Panna. And currently, we have a population of 74 individuals within the park. So Panna is situated over the Vindian range. and. Uh, you know, having an area of around 1600 square kilometer, Kane is the only major river which you know cuts down the Panna into two halves and cuts down the Panna into two halves. And uh, we have you know three distinct seasons: uh, a very pleasant summer, the temperature is 748, followed by monsoon and winter. So this project was initiated in way back 2009, and the major focus was. You know, uh, establish a uh, self-sustaining viable tiger population, free-ranging tiger population within the park. Major focus is the minimum 12 breeding adult population. And after so much conservation effort and you know putting all this hard work, we achieved this goal. So obviously the uh, extinction of tiger is really an unfortunate event, but on the other side of the coin, it gives an opportunity to understand or rather than study the demographic parameters of reintroduced tigers, especially in the average litter size, interbirth interval, and so on. So our hypothesis is during the low density tiger reserves, the average litter size will be bigger and the interbirth interbirth will be shorter. As far as field data collection is concerned, during this eight tenure, we captured and collared 28 individuals and monitored them closely. But as the population expands within the park, it's not possible and viable to you know go and put collar in each and every individual. So therefore, we uh, deployed camera traps within the core and the maximum parts of the buffer to understand the movement of non collared indi indi individuals. We use these following methods and softwares for the analysis and what we have found that the that the new Panna generation showing the larger interval larger uh, average litter size that's one of the reason that the, they are more genetically fit because the Founders are brought from three different landscapes, Bandukar, Kana, and Pinch. Also, we try to deep dive that how actually the average teacher size is changing with increasing the tiger population, and these results actually support our hypothesis. We come up with the interbirth interval. We recorded the shortest interbirth interval ever for tiger. Now, this is the survival probability. Survival probability is very much density dependent context, so this is not a hardcore comparison, rather than this is a kind of a, you know, at a glance. But it's also required to understand that where we are standing. So Panna is showing the uh, carrying a survival probability is around 80 to 82. Uh, th that is, uh, and in case of Panna, as we mentioned, that we recorded the you know shorter intervals interval and comparatively larger uh, larger average litter size. Same, almost the same survival probability we have observed in case of Ranthambore, but the scenario is completely different. Ranthambore is a jam-packed tiger reserve, and there the interval interval is quite longer and the average size is quite shorter, and that's how tiger adjusts their demographic parameters for the long-term survival. Now, in simple word, the high survival probability actually leads to the success of the quick recovery of the population. But still, there are some questions. How and why does this population grow up so rapidly? To, therefore, we come up with a specific model. Let's assume the probability of dying is constant throughout the age. In another model, it's going up exponentially with increasing to the age. Now, in case of mammals, we observed a complicated uh, model, which is bathtub model. So therefore, the probability of dying is actually high when they are in a cup. Once they are entering towards the adulthood, it's going down. And again, it will increase with the cup, with the older age. So theoretically, we should observe the, or rather than we should get the entire time, time span of an individual. But 
and why it's not possible because few of the individual went outside the park and remained undetected for a long time. So therefore, either we miss the bark or the tail, and leads to the confusion that whether it is increasing or decreasing. So a specific survival is a combination of 10 different models. I already explained about this exponential and Gompers. Webull is a reverse J curve, and sigma, uh, logistic is a, a shaped sigmoid curve. We use an additional uh, Markham, uh, Markham uh, constant, which is the age independent mortality. That indicates that the mortality can happen at any time, at any age. Uh, basically, it's maybe the catastrophic effect. We use the KLDC value for the uh, inference that whether there is any difference in between sex or not. So this age specific uh, survival model will tell you that which age class of the population is more vulnerable. So as per the model combination, Weibull Buster model was the best model in our case study, showing there's comparatively lower carb mortality and then it's again in decreasing with the time. Now in the uh, KLDC model, you can see that all the values are almost 0 0.5, which is, that means identical. So we didn't find any of the significant difference uh, in case of survival probability for the male and female. Now this graph is very much interesting, but we have found that almost we found the negligible, you know, independent mortality and the exponential increase of the mortality age, and also the low number of cubs mortality or the initial birth, which actually indicating the high success rate of the cubs that actually going to your boost your future population. We received or uh, we observed that two uh, peaks. One is the baseline mortality, so any population have a baseline mortality that is common, and one is the early life declension. Now, why is the early life decline? As I mentioned earlier, the shortest uh, intervals interval actually indicating that the mother releases the curves quite early, the younger stage. The younger stage curves then started exploring and sometimes in ending up with a conflict situation with other established tigers, male or female, since right now panda is actually fully packed with the tigers. So, in a specific survival model, you can understand that the probability of dying is quite low in comparison to two other uh, model. But our mission, our motto is not to just come up with a complete analysis, unless it doesn't make any sense, unless actually we are come up with any kind of policy making or decision making. So, Panda is a successful story, that's good. But if Panda failed, the only option we have that is the supplementation in the population. Once we talk about the supplementation, most of the time what we do, we do the, you know, capture some of the tiger from one part and then put it to the another one. That is actually not the scenario. And that actually, you know, make more complicated in, the, in this scenario. So basically, each specific uh, survival probability will tell you whether supplement is required, if required, then male or females, how many male or females, and most, most importantly, from which age class. This KDLC value will help you to understand whether you go for only male or only female, and the age class, that whether you have to come up with two subadult female, one prime male, so what actually there should be the exact combination for the supplementation, that is very much required. Now, uh, that is, it was the entire story within the part. Now let's talk about the story of the outside of the park. As I noticed that, you know, in 2013, 2014, actually the uh, dispersal uh, started. And then we have around 24 to 25 tigers within the park, which is far below than our carrying capacity. So that means the dispersal event is not completely dependent on the uh, density of the population. Rather, it's depending where I'm standing. If I am surrounded by the uh, dominated male or female, the only option I have left this place. But if there is some back end place nearby me, then I can start exploring and you know, then establish the, my area slowly. So what we observed that based on the color study, few tigers went outside the park, uh, few went to Noradhi, two went towards the Ranipur. So uh, we observed that you know, the tiger movement is quite high during the night time in comparison to the day. And in the day graph, we got a bimodal graph, and uh, I will explain this later, that why we got this bimodal curve. Now, most of the studies, what we have feel that, you know, there is a huge research gap, because the studies were actually restricted the actual movement pathway of the animal, and how they are changing speed over the time. And therefore, we come up with a multiphasic behavior approach, this is the first time for the tiger. So, why the multiphasic behavior approach? Because when the tiger is outside the park, we should monitor the tiger very closely, but sometimes it's not possible due to the logistic constraint or some other things. At the same time, tiger changes its behavior uh, when they are actually outside the park. So let's forget about the tiger. This is my condition in the every day in the 8.30. I just wake up and then slowly make the breakfast and everything. The situation gets more complicated for me when I realize that I have to come to the biometry within this, uh, you know, uh, 9.30, otherwise my first step is gone. 
situation get more complicated for me when my PI called me and then asked me to come and meet me in the office at 9.30. So that's the only option I had. So based on, the, based on the different behavior strategy, you can come up with 10, 20 different behavioral models. But that it biologically doesn't make any sense. Therefore, we come up with two specific models. One is the encamping, one is the exploratory. So these are the initial parameters we have set. So hidden marker model basically captures the change in step length and turning angle. What is the step length? The distance, the linear distance in between two successive points, and the turning angle is when you are you know, going through a particular direction, take a diversion, that's actually the relative turning angle. So our hypothesis is, due to the encamping, Tiger is showing shorter step length with repeated turning angle, and for the exploratory case, they will show that you know, longer step length with the directional turning angle. So, Hidden Marker model, our result actually supports our hypothesis. We found that, you know, comparably lower step length with the repeated turning angle, and in case of uh, exploratory phase, we found this directional turning angle. Also, we found that Tiger are spending 32% of their time for the resting while they're traveling, uh, sorry, while they're in a dispersal mode, and 68% time they're expanding for the uh, exploratory phase. Also, these two covariates is very important. When they are in a comparatively open area and near to the village, tiger are restricting their movement for the, uh, for, to avoid any kind of unwanted human-wildlife conflict. And that's why you got the bimodal peak in the, in the displacement. Now, when they are in a higher NDVI or maybe in a forested land and far away from the village, they shift their gear and come to the exploratory phase. So, when a tiger is actually moving for, through different landscape or multi-use landscape type, so it's also important to understand how the, they are selecting their habitat. So the first option we have, that is the resource selection function, where we have available points, and also we need to, uh, where we have a use point, and also you need to create pseudo absent point. So sometimes the pseudo absent point is not in our control, it may you know, come under the non-forested area, that could mislead our study. Second option we have, that is the step selection function. Step selection function actually follows the movement pathway, but again the issue is that the Direction of the strength and the length of the step is not in our hand. That again is the mystery of our study. So we skip this thing. Therefore, we come up with a new approach that is integrated step selection function, which is something like this. So what is the integrated step selection function? Let's assume that the dark, you know, darker checkerboards are high resourceful area. So animal move to the darker checkerboard. Now it will show high affinity towards the more resourceful area in comparison compared to the lighter areas. Keeping this hypothesis in mind, so we found that integrated, in case of integrated substitution function, Tiger is showing high affinity during the night time towards the dense forest in comparison to the open forest. On the other hand, Tiger is actually, you know, trying to strongly trying to avoid the non-forested area during the daytime. So the summary that low encamping zone actually low encamping time rather is actually showing that the high habit fragmentation in the habitat because you know, they are not get enough time and enough space to take the risk. At the same time, obviously forest cover is essential for the tiger movement and they are avoiding human, uh, you know, human, sorry, they are avoiding actually the village uh, agriculture matrix. But here is the story that tiger actually changes movement behavior and adjusting his step length based on the landscape challenges they are facing while they are dispersing through a landscape. Now, Vindhya, Panna is the only uh, tiger reserve situated over the Vindhyan range and it's uh, acting as a source population. One of the major things is that still so many years we never recorded that any tiger came in Panna from the outside. So it's already have an immense value, conservation value. At the same time, this low encamping zone actually help, can act as a stepping stone. This stepping stone or small forest patches can't hold a tiger, but it can act as a stopover. But maybe you have a good forest cover, ensure all the protection, you know the polydon. But if you remove those small, small forest patches, your entire uh, corridor will be non-functional. So your effort, your money, everything will be on bend. And obviously for a large carnivore, we, we always talk about this landscape level connectivity and landscape level popul uh, population monitoring and conservation plan. If your corridor is compromised, your entire metapopulation framework will be compromised. So therefore, that's the importance of small forest and encamping zone. That is really important. Any kind of development, any kind of uh, any kind of habitat loss actually may lead to a huge impact. So we would like to thank this our introduced tigers. Without any pen and paper work, they help us. Uh, they allow us to collect the data. They cooperate with us to, to do the, all those study carrying out. 
And I would like to thank the following people. Thank you. Thank you, Sudhir, for finishing early. I now call upon the next speaker. Priyanka will be talking about impact and impact among predator deal of trans Himalaya. What structure the carnival community dynamic control over the landscapes? Priyanka is a former master's student from Dhaka and is currently pursuing her PhD research on carnival interactions in the trans Himalayan region. Over to you, Priyanka. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I would like to begin my presentation with a quote by American evolutionary ecologist who said, and I quote, what escapes the eye is a much more insidious kind of extinction, the extinction of ecological interactions. Now with laying emphasis on the importance of understanding these interactions, I would like to introduce you to my research titled, Interaction Patterns Among Predator Guild of trans Himalayas: What Structures a Carnivore Community in Dynamic Anthropogenic Landscapes. This research is a part of project Niche Selection and Mesopredator Release in High Altitude Ecosystems, supervised by Dr. Salvador. Starting with some background, carnivores are known to compete for limited resources and they form trophic hierarchies that structure an ecosystem. Niche partitioning along the axis of spatial, temporal and dietary niche axis allows these carnivores to avoid competition and reduce confrontation. Typically, body size determines the directionality of these uh, interactions with larger carnivore dominating the small, smaller carnivore. But this usual trend can be modified by humans as humans have different, um, humans have varying effects on different carnivores. So opportunist carnivores may take refuge in anthropogenic landscapes and they, they might exploit subsidies. So in a way, humans indirectly facilitate niche partitioning of some carnivores leading to lesser niche overlaps. This is commonly referred to as human shield hypothesis. Conversely, carnivore distribution might be impacted by their need to reduce encounters with humans, resulting in fewer opportunities of niche partitioning across uh, various niche axes. This is commonly referred to as humans as competitors hypothesis. Now, increasing evidence suggests that increasing anthropogenic pressures are known to affect and intensify carnivore competition, and these impacts have not even spared the most inaccessible and extreme environments like the trans Himalayas. This cold desert region of northern India has seen explosion in tourism and associated infrastructure, which has caused alteration to the natural environment of the landscape. While tourism uh, along with unmanaged garbage might facilitate red fox. It might also allow free ranging dogs to thrive possibly more than the native red fox. We studied the little known uh, competitive dynamics between these two mesopredators and their intra interactions with regions top carnivores, that is snow leopard and Himalayan wolf. For this research, we had two main objectives. First, to study intra interaction patterns across spatial, temporal, and dietary niche axis. Second is to determine the impact of anthropogenic pressures on carnivore interactions. For our first objective, we hypothesize that to minimize competition, predators are likely to partition their ecological niche across at least one niche axis, that is spatial, temporal, or dietary. Further, within spatial interactions, we hypothesized that Red foxes, given their opportunist behavior, will interact positively with regions top carnivores, which are known to provision mesopredators with carrion. Uh, with carrion, and next we hypothesize that red fox will also have positive, uh, will be positively associated with dogs, as both these mesopredators are known to exploit anthropogenic subsidies. Further, we hypothesize that dogs will have negative spatial interaction patterns with regions top predators. Given dogs are dog association with humans, and uh, as these top predators are known to avoid humans. Further, we also hypothesized negative interaction patterns between the top predators given their uh, higher dietary overlap. Uh, we further hypothesized that these spatial interaction patterns with vary, will vary with covariates. 
uh, with our second objective, we hypothesize that the areas which have greater human influence will have fewer opportunities for niche partitioning, resulting in higher niche overlaps in these areas. We test these hypotheses in cold desert landscape of Spiti Valley, uh, situated in Himachal Pradesh. The valley is characterized by extreme temperatures and unique biodiversity with alpine scrub vegetation. The community is majorly agro-pastoral, with tourism increasingly becoming a major revenue source. Within this site, we studied we selected five intensive study sites across a gradient of anthropogenic pressures, uh, considering tourism level, uh, number of households, livestock, and dog densities. These sites, arranged from the least disturbed to most disturbed, are Gyu, which is a border village in the valley, Chandratal, which has limited accessibility in summer months, Pin, a national park, Mane, a village and a base for treks, and Kibber, having maximum major settlements of the valley and large dog populations. So, to study, uh, moving to the methods, to study spatial temporal interactions, we utilized data from camera trapping. We uh, deployed a total of 113 cameras in year one, and 92 cameras were deployed in year two resulting in total effort of around 8,000 days. Uh, we examined spatial interactions using multi-species occupancy, where elevation, terrain ruggedness, and NDVI were taken as habitat covariates, and encounter rate of prey was associated as prey availability covariate, and human impacts were um, taken considering distance to road and distance to settlement covariates. Uh, we use multi-species occupancy because it takes into account uh, the imperfect detection while also accounting for covariates. Temporal interactions were studied using overlap coefficient using kernel density estimation. Further, we studied dietary habitat of habits of these uh, carnivores using scat samples. Uh, the number of scat samples collected are mentioned in the brackets. And we also complemented our study with previous research, uh, previous published research on dietary habits. Uh, for the collected samples, the undigested items were separated and identified. Within these items, the hairs were separated and identified using medullary patterns. Relative frequency of occurrence of each food item was measured and we calculated dietary overlaps using Pianka's index. Coming to the results, first, interaction patterns in space without considering covariates. We observed that log uh, red boxes log odds ratio were positive given dogs and scolepers. This is as hypothesized. Further, we did not find any significant association of red foxes with wolves, nor did we find any significant association with dogs given the presence of snow leopards. Um, however, contrary to our hypothesis, we found positive uh, interaction, spatial interaction patterns with dogs and wolves, which might be a concern given dogs pose a potential threat for disease transmission and competition to the native carnivores. And for wolves, they bring additional uh, uh, like challenge because they might lose the genetic integrity through hybridization. Further, as hypothesized, we see negative interaction patterns between snow leopards and wolves. Now, considering covariates, uh, like we hypothesized, uh, spatial interaction patterns did depend on various covariates. Considering the broad patterns, we see that the most of the predator pairs were positively associated with elevation, uh, which seems natural because these carnivores are adapted to high altitudes. And uh, notably, feral dogs, which is a recent addition to the predator guild, has also is also it seems that they have also adapted to to the across the elevation gradients. 
Further, we see that carnivores co-occur in areas farther away from human settlements as these are positively, predator pairs are positively associated given increasing distance to settlement. We found most pronounced positive spatial interactions between red foxes and snow leopards, which as I told you previously might be a result of carry-on conditioning by top predators to the meso predators. Uh, coming to the negative interactions, we see that carnivores it seems that they, they co-occur in less rugged terrains and near roads or dirt trails. So ruggedness and um, distance to road affect their spatial association negatively. We also find that prey covariates had negative uh, influence on their co-occurrence patterns, which might indicate competition for these resources. When considering only the top model covariates, we see that interaction patterns are mostly positive for all the predator pairs, which is a cause of concern, especially for those predator pairs where dog is present in the interaction. Coming to the result of temporal overlaps, uh, although we found positive spatial association between red fox and dogs, these, uh, these two predators show lower temporal overlaps. So dogs are known to restrict the resource use of red foxes, leading red foxes to avoid dogs, which might be the case in present study as well. Further, we observed moderate to high temporal overlaps between mesopredators and top predators. Uh, so substantial interspecific overlap between top predators and mesopredators might indicate facilitation of the latter by the former. Then, considering dogs overlap, dogs showed moderate to negative uh, temporal overlap with the top predators, and top predators were found to uh, have high temporal overlap. Uh, so, in this study, we found dogs to be mostly diurnal, and native carnivores showed nocturnal activity patterns. And it is uh, known that human activity and provisioning can influence dogs' behavior and thereby their temporal patterns, while they may constrain the temporal niche of native carnivores. Coming to the result of dietary habits, we see that uh, small mammals, rodents and locomotives formed an uh, important part of red fox diet along with insect, but we also see the presence of cattle and goat in red fox's diet, which might be explained by them scavenging on the carcasses left by top predators. Further, we see that cattle forms a significant part of dog's diet, followed by human-derived items. Uh, so it is known that red foxes and dogs both uh, depend on anthropogenic food subsidies, but anthropogenic food subsidies, they decline in diet of red fox in areas where dogs are present, which seems to, seems to be the case in present study as well. Further, we see that domestic animals and both domestic animals and wild prey formed a part of snow leopard's diet. And we see that wolves exhibit a higher proportion of domestic prey in their diet when compared to all the other predators. Continuing with the results of dietary analysis, we see moderate to high dietary overlap between all the predator pairs, ranging from uh, lowest between red fox and wolves, or uh, 0.65, to highest between wolves and dogs. So large uh, and small body domestic animals in the diet of all predators might have resulted in higher dietary overlap. Coming to the result of last hypothesis, which uh, predicted lesser niche partitioning and greater overlaps with uh, increasing anthropogenic influence, we did see that areas with high anthropogenic impacts showed higher dietary niche overlaps. Uh, Kipper and Mane, but and uh, we see low dietary overlap in pain, uh, area with low, disturbed, uh, low disturbance, but we also find high disturbance in Chandratal, which is an uh, area of high anthropogenic influence, which we consider to be an area of high anthropogenic influence. So, uh, the, any conclusion regarding um, the humans as competitors or field hypothesis needs further investigation. Summarizing, we found moderate to high dietary overlaps. Indicating competition for limited resources, carnivores coexist by niche segregation in space 
either in space, time, or diet in each axis. Occupancy patterns vary with various co-variates. And we see that increasing population of dogs may result in intensifying carnivore competition. Uh, we uh, know that certain ecological interaction can be complex. So radio telemetry uh, can provide, uh, can be beneficial to study the interactions. And in this regard, we've already called it three red boxes and we plan to move call them more individuals along with dogs to study the fine, their fine scale spatial interactions. And uh, as I started with the em emphasis on understanding carnivore interactions, understanding them in uh, today become even more important given the rise of anthropogenic pressures and climate change. And our study has contributed uh, significantly in this step. So, concluding our study, I will leave you with my recent radio collared boxes and. I would sincerely like to thank all those who have contributed to this study. Uh, thank you, Julie. Thank you, Dr. The next in line is uh, Shavana Goswami, who will be talking about demographic cheetah and most digital policy. Shavana is a senior research fellow in the long term monitoring of Ghana project. She finished her master's from Assam University and is currently doing a PhD from WI and Chiefel Demography. Over to you, Shavana. Good afternoon, everyone. I am working in this uh, long term collaborative project of WI, NTC, Madhya Pradesh Forest Department, and Kanha Tiger Reserve which have objective of monitoring tigers, co-predator, prey, and their habitat. In addition to this, this project also helps in developing and testing techniques and analy analytical tools for countrywide monitoring. Till now, we have, uh, 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 till now we have uh, demonstrated the uh, tiger demography and abundance and uh, prey uh, abundance and their uh, trend over the years and today I am presenting from the uh, second objective of the project that is prey monitoring and the uh, title of the talk is demography of cheetah in moist deciduous forest of Ch central India. But now among all the prey species why only cheetah? Because it is the principal prey of most of the large carnivore most of the large carnivore found in Indian subcontinent. Uh, from our previous study, we also found that in Kanha also, major proportion of tiger, leopard and whole diet consists of cheetah. And cheetah is also usually, uh, widely used for prey augmentation in different protected areas. But we still do have very little knowledge about demography of this species. So we decided to study six demographic parameters of cheetah. Those are density, growth rate, sex ratio, proportion of breeding female, proportion of fawn and age specific survival. For that, we laid habitat specific transit of 2 km land in Kana Tiger Reserve and each transit was worked thrice in a year. Then data was compiled for 10 years and analyzed using distance software. From our transit data, we created the spatial abundance map of cheetah and found that uh, higher cheetah density areas are same where tiger density is also very high. Then we did multiple surveys in these high cheetah density areas for demographic parameters like group size, age structure, lactating female. And in this map, these points are the cheetah observation point during our multiple surveys. We also did li life table analysis. Life table analysis is used to calculate the age specific mortality and survival probability of any organism. The cohort life table analysis requires uh, monitoring of marked individual for their whole life. But this is not always possible for wild mammals. Therefore, uh, in that case, vertical life table is used where vertical life table created by taking snapshot of population age structure or by analyzing the age of the individual at the time of death. And we took this approach. For death, we collected uh, observation of 153 male and 148 uh, female uh, skulls, uh, cheetah skulls from Kanha in, in one year. Then these were aged using two methods. One is eruption and wear method, another is cementum annuli method. 
for eruption and wear method uh, the uh, tooth eruption and uh, wear seen in the tooth was used to age the individual for example here uh, in this uh, first photograph you can see only two molars are present and the third molar and the premolars are still to come out but in second photograph all the molars are pro all three molars are present and third premolar is still coming out this means that the, both these individuals are of different age Similarly, in the case of tooth wear, uh, in the last three photographs, you can see that each tooth has different level of uh, tooth, wear, tooth wear. And this means that all these individuals are of different age. Second method was cementum annuli method, where the annuli present in the cementum layer of the tooth was uh, calculated to determine the age of the death, age at the time of death. And annuli are same as growth ring of trees where each ring represents a year. And in this photograph you can see there are five rings which means that uh, this individual is of five years age. For cementum annuli method we took, uh, we extract one tooth from the sample. Then we took longitudinal section of it. Then grind it to uh, get a very thin section of the tooth. Then we decalcify it and stain it and after that we can see the annuli present in the tooth under microscope. But cementum annuli method took longer time and effort. So uh, we did uh, both the methods in few samples and developed this regression equation to validate the easier eruption and wear method. And then uh, those uh, in individuals where only uh, eruption and wear method was used, those age were uh, corrected using this equation. We also face one more problem regarding fawn mortality. Uh, fawn skulls are very difficult to detect in natural habitat because predator used to consume them completely and their decomposition rate is also very high. So uh, to avoid under representation of young age class, we took uh, lactation female data and age class data to calculate the fawn mortality. And in field, when we observe any group or uh, group of cheetah, uh, if any fawn was seen suckle, uh, suckling on the female, then it was considered as lactating. And while foraging and walking, if this female, uh, their order is visible, then also it was considered as lactating. And how this fawn mortality is calculated from lactating female data, I will show it in a while. Uh, for, uh, Coming to the result, uh, the density of cheetah in Kanha was found to be stable for last 10 years and this allows us to do the vertical light table analysis uh, for cheetah in Kanha. From multiple survey data, we found the percentage of lactating female in the population and uh, all, we found that although lactation occurs throughout the year, it has a peak during the month of April. But from literature, we know that uh, lactation period of cheetah lasts up to five months. And uh, we, did, uh, so we visited each area for survey uh, in weekly basis, which means there is a possibility that many females got resampled multiple times. So to avoid this, we took 100 random samples of lactation period, that is 20 weeks from our observed data, and then took uh, average of each of this sample. Then we took uh, mean of all of these samples to get the number of lactating female in any lactation period time. Uh, then uh, for fawn mortality, since we know that uh, from literature also we found that uh, twinning is almost negligible for cheetah, so number of lactating female in a year can serve as a proxy for the fawn born in the year. Uh, so to get uh, the fawn born in a year, we multiplied the uh, average lactating female in any lactation period time to the possible lactation window in a year, which gave us the fawn born in that year. Then from our transit and multiple survey data, we found out the number of yearlings seen in the population. And by subtracting the number of yearlings seen in the population from the fawn born in a year, we got the mortality of first year in the population. And by compiling this first year mortality and the uh, other age class mortality from our skull data, we found that mortality is highest uh, in first year of birth, then it stabilizes and after six years it increases again.
From uh, our data, we also uh, found the survivorship curve of Cheetal. And we found that both genders of Cheetal uh, shows uh, type three, typical type 3 survivorship curve. And type 3 survivorship curve means that uh, mortality is highest in the early stage of life. And in middle and older age, it, uh, it, is, it has lower mortality. In summary, uh, from our study, we found that mortality among fawn is maximum. Subadults and adults have higher survival, but survival declines after six years. Although it is believed that uh, males have higher prediction rate that, than female, but we did not uh, we did not find any gender specific difference in survivorship of cheetal. From our previous study, we found that. Uh, number of uh, tiger cub wind is maximum in the month of April and this is the same time when uh, fawn, fawning is at also peak uh, in Kanha. That means uh, this uh, cheetal fawn serves as an easy prey for the growing tiger cubs. Our data suggests that the cheetal population in Kanha is at stationary with current mortality rate. So removal of uh, Cheetal for supplementation elsewhere outside Kanha should be done with precaution because excessive removal can push the population into declining phase which, which would be detrimental to the ecosystem and may lead to the conflict. This study fills the void of demographic information on ungulates in tropical forests. This information can be used to devise uh, conservation strategies for prey and eventually tigers and other carnivores. I would like to acknowledge these people. Thank you. We would definitely like to thank you for finishing the remote giving us time. So, so maybe uh, people can pass on the question. And uh, now uh, next comes the Gali boy of Munda, Janna, right? So uh, Kumar and you will be talking about uh, the kick of the record in the United Ankit completed his PhD from Allahabad University and Masters from WR. He previously worked on Blackbirds and Kimmers and is currently on
it has very limited forest cover 9% forest cover only and that too in patches junnar landscape is mostly dominated by sugarcane as the sugarcane as the sugarcane crop and if you talk about the human leopard negative interaction its use you can see an abrupt surge after the year 2014 the attacks on humans are also very frequent and you can see as uh, there is a cyclic trend in the attacks on humans in the last year only in 2022 and 23 we witnessed six human deaths which is very troublesome for the management of the managers of the forest department so we we by using uh, 20 years of secondary data we use we analyzed the data and given different categories of hotspot of junnar forest division in which we predicted some of the new hotspot in the area which is otu range mancha range and suru range we submitted a report in 2020 and subsequently here in the 2020 and 2021 you can see the cases were more in the mancha otu and suru range so this is helping the forest department to uh, prioritize their awareness prioritize their management strategies such as patrolling awareness activities and regular monitoring so you might be wondering there is conflict so what is the number of leopard in this forest division so we are doing camera trapping exercise in different blocks in 2 square kilometer grids and we're trying to replicate all these uh, camera trap camera trap blocks each year so i will be focusing on the study which was conducted in the year 2020 we deployed 44 camera traps and in 183 trap nights uh we uh, did in the shiru range and uh, and uh, we we faced a lot of challenges in deploying camera trap i i i won't say that it is easy to deploy camera trap in protected area but yeah in this in my area it is very difficult to convince people to deploy camera trap because these all are private lands apart from human and lively livestock so these are the captures of wildlife captures of carnivore you can see a leopard in the behind the leopard there is palm granite grape yard sugarcane and others so our scci result shows that the density of leopard is 6.75 which is almost high from many of the protected areas of our country the activity overlap of human and uh, human and leopard is 13% uh, this the right image shows uh, leopard is crossing the trail and after a minute a vehicle is crossing a place where children are playing in a great yard and a leopard is visiting the same area in the night time if we talk about the tenure shape of the leopard from 2020 to 2022 we found unique 18 unique individual in 2020 uh, with 13 old individual and 25 individual in 2021 and 11 individual from 2022 and 3 individual from 2021 so you might be wondering how the leopards moving in this landscape and where are there are settling so we radio collared leopards and we radio collared five males and six females with iridium vectronic satellite collar gps schedules was every, in every hour in the night time and every in every two hours in the day time so these are the details of the collared leopard as you can see the in the uh, the highlighted portion so most of the leopard returned to the area from where it was captured but only two leopard went outside from the area from where it was captured so this is the movement track of the collared leopard in the junnar forest division sorry yeah so leopards uh, were released in different area and it went to one leopard went to up to thane forest division and one leopard went to nasik uh, division which is 180 km away from junnar and and settled there so this is the synthesis of previously shown uh, animation and you can see uh, a leopard went from junnar it went to the thane forest division and returned back to junnar junnar forest division so we estimated the core of uh, the leopards in the junnar forest di division using bronian bridge movement and home range using bronian bridge movement and the average core was 5.8 km which is very small and the home range is around 40 km square so you can see the core area of the collared leopard is are, are mostly in the agricultural landscape of junnar forest division and if you talk about the core area utilization so it's mostly the crop lands 
which the leopards were using. So daily movement, the average daily movement is around 3.99 uh, km per day, which is very less compared to other studies. And the speed of the leopard were highest in the daytime, in the sorry, in the night time as compared to the daytime. With average speed in the daytime is 0.05 uh, km per hour and 0.25 km per hour. So this two graph might might look similar to you, but uh, the movement of the leopard, the leopard are generally moving in the patches of the sugarcane which is available there. But in the night, leopards venturing outside the outside the sugarcane patches for hunting and all that. So we also recovered some of the drop, uh, we, uh, we recovered up, drop, we dropped off some collars and this video I have just kept for the reference as how dense the sugar cane in our study area. We are also experimenting with audiovisual deterrents and some of the personal gears for the farmers who are venturing or going in the agriculture landscape, keeping in mind that there are some species which mimic like eyes, so we are uh, still in that developing phase. We are also doing some uh, other activities in Junnar Forest Department. So we suggested Junnar Forest Department to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to collaborate with the police force and it is happening that police force during any conflict scenario, you can see there is a na highway going from Nasik from Nasik to Pune. So in any conflict scenario, the police escorts the ambulance and help the uh, uh, ambulance to reach uh, the hospital as much as possible. So summarizing all, so we are very high leopard density in human dominated landscape of Jundar Forest Division. The leopards are persisting in the landscape of Jundar Forest Division. And most of the leopards uh, are returning to the place where it was captured whether it was released in 60 kilometer or maybe 45 kilometers. And through our space use studies, we can say that leopards are mostly using the agriculture landscape of Jundar Forest Division and mostly the movement in the night with high speed compared to day night and daily movement of the species is less compared to other species, other studies. I want to acknowledge following people. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. The next speaker, Mr. Gaurav, who will be talking about mystery talking, uh, insect of fire and least form of mold from the first edition. Gaurav completed his master's from Guwahati University, Karnataka, and joined WI in 2019 as part of the Tiger project. He is currently doing his PhD research with Dr. Gopi on ecology of mystery talking. Hi. Good, af good, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, myself, uh, Gaurav, working as a junior research fellow in the project, uh, Mishmitakin project, uh, funded by MOEFCC and uh, with the collaboration of uh, Arunachal Forest, Forest Department, which has been working since, uh, we have been working since three years so far. Uh, Mishmitakin, uh, today on this talk, I would like to take you all to the uh, unknown or uh, least known information about Mishmitakin from Eastern Himalayan part of India. Uh, since uh, since 180 years have been passed since the species got described uh, in India, very few literature available so far to count the number. It's it's very less less than 10 actually. So to give you a glimpse of uh, how a Mishmitakin adult bull looks like, uh, it's a Mishmitakin which belongs to the family Bovidae, uh, which has got its scientific name called Bidocus taxicolor taxicolor, which habituates in the forest of uh, subtropical and alpine forest of eastern Himalayan part and uh, with an elevation uh, which habituates in an elevation called uh, elevation ranges from 1000 meter to 4500 meter in the forest. <coughs> so uh, to understand these Mishmi Thakin globally Thakin has uh, got four of species uh, out of which Golden Thakin and Sichuan Thakin is distributed in uh, China. While on the other hand, Bhutan Thakin is uh, distributed only to only in uh, Bhutan. 
but uh, coming to the uh, mishmi takin mishmi takin has got distribution throughout the eastern himalayan part uh, from uh, northern parts of arunachal pradesh northern parts of myanmar and uh, north, uh, southern parts of china actually with this background uh, we selected our study area in arunachal pradesh in arunachal pradesh uh, uh, in 1850s species was firstly described from mishmi hills mishmi hills uh, which runs uh, from upper dibang valley till anjao district so it also traverses through lower dibang valley and uh, lowith district uh, parts of lowith lower dibang and lowith districts uh, in in mishmi hills major uh, major community residing is idu mishmi digaru and miju mishmis and also there is a one more community which lies in the eastern most of part of the country which is an uh, mayors to undergo or uh, uh, for this talk i would be like i'd like to talk about uh, assessment of distribution patterns of mishmi takin in arunachal pradesh and also understanding and integrating the traditional ecological knowledge uh, with the scientific ecological knowledge so with this background uh, we did a detailed review of literature on mishmi takin all around the world uh, this review of literature helped us to identify study area and in study area we conducted key informative surveys and also uh, camera trapping surveys as well so locations obtained presence locations obtained from secondary data which is review of literature and also the presence locations obtained from camera trapping and opportunity sign surveys which led us to obtain a species distribution modeling through maxent uh result, coming to the results why we choose to opportunistic samplings uh to talk about this uh, it's very elusive species to understand this species uh, we 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 did a, a block survey of uh, 100 square kilometer of low, four blocks uh, in which you know all the grids we deployed 15 around 15 camera traps which each camera trap ran around 90 days but uh, we ended up capturing only seven captures of meshmi takin which we are not able to uh, understand why wh how we choose to have a sampling design so later uh, while doing this as well we from our key informative surveys we got to know uh, several 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 uh, locations of mishmi takin presence in uh, dibang valley districts so or uh, from this we choose opportunity surveys we deployed camera traps uh, we also got 92 camera trap captures from mishmi takin through opportunity samplings and so we ended up uh, having liter uh, location from a literature and opportunity science surveys which is other half which is 92 total we got 184 presence locations from arunachal pradesh with all these presence locations from arunachal pradesh we we tried to uh, make suitable uh, habitat modeling for mishmi takin a suitable habitat modeling ended us uh, giving us a uh, around 26000 square kilometers of area of potential habitat which comprising high and moderate with also uh, out of 80000 square kilometers of uh, arunachal pradesh we used environment variables like distance road distance snow and elevations and other layers out of which uh, first three layers formed a major contributions to the uh, suitable habitats uh, coming to the second objectives we we also we also doc tried to document uh, traditional ecological knowledge and also traditional knowledge of the uh, community residing in the study area to for this talk i would be i i would be restricting my uh, uh, our sampling things to dibang valley only so uh, we we did our key informative surveys for 186 respondents uh, 34 from dibang valley covering 80 respondents and 106 respondents from uh, 40 villages from anjao districts but uh, to take you to give you an insight to the traditional ecological knowledge and uh, for these things i i would be restricting my things to dibang valley only so coming to uh, coming to the traditional knowledge in the people idu uh, in dibang valley majorly residing communities are idu mishmis idu mishmis call takin as akru and takang in digaru and kem in uh, miju mishmis and mayors uh, idu mishmis have got uh, uh, several types of rituals which locally call them as igus and they also have uh, shamans in their culture so shamans are nothing uh, locally called as bhamani they are priests and they are also led, uh, responsible for uh, and reasons to transfer uh, rituals and or through their oral narratives to the coming generations they also uh, believe themselves as uh, children of nani intaya and they, as they are enemies and also they believe uh, showing gratitude towards mogalo 
and they also have several types of taboos in their culture which uh, to give in uh, some kind of taboos are anna and afun this this is an uh, video capture from a funeral a funeral function a funeral ritual called the uh, funeral ligu so there is a one uh, interesting interesting uh, things we have observed in our key informative surveys that they they use they use synonyms to every in, animal names to every element when uh, they are inside the forest so this is to give you an example how how uh, how animal name changes inside the forest throughout uh, documenting traditional ecological surveys we 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 also we also came across uh, uh, species ecological knowledge in the people so to understand these things while doing our key informative surveys i would like to share a story on this stage at uh, i i went to key informative surveys with the uh, with the shaman so shaman introduced me a word called aheko then uh, i questioned him that what is aheko uh, and uh, how can we find takins in aheko so he described me that uh, aheko into sub divided into two words uh, which is ahi is honey and heko is site drinking site nothing but drinking site so he so narrative he just explained me that mineral lakes as a takins honey drinking site so we decided further we decided to trace these aikos in the uh, in dibang valley districts so while tracing all these uh, aikos inside the dibang valley we came across uh, uh, six aikos inside uh, inside in every other valleys so what are the aikos then we went to ca deploy camera traps and we walked along for 80 to 100 kilometers to reach 10 to 12 days it took us to 10 to 12 days to reach there to each site and after reaching there we came across that uh, aikos are uh, nothing but a mineral lick sites but uh, compiling of uh, several mineral lick sites which is a congregation site for takings so this uh, this information we got through from uh, local traditional ecological knowledge this shows uh, uh, how important traditional ecological knowledge to uh, integrate it with the scientific uh, methods which we follow for a better conservation of elusive species such as mishmitakins in the landscapes so uh, we we for this uh, uh, to understand how a congregation site works or how a aheko is plays a major important role in the takins ecology so we we did a we did we we did our uh, uh, rigorous surveys in a aheko called zambra which you can find in uh, dri valley uh, the topmost one so in zambra aheko we deployed uh, uh, zambra aheko is consisting of uh, seven mineral lake sites we, we deployed seven camera trap locations in uh, each aheko which is mineral lakes so it led us to capture around 17300 captures of mishmitakin we also uh, we also we also observed behavior such as uh, through our direct observations uh, such as mating and uh, we also observed that mishmitakins grazes on uh, sedge meadow grasses and uh, browses on a uh, bamboo leaf flushes and uh, congregation duration was around uh, june to august which is around uh, uh, around 3 months the maximum number of individuals of uh, at the congregation site we have observed for a day was more than 200 actually uh, it's in the evening times so group size observed was minimum was 18 and maximum was 40 in a single herd so and also we observed our through our direct observations and camera trap uh, uh, data we uh, we understand their activity pattern activity pattern uh, through our direct observations led us to understand that uh, activity remained active throughout the day but uh, very active during the uh, dusk dawn and nocturnal but uh, looking at the, the camera traps locations we uh, captures we have got these are all active throughout the day but uh, it has got peak of activity during the day we also we also with the help of uh, with the help of local uh, uh, local community and uh, using their traditional ecological knowledge we also uh, try to understand age and sex in mishmitakins so and also we 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 gone through some studies on bovids so with this with this background we able to understand how adult bull looks like or uh, adult male sub adult male uh, female adult female sub adult female juvenile and calf we also looked into uh, female with calf height ratio as well uh, with the help of local communities and uh, include in integrating their traditional ecological knowledge to our uh, 
scientific observation methods we got to know that uh, calf reaching the height of uh, females pelvic girdle which uh, they also tell told me that it, it might be of uh, around uh, 0 to 3 months of age so this we need to uh, further analyze things and uh, this video depicts how how a thakin enters to mineral lick sites there is an interesting story what we have when when i got into the zambra echo uh, we, we have observed that uh, usually sub, two subadult males or two, two subadults, it's very hard to describe um, sex in uh, subadults, but two subadults, usually sub, two subadults came early, uh, which is surveying all the congregation site uh, from their alpine ridges or something else. So then, then they get, get into the mineral lake sites. Once they get habituated to the mineral lake sites, uh, it, it might take around 30 to 40 minutes to them to habituate in the mineral lake sites, then, then other, uh, other uh, members like uh, sub females, subadult, subadults or yearlings or calf and uh, lastly uh, four, two to three adult males will enter and lately then uh, following them a dominant male enters the mineral lake sites. Once the dominant male enters all the herds move away and uh, make space for the dominant males. That's, that was uh, that, that you can see this is the one uh, adult bull is the dominant male and it's it's, it's very it's uh, we we need to we need to look that we need to look further into our videographic data and other things to uh, how how our social behavior works how uh, who follows the lead and those things so this is to give you a, a examples of the congregation how a congregation site looks like uh, congregation site is a compilation of uh, mineral licks uh, in congregation sites, they, they congregate in huge numbers and uh, different groups will come together after their uh, long vertical uh, migrations from lower elevations to the higher elevation uh, sites. And during the month of February to March, they give birth to the calves. But uh, af after reaching here, after reaching to the congregation site, they uh, do behaviors such as matings, ruttings happens and some some came along with their yearlings come some came along as a pregnant females and all so these congregation sites uh, as as we look into the uh, mishmitakins distribution in arunachal pradesh it's mostly restricted to the northern parts of arunachal pradesh uh, in northern parts of arunachal pradesh all the districts are much prone to um, much much prone to developmental activities such as uh, uh, development of strategic roads development of uh, movements of larger troops of army and uh, these things so these things these things are uh, throwing uh, more uh, pressure on these sites at least we can we can make it we can make uh, the three months of congregation sites for around uh, no disturbance zones for mishmitakins it's also it's also one thing i have noticed that we have noticed in our study that uh, all the congregation sites in dibang valley which are mostly around in stays in uh, alpine habitats which are on 3000 to 4500 meter elevations while on the other hand in if you look into the anjao anjao district same congregation lies in subtropical habitats which is which lies in 1000 to 2500 meters of elevations so while doing all these things we came across many challenges and limitations as well uh, one thing is sure that which very limited uh, available data and poor accessibility to reach larger part of the habitats. Uh, the remoteness of the landscapes gives us logical constraint as well and limited resources as well. Uh, to conclude all this, uh, uh, what we have done, uh, little we have done so far. Uh, one thing we have identified, uh, uh, identifying suitable habitats for conducting further research on Mishmitakins such as camera traps, food surveys, behavior and coloring exercise for Mishmitakins. We also look for, uh, this study says understanding the ecological knowledge from local communities about the species and habitats. Its habitats plays a major important role to understand these uh, elusive species such as Mishmitakins in the landscapes. And this study is also an attempt to understand how, uh, how to integrate traditional ecological knowledge to our scientific methods which we follow for a better conservation of uh, a better conservation and understanding of ecological aspects of the mishmitakin we also look forward to uh, survey major major parts of suitable habitats in arunachal pradesh which is uh, we want to cover all the other parts of northern parts of districts which plays a major important role for Mish uh, habitat for mishmitakins uh, we also want to expand our understanding on the species uh, based on various aspects of natural history observations 
and distribution patterns and movement patterns as well. We also want to identify uh, many maximum congregation sites in Arunachal Pradesh in several parts of uh, other parts of districts, uh, which is which might which can uh, further plan and management strategies for a conservation of Mishmitakin. We also want to look forward to habitat suitability and also uh, climate change plays an uh, important role for Mishmitakin. As you can see, our suitable habitat modeling. Uh, for a distribution of Mishmitakin, uh, distance to snow matters very much. So climate change, uh, through either with our conversation with local people, we came across that uh, climate change having a much impact to the Takin distribution in the landscapes. So we want to look uh, impacts of climate change on the species it's strength. We did uh, uh, we journey continues. We did our. Uh, we did our coloring exercises in three times so far, uh, July 22 and 23 and August 23. We we are not able to, uh, we failed but learned a lot of lessons to how to color these things, how to integrate traditional ecological knowledge for the coloring exercises and all this. We would like to acknowledge all these thing, all these people. Without them, uh, the study would not have been possible so far. I'd like to thank you all. Thank you, Gaurav, for the Thank you to the guys for talking. The last presentation of the session will be by Ritesh Chitrakama, who will be talking about uh, the reintroduction of car and uh, part of the Thank you, Ritesh joined WIA in 2017 as a senior research fellow. Currently, he is working with Dr. Nikam and Dr. Bilal on the CORD project. His interests lie in studying social complexity in mega Habibos. First and the foremost, uh, we have the honor of having Dr. H.S. Negi Saab as the chair of the session, who was closely involved in the uh, in the entire uh, God reintroduction program in Park Tiger Reserve. Also, we have Sri S.K. Singh Saab as a co-chair, uh, who monitored and guided the recent God uh, uh, reintroduction operation from Kana to Sanjay Tiger Reserve. Respected faculties, guests, and the fellow researchers. In this presentation, I will be talking about the results and the finding of a long-term monitoring program following the uh, reintroduction of God in Pandavar Tiger Reserve. The uh, God is the largest provide of the Oriental uh, Biogeographic region, distributed throughout the South and the Southeast Asia and Sri Lanka in scattered pockets. Historically, the mega, this mega herbivore species has been uh, rapid decline has, has seen a rapid decline in its uh, population, which is making it more vulnerable to local extinction in many protected areas. One such extinction occurred in Bandhuga Tiger Reserve in 19, 1998, and to overcome this local extinction, uh, Madhya Pradesh Forest Department and Wildlife Institute of India has jointly uh, conducted a reintroduction, a reintroduction program in Bandhuga Tiger Reserve based on the IUCN guideline and the reintroduction uh, uh, based on the IUCN guideline and the PVA and the food and habitat availability, uh, availability analysis based uh, uh, an assessment in the Bandhava type reserve. The post phase monitoring uh, um, has been done in three phases from 2011 to 2022. Uh, the major objective of the uh, all these phases were studying the health status of uh, reintroduced god, habitat use pattern, ranging and movement pattern, and other important ecological uh, aspects. I will be touching the major objective uh, of the project, uh, highlighting the successful reintroduction of the god in Pandava Tiger Reserve. Before starting, I will briefly discuss the suitable habitat available in the Madhya Pradesh for god. A uh, distribution modeling was performed to predict the habitat suitability of God for the entire Madhya Pradesh state. About 31% of the uh, total geographical geographical area of Bandhagar uh, Tiger Reserve was found suitable for God. Following, following to this, about 22% of the total geographical area of Sanjay Tiger Reserve was found suitable for the God. That also formed the basis of recent uh, recent reintroduction plan in Sanjay Tiger Reserve. 
the entire state about uh, the entire in the entire state about 1.8 percent uh, uh, of the uh, entire uh, geographical area was found suitable for gore outside the protected area which is uh, highlighted as the potential gore conservation hotspot in in the corridors which connects the these forest complexes or tiger reserves in the first phase of the uh, project in 2011 the field operation was initiated going to the uh, going to the pva assessment and habitat availability assessment in bandoka tiger reserve a management based reintroduction program was planned the first stock of 19 animals was reintroduced in 2011 and the second stock was reintroduced in 2012 the field operation include uh, the population assessment in source location habitat assessment and recipient location designing of vehicle stretcher holding boma loading offloading ramp procurement of radio collars immobilization drugs and the medicaments and the uh, mock drills was conducted for uh, look for a stars the uh, the capture uh, operation was conducted in presence of uh, uh, presence and guidance of many peers from madhya pradesh forest department experts from africa and scientists from uh, wildlife institute of india the objective of this talk is to uh, the uh, to assess the current status of uh, reintroduced gaur population in bandagor tiger reserve studying the range extension of reintroduced gaur in bandagor tiger reserve identifying the future uh, challenges to conservation of this species uh, i'll start with the uh, uh, brief introduction of uh, study area the bandagor tiger reserve is a mosaic of uh, uh, northern dry mixed deciduous forest and moist peninsular uh, low level sal forest which classified in in sal sal forest mixed forest and uh, and grasslands the park consists of three distinct areas uh, uh, areas in uh, entire bandagor national park which is uh, panpata wildlife sanctuary which makes uh, up the core area and the adjoining notified area buffer buffer areas spread across the uh, uh, in three district uh, uh, umaria sadol and katni uh, we conducted a post release monitoring survey uh, following the re release of the reintroduced animal in bandogar uh, wildlife institute of india has intensively monitored the animal from 2011 to 22 using various uh, field methods such as direct scientific methods telemetry using uh, using vhf and gps collars camera tapping records were also used behavioral observations herd profiling and individual dossier uh, uh, for social networking and behavioral analysis uh, using these uh, herd profiling were also used for the entire period now coming to the results the gaur population in badagar has steadily increased from from 50 individuals in 2012 to 168 individuals in 2022 occupying about 466.9 square kilometer area mainly spread uh, across the kalwa tala and magdi ranges which is the most uh, important and having the high density of grassland uh, ranges in the core of the bandagor tiger reserve the estimated overall sex ratio of adult female is to uh, adult male was 1 is 2.6 whereas adult female uh, is to case uh, calf uh, ratio was 1 uh, 1 is to uh, 0.8 that shows the population has achieved the natural population ratio the population pyramid curve suggests that the reintroduced population showed uh, showing the uh, rapid growth the population reached 168 individuals in two, uh, uh, 2022 from the founder population of 50 individuals in uh, 2011 coming to the birth and the mortality 184 calves have been born during this uh, entire study phase and 66 animals have been died due to various re reasons uh, majorly due to tiger predation and disease like tuberculosis mean group size uh, mean group size and the size composition in different season were also estimated uh, the population showed a high congregation of uh, 
17.09 bean uh, congregation of 17.09 animals following uh, in winters following 14.7 animals in monsoon and 11.05 uh, animals in summer season this study is a part of a recent uh, recent uh, uh, space which is which was conducted in 2018 to 2022 Uh, we also uh, we conducted we tried to highlight a social network uh, in uh, entire population of uh, god this this particular map is showing a single herd to understand the disease spread dynamics within the herds the social network uh, formed uh, formed by individuals in population was extensive and well connected all individuals were centered and clustered within the herd uh, except for the subadults that stood out from the group the calculated degree distribution uh, result showed that the matriarch and the subadult uh, both male and the female had higher uh, out degree and were vulnerable to transmission of information or diseases within the herd the calves and higher the calves had the higher in degree Uh, then other individual except with that the uh, matriarch uh, as you all can see the matriarch choti is the most central individual in the group attributed to the having high herd centrality and the maximum number of the interaction uh, within the herd the animal which have a lower centrality or information transmission or contributed less or fluid in nature has no or very uh, little effect uh, on the entire herd the information can be attributed as disease transmission rate within and between herds by by the uh, in degree and out degree out degree matrices of the individuals the higher the uh, out degree the higher the uh, chances of spread the disease within the herd now coming to the home range studies the average home range of uh, reintroduced cow reach a symptom after initial, uh, initial exploration by 143 days and covering an area of uh, 154 square kilometer in 2011 now they are covering a 455 square kilometer area uh, uh, over uh, over uh, covering the tala kalwa and magdi ranges of uh, core of the bandava tiger is now the population is confined to tala uh, kalwa and magdi ranges though there are uh, new area in reserves like panpata and pator is available with a suitable habitat of core uh, these area are yet to explored and utilized coming to the habitat use uh, part the population is confined uh, as i already said the population is confined to the uh, core uh, ranges of the park and uh, covering initially the population is covering the uh, highly using highly utilizing the bamboo, bamboo forest following the grassland and in uh, recent years the population is covering the uh, uh, sal forest following the uh, open mix forest grassland and uh, the habitations the genetic structure showed the population is um, uh, uh, the population heterozygoty the heterozygosity is reduced and high genetics uh, relatedness which is um, 0.71 uh, Uh, reveal the sign of inbreeding however it requires a detailed study of the uh, at the population level we have sampled only the uh, 40% of the population which shows a inbreeding within the population the core uh, coming to the conclusion uh, the god population has uh, steadily increased and using an entire area of 470 uh, square kilometer of the reserve and exploring new areas around the park except using the panpata and the patar area which is also suitable uh, this is because the uh, uh, the entire southern area is uh, uh, confined with the fencing and uh, uh, not uh, uh, promising god to uh, allow, uh, 
explore the uh, areas outside the protected uh, outside the bandago tiger reserve the study also highlight the sociality of gore concerning the disease spread in the gore community like bovine tuberculosis is one of the emerging threat to the gore population with the mortality reported during the study period the genetic study of the gore population suggested that uh, it would be ideal to bring some new individuals from the fresh genetic pool Uh, like sarpura or peach uh, additionally uh, additional effort uh, to improve the uh, improve the restore the functionality of corridor is also required as the bandagore bandagore tiger reserve is share the uh, corridor uh, with uh, achanak mark and uh, uh, sanjay and guru kasidas in chatisgarh uh, in the last i would like to uh, uh, take a moment to acknowledge the acknowledge the key individuals who played a crucial role in bringing the and bringing the whole program to uh, fruition thank you thank you so with the permission of the chair now we take the question so i ask the speakers to come on the stage please So, so someone, you have two questions uh, from Nirmal Jain and uh, I am both as possible a question. Yes. So, I compliment the presentation, saying it's very nice presentation. So, brain density of bird was much lower than finch. However, tiger density of bird was higher. So, any possible explanation? Yeah, uh, actually, we not uh, comment about the densities, why the densities are higher, but we can comment about uh, the buffer regions of uh, Tadwa. Uh, there are uh, tigers who are using the outside protected area landscape, using the livestock. If you see the livestock depletion cases of outer. region of tadwa greater tadwa land still that mostly and non protected area there are many cattle kills reported every year compared to the pinch and a large proportion of uh, tiger population in tadwa that are using mostly the uh, eater prey than natural prey species but this could be a reason and we also like to estimate the prey population with uh, different techniques uh, to see if uh, because we uh, could not get uh, a good amount of detection in for many species yeah that's it for you now uh, question for sapritu uh, thank you so much question one from sailu uh, he wants to do anything uh, discussing tiger behavior only depends on the variable as a system to relate in way or there are more specific conservation variables that may affect tiger behavior uh apart from this anthropogenic uh, other anthropogenic factors maybe water is one of the limiting factor while they are you know traveling through our corridor or something also i would say ability of prey because in many of the african study it has already proved that when lion are actually dispersing from one place to another they are you know near by the village directly to for the cattle depletion so maybe the how the water is available in this area how the spray is available in this area those are the other factor other than this distance i would say initially so the next one is from ayan and he has a i mean he says it's an insight study so what is the cub survival rate how common in front is it is what is the general rate three percent so we can pick one so obviously cub survival rate is high also you know we have experienced some of the entire abandon of the cub or maybe you know few of the cases that other male actually attacked and you know wiped out the entire population entire litter so overall the survival rate of cub uh, is around uh, 70% <laughs> and once they, as i mentioned earlier once they entered the survival stage things the my interval interval is longer so the young adults are actually you know come to a play that when they are you know uh, independent from the mother they are more prone in the they are actually creating the problem with this other established tigers so this conflict is quite high therefore mortality at the age of 
you know, one and a half year and two years, that's the high moderate we have observed. That's it. So next question for Tinder. So Bilal, you want to ask directly? Sorry. You don't okay, you okay. So, great presentation. So, do you think uh, other ecological aspects need to be considered while deciding with uh, interactions, cargo interactions? Like fox, uh, then provide the refuge for other animals in the landscape. Do you understand the question? No. Not the second. He, want, he wants to know that uh, do you think other ecological aspects should be considered no, while looking at uh, interactions? Uh, Priyanka, very nice, good presentation. I was just trying to say that since Red Fox, their main behavior, their main ecology is they live in gels, which is throughout the year. Okay, so that provides far better refuge in the landscape uh, than the other carnivores. So it's not only the space in the available space, it's other ecological interactions, which also plays role in coexistence. Like uh, red foxes just offer at a few kilometers, they can only offer from a village because of the presence of the dens. Whereas other predators who don't have a denning behavior, they don't have such a refuge available. So I was I was just telling you, so if you include those aspects of the ecology, then the interactions can be much better. Uh, thank you for the suggestion, uh -huh. sir. Uh, I think we'll be better able to look into this aspects uh, now since we have uh, radio collared some individuals and we'll collar some more and then maybe. Oh, from Tom, to see this good presentation. Have you conducted DNA analysis of scans since dog rule? You no, know, they look similar before considering analysis. Uh, so till now, the samples that we have collected, we have not done the analysis, but we ha we uh, have kept this in mind that uh, genetic analysis is important. So we have kept kept the samples uh, for analysis later. And in this study, we have like for wolves, maximum uh, samples come from previous studies. And uh, for the dog samples, we made sure that we collect those samples only from the uh, habit habitations, like in the areas. Uh, having human habitation. So chances of uh, getting con the confusion is less, uh, but we will uh, definitely do uh, den uh, DNA analysis later. Thank you. Show me the way you like to ask the question directly. So how, how different is your study from uh, what Vidya Atreya has done in Junnar? And you never even mentioned it. Okay, ma'am. So, uh, yes, it's true that uh, the study happened in Junior Forest Division by Vidya, ma'am. So, I think uh, the population estimation thing was not mentioned in that particular study. And, uh, uh, yeah, there was coloring thing. Uh, we are getting a similar pattern that, that is published in JBNHS and uh, uh, one more telemetry study of Vidya ma'am, but uh, the space use movement pattern and all these were not present in that study, so I will say that, so, so maybe we are going one step ahead from that. Yeah, well, very, very similar to yeah, yes. So we can discuss, yeah. So the next question from Abhishek Kumar. What is the major dietary composition like for in Jinnah? So we are yet to analyze the uh, scat that we are collecting. Trust me, it's very difficult to uh, collect scat uh, because I referred a video in which it, it showed that it's a like very high, the sugarcane crop is very high density crop and it is very difficult to collect the scats. I, I went many times in the search of scat, but unfortunately we are not getting scat. But we have some, we have got some uh, decent amount of scat, so we will be analyzing and maybe after that. And in addition to that, so our photograph, uh, so there is a lot of conflict happening, and our while our camera trapping exercise revealed that there are small mammals like Indian hare, and in our camera trap we have recorded that these were utilized by the leopards. Let's um, next to Aurora. We have a few questions. Uh, so I'm from Dr. Lalit. 
So this is why Maxon was used when better models such as um, and the forest and then some no information is available how the model was quantified. Basically, um, he wants to know that uh, why Maxon was preferred over other models when others are better for one thing, and also you have not quantified it. Uh, yeah, we have better models as well, but uh, we need to uh, have more uh, data on the regarding the species as well. But to understand the basic, very very basic level, under, to get an understanding of very basic ecology or distributions of Mishmi that we choose to do, uh, go for Maxine modeling. Okay, maybe you want to ask another question? Yeah. So my question was not like, but you are saying that, you know, that you are in a very happy state of it. But you know, the science has progressed too much, you know, but you have quite a good number of patients for adopting this model. And second thing was, I wanted to know that you have classified the probability into medium and high. And I saw the same in the next presentation also. But I just wanted to know, you know what is the basis of you know, deciding that this is low and high? So that was another question. And third one is to know that how do you you know decide that this is the person you, know, you have to interview for getting a few information, key information for the person. Sorry, sir, I'm not able to understand very long. So maybe I think it's a great already have a short time. So the more questions for you. I think these are important people you can't avoid. So, Rizal is such a discussion. Is there a possibility of uh, ICO being used for coaching? I think. The, the congregation ID is being used as a coaching site. Yeah, we won't call it, when it comes to Northeast, uh, we won't call it as a coaching yeah. because <laughs> it, it might it might hurt to a sentiment. So, yes. <laughs> also, you want to know what the main grid data is. Sorry, sir. Also, you want to know what the main grid data is. I'll, I'll, I'll call it as indigenous hunting because they are practicing it from uh, ancestral ages since their ancestors and for food, for their livelihoods, that has got uh, uh, immense value in their life as well. Uh, I know that there are advancement and all the other things are impacting to the fact that now roads are go going there, everything is mattering there. You know, that, 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 that's a planning uh, things, but uh, uh, predators are, uh, we have observed predators like uh, in our camera traps we got uh, dole, dole, wild dogs and wild dogs, beer. But uh, we looking into the key informative survey data and uh, all these things, uh, mainly the predators for Takin is uh, dole, beer and tigers. Really there is a narrative called tigers, uh, tiger, beer and wild dog follows the herd of uh, Mishmi Takin herd. But interestingly, our camera traps and got any captures of ti ti tigers so far. We have got leopards and we got uh, uh, dolls as well. Next question is from DC sir. He wants to know how significantly different or similar the traditional ecological knowledge as known um, and uh, scientific ecological knowledge on the, on the talk and based on your study. And how do you Recommend inclusion of the that is a traditional ecology knowledge component in, in the rare and endangered species. Thank you. Uh, we, yeah, sir. Traditional ecological knowledge has its own important, uh, uh, which is a which is which is kind of oral narratives from people what they have observed in their experiences inside the jungle, uh, what they have got from their ancestors that uh, we passed so far since the ages. So uh, <coughs> understanding these and evaluating these with our scientific uh, methods which we follow for conservation techniques. So that, that might, that's, that's the one thing we can do. Yes. Thank you. This is the last question for, uh, what for you, Mr. Khan? Only one question. And uh, who else asked this question, please ask. Can't read. <laughs> the name also can't read. <laughs> <laughs> so you might mic it. How sociality will cause uh, disease uh, in, in that because sociality is a part of a system. Uh, are you looking at cluster 
uh, disease spread uh, uh, in cluster, using cluster as a unit rather than so the this social network study uh, is based on the reference uh, reference from uh, uh, various social network studies which shows the disease spread within the herd in the social network uh, framework uh, which shows the uh, which individuals uh, and the which age class is prone to spread the disease or will uh, will uh, will, uh, will spread the disease primarily in the uh, stages of uh, disease spread like uh, if uh, uh, matriarch is uh, infected will uh, uh, the entire herd will be infected in the the uh, very short span and uh, if the uh, subadult animal is uh, infected the spread will take a longer time thank you all of you and that's been excellent session now another the session the chat Good afternoon. Uh, well, all in all, the uh, presentations and it all seven were very nice, uh, and I can see the uh, kind of you know improvement in the, uh, the quality of presentations. You can see you know such presentation happening uh, 20, 30 years back, but then uh, of course resources also are available, and the, uh, definitely the quality has gone up. I'm very happy about that. Uh, well, uh, all seven topics, as I said in the beginning, are very nicely selected. And the uh, you know when we see the spread, in fact, you know it is covering northeast and it is covering Trans Himalayan areas, and then going Central India, Western side, and uh, uh, about the species also, very interesting. In fact, you know some insights coming from northeast, South Tatin, and all that. Because that area is all of us, especially you know, wild animals and involved in the, uh, you know, tigers and sun protein sitting there uh, in Anani area, which is very important. And the uh, PA is yet to be notified as a tiger if about the, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the union government as well as the state government is, I think, serious about. And this is very important. We uh, definitely know about. Uh, the kind of species thriving in that area. We do not know maybe uh, South China or something like that. So really, if it happens, it will be very uh, good from the point of view of tiger conservation. And Taking is obviously you know going to uh, be the uh, main previous tiger in that uh, important landscape. Uh, and then we had some uh, you know very good insights coming from. Uh, the, the behavior of leopard creating problem, and then uh, uh, you know problem with the tiger population, like uh, in Panna, growing population of uh, Panna already at the saturation level so far as core critical is concerned. That is where you know when we talk about the growing populations, then the uh, outside areas become very important. Someone was talking about you know though maybe very small, based on your findings, such research. You know, research findings. Uh, you should come up with very, uh, you know, solid kind of suggestions or uh, outcomes, so that the state section could really ponder on that, and then ultimately they might think of maybe notifying those important areas, maybe very small, but then at the same time will act as stepping stone in the coming years, and has very, uh, you know, has huge uh, conservation value, irrespective of the size of those areas, but important. And uh, we uh, heard about cheetah population and how cheetah population in uh, Ghana tiger is going. I don't know. I'm a little confused because, at, uh, you know, on one hand we are saying that it's uh, kind of stable, but then uh, when we talk about the optic and all that, uh, we have a sort of fear that it might you know, be a problem for the management. Um, when, uh, if the digital population goes down and the uh, predators, such as tigers, which are uh, obviously, I mean, that is happening. But then, yes, we need to uh, uh, we need to uh, look at that. Uh, and I really do not know when we talk about the offtake whether we have considered uh, the kind of digital translocation, which is happening from some of the uh, you know important uh, tiger reserves of Madhya Pradesh, which includes Nana as well. So that also needs to be factored in, I think. 
and uh, gauze we are very important again as I said in the beginning. Uh, uh, Translocation of gauze to Sanjay and Bandhav are very important initiative taken by the state and of course they researched and they kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, the initiatives and uh, interest taken by the uh, young uh, scientists, researchers who work in those areas. Actually, you know, with the help of these uh, kind of studies, uh, we should be in a position to again, uh, you know, conclude by saying that, like, you know, the situation in Bangladesh. Uh, this we really we were discussing when we, uh, you know, handling this project, or uh, we were in the process of handling this project to the state. That uh, you know, we need to uh, tell the uh, suggest the state that these are those potential areas where uh, we can have, uh, you know, the additional areas uh, potential. Uh, God habitat. So, if that kind of suggestions are given to the states, obviously they will try to include some of the areas uh, rather than keeping it with the territorial divisions. I know though it is not that easy, but then yes, if there is a scientific backing, it definitely helps the state's concern. So, this is what we are trying to do with respect to Chita uh, also. Uh, you know, in Kuno, when we uh, see the kind of habitat available and Recently, we uh, went to Gandhi, Gandhi Sagar also. As we know, this uh, you know the area is small. We need to add on some of those protected areas because those areas are not productive from the point of programming. So we can always suggest through these studies to the concerned states that these uh, you know needs to be uh, they need to be done. So uh, well, uh, everything. Uh, went very well, and uh, the presenters were very uh, proactive. And uh, we must encourage these young researchers. And I wish all the best to the young researchers. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. I now request uh, Dr. K. Ramesh, our co-chair, to kindly uh, present a token of gratitude to our session chair and co-chair, uh, to Shri H.S. Negi, sir, Dr. Negi, sir. And to Shri H.S. Negi, sir. Thank you, sir. And uh, we come to the end of our uh, third technical session on carnivore ecology and herbivores. We will now break for a quick tea. We will meet back here at 5 o'clock for the avian ecology session. Thank you.
Ancient Indian scripture talks about the word oh, Ancient Indian scripture talks about the word Chataka, the harbinger of rain. A bird which only drinks rain water and always pointed its beak towards the sky. It also known as the Divakash, which is present in the world only for a certain period of time. This mythology key is quite common in northern parts of India, and this Chataka bird is none other than than the summer migrant brood parasite bird, Pied Cuckoo, which appears in northern India just before the monsoon. So despite its well-known folklore and mythology, and also earlier attempts to identify its migration behavior, very limited information was available till now. So to understand the behavior of this Pied Cuckoo mode, so we undertook this study. Good evening, everyone. My name is Devanjan. And today I'll be talking about tracking the rain bird, subtle telemetry of pied cuckoo to understand its migratory pattern. The PI of the project was Dr. Gautam, is Dr. Gautam Talukdar, and co-PI is Dr. Arshuresh Kumar. Before jumping right into the migration of pied cuckoo, I would like to talk about the project a bit first. So it, the project is linking protected area network and near real-time rain bird locations with Indian bioresource information portal. So it has two components. One was to developing a common schema for PS of India for integrating into the IBIN portal. And the next was to identify the climate vulnerability of protected areas of India. So here we had identified more than 500 PS climate, future climate vulnerability. But the second component, which I'll be talking about, was the integrating a new data type into the IBIN portal, which was the satellite mig uh, migration information of Pied Cuckoo. Now, the pied cuckoo or the Jacobin cuckoo or the pied twisted cuckoo. The scientific name of this bird is Clamata Jacobinus. The clamare literally means shout. The bird has a really loud voice. And the Jacobinus came from the Jacobin order of the France because it resembles the black and white or the pied appearance of the Jacobin order. In India, there are two species of this bird is present. One is uh, uh, Jacobin cuckoo, one is Clamata glandarius. And there are more than 47 reported hosts of this bird towards its entire distribution range. But in northern India, the major host of the species is jungle babbler. However, the distribution of this bird is very dynamic in India. So to understand which are the environmental variables that are actually contributing to its distribution, we need a distribution modeling using eBird and a set of monthly environmental variables downloaded from WorldClaim. And what we found, it has a very dynamic distribution. In March to April, to, with the increasing month, the distribution actually increased. In monsoon, it's completely over the, throughout the India. And in December, it restricted only in the southern part of India. So through the modeling, we understand that there were four different variables that were majorly contributing in distribution. First was the temperature, which was limiting in distribution in only in the southern part of India during the winter time. Next, during the pre-monsoon and monsoon period, it was mainly water vapor pressure, which was a forerunner of monsoon, which is actually denoting the species arrival to northern India. In monsoon, it was mainly NDVI, which is denoting its uh, availability of food. And in the post-monsoon, it was wind speed, which is denoting its written, um, written uh, variables to help its migration. So we had, with all these distribution models, we started our uh, Pytuku uh, capturing attempt. So we formulated two hypotheses. First, the species is migrating to Africa because it already has a population over there. However, there's a second population which is resident, which is present throughout uh, the year in southern part of India. So it could be migrated in either one of these places. So before the tag came, so we started an early, uh, opportunistic capture happened. So the bird was rigged in 2019 before the tag came. And surprisingly, the similar bird was recited in 2020. So it was denoting a side fidelity of the bird. But however, we didn't know whether the bird traveled to migrate, uh, migrates to Africa or to Southern India. So with all this knowledge and these two hypotheses, we started our attempts to capturing the pied cuckoo. So the bird doesn't have any nest. So it builds, uh, it lays its nest, uh, eggs on the nest of the jungle babbler. So we started looking for the places where we had jungle babbler sighting. So we started looking at grasslands, forests, in semi-urban mixed landscapes. And when we had the um, repeated sightings of uh, babblers, we used to focus on this site. And when the monsoon came 
and we had the first call of the Pytuku and the sighting of the Pytuku for a repeated time in certain areas. We set up the mist nets over there. So it was starting from grassland to the rooftop. Here you can see the mist nets are properly camouflaged with the background. That was the major part. Uh, here is in the grassland. Here you can see me on the left corner. And uh, the, we started facing problem. First was we had a very small capture window. Although the Pytuku arrives in the June, but it has a breeding period till mid of August. After that, it, be, it becomes unresponsive towards the call. It stays on the top of canopy and doesn't respond to the call playback. So we had around one or two months to capture the Pytuku. The other problem faced was the capturing a lot of non-target birds that gets caught in the net. That's starting from a small uh, bee eater to a large crested serpent eagle, which almost broke our net in half. The replica and the right says the actually bird, which actually came to check the bird when we played the call. And on in July, midweek of July, two birds captured with two monsoon seasons effort. So immediately after the capture, the body measurements were taken before deploying the transmitter. So I'll talk about the transmitter a little bit. It's uh, one of the most smallest available uh, transmitter that is there. It weighs around two gram, which is about the perfect way to capture a type pied cuckoo. Because the minimum weight is 67 gra gram to capture a bird. And uh, the pied cuckoo weighs around 70 to 80 grams. So we tagged the bird. The one bird was named as Meg, which signifies its relationship with the monsoon. And another bird was named Chatak, which is the local name of the pied cuckoo. So the bird was released in uh, 12th to 13th July, which is the date of the capture. And we were extremely happy because after two years, the bird was captured. Now, we used Argus CLS service to, uh, to get the location information of the bird. Total six classes was there, so uh, where the three denotes the most accurate uh, class and B has the quite uh, lower accuracy. For uh, estimating a home range, we used the class three to one. However, when the bird was on the move and very uh, limited location in fixes were available, we used the class zero, A and B as well. So what we found that during the breeding season, the bird doesn't wander off far that much. So it stays near the grassland, and uh, which is the, also the locations where the babblers actually build their nest. And once the September came, the chick came out. So if you see the photo, this is the babbler and the pipeco chick. Now look at the resemblance. The beak color, the eye color, and the chest color is almost identical, which is probably the cue for the mother babbler to feed the pipeco. However, when the birds get mature, the color completely changes to black and white. So now we tag the bird in July and the September 1st, after 52 days, we received the last transmission from Make, which was near the capturing site only. However, it gave us enough information to estimate where the bird is actually moving during the breeding season. In September 15, the Chata, the another tag bird, started moving and reached Raji National Park. There, it stayed for about 20 days, and then it started heading south. However, the wind condition wasn't right. The wind was not still favorable, and the monsoon, recent monsoon has not started. So it reached Maharashtra and stayed there for about a month. So the first location received after the Radhaji National Park was in October 19. After that, it moved further down south towards the Karnataka coast. And then in November, the wind became favorable. The northeast monsoon started, and you can see the return monsoon was actually favorable for the bird. So after that day, we received a nest location from the Arabian Sea, which is on the 23rd of November. And the bird was actually, we got the confirmation, the bird is actually crossing the Arabian Sea to probably reach the Africa. However, in November 25th, we received the last location of Pyat Kuku, which was near the coast of Somalia. But what could be the probable reason for the signal loss? So speculating from our data, in that time, a storm was formed in the Arabian, uh, Arabian Sea, named Gati, which was one of the most strongest tropical cyclone on record to make landfall on Somalia. It had more, uh, approximately 200 km per hour speed, and it was the, just about the time when the Pytuku was crossing the ocean, and which is probably the reason, uh, the reason of the signal loss. However, these incidents are becoming more and more common. Events like stronger storms, 
disappearing stop over habitats and more skyscrapers are actually causing more much and much hindrance for the uh, migratory migratory birds to cross the their uh, site summarizing my entire study this was the first successfully captured and satellite tagging of pitucu globally it was it provided the first evidence that the pitucu doesn't actually goes to southern india it goes it travels to north uh, africa for its wintering uh, ground and it doesn't actually uh, immediately after the breeding it doesn't go directly to the africa so it waits for another months to actually wait for a favorable wind and then it crosses once the monsoon reaches and it takes multiple stops over, over before crossing the alluvian sea and waits for a favorable northwest northeast wind the total distance covered by chatak was 5000 km and as it seen the climate change is probably one of the most uh, important factor which is threats for the migratory birds with this i would like to conclude my uh, talk i would like to thank director green register and research coordinator wi indian biosphere information project and irs and funding was received from department of space and department of biotech and i had a wonderful team shakur harinder vishnu gorav everyone who you stayed in the field endlessly to capture the bird thank you Okay, I'm finished very well, well uh, much within time. So uh, over to the next presenter, I'd like to now invite the Bianto Biswas. He's going to talk about ranging pattern through GPS tracking of resident and migratory vultures of Panna Tiger Reserve, Madhya Pradesh. They mainly joined Wildlife Institute of India in 2018 in the Panna Landscape Management Project under the supervision of Dr. K. Ramesh, and he's currently working on the vulture conservation strategy. He is interested in movement ecology and even ecology. Or even. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today we will be discussing about the ranging pattern through GPS tracking of resident and migratory vultures of Panna Tiger Reserve in Madhya Pradesh. Uh, let's first start with uh, a clip. I guess most of you know this movie. <laughs> So vultures actually murk after uh, this uh, incident. Uh, coincidentally, this movie came out in 1998, and around that time only this thing was found that India's jeep vulture population is drastically dropping. Uh, I don't know how much Jagirav was concerned about the conservation of the vulture, but he knew that they would die. So, and in recent past, some studies actually proved that the vultures, which I mean the birds which are scavengers, they are more extinction prone, and especially the old world vultures being an obligate scavenger is at highest extinction risk. And in India, uh, if we talk about the conservation arena, uh, most of the uh, conservation effort on vulture is put on the toxicological aspect. Very little was known about the whereabouts of the vulture. So uh, to fill that gap, this study was the first initiative in India to look at the movement ecology of the vultures in wild. So coming to the objectives of this study, we uh, wanted to know uh, the daily movement pattern and utilize or utilization density of the vultures to set the baseline. Then to document the migration routes of the migratory vultures we are, which are coming to our study area. And then to document the critical areas which are often overlooked. Uh, we only look for the nesting sites or roosting sites or even feeding sites. But uh, we rarely talk about the uh, bathing sites, especially for vultures. And end of the day, there is no use of this kind of study if we don't give any input to the managers, wildlife managers. So our last goal was to give input to the conservation measures for the vulture uh, in greater Panna landscape. So talking about the study area uh, in Panna Tiger Reserve, 
one can see that the river Kane is cutting through the Panna Taika Reserve and making uh, steep escarpments both sides of the river bank. And these escarpments has ledges. And Panna Taika Reserve has also uh, many cliffs of steep slope. Those are also having ledges. These ledges are actually uh, giving shelter for the vultures uh, for their nesting and roosting site. So, and also the terrain is very uh, rugged. Uh, that's why uh, there is a very intense presence of photographic lift is also observed and this actually helps the vulture to take easy flight. So in Panna Taiga Reserve, there are seven species found, four, are, four of them are migratory and I mean four of them are resident and three of them are migratory in nature. Uh, sorry. So these are four are the resident vultures in Panna and three of them are in critically endangered status. So uh, and in the last census of vulture in the uh, state of Madhya Pradesh, uh, it was found that the Panna Tiger Reserve har harbors the highest number of vultures, uh, that is 722. These three are the migratory vultures found in Panna Tiger Reserve. Now coming to the methodology part of this study. Uh, depending on the resource availability and various challenges in the field inside the I mean heart of Panna Tiger Reserve, we actually had to uh, practice various kinds of uh, capturing method uh, like six methodology we followed but highest success rate was for lap trap and this trap was uh, actually found to be less injurious or almost no injurious for the vultures. Uh, whereas snake trap, we also uh, caught three individuals, but it was found that that is, uh, has higher probability of uh, in injury to the bird. And we used uh, carcass of buffalo and goat uh, uh, for the bait and to eliminate the possibility of toxicity from uh, drugs like diclofenac. We actually uh, bought those live animals uh, seven to 10 days before uh, the capturing and uh, we kept them separately to eliminate any kind of uh, chance of toxicity. So the capturing method was followed by housing and then uh, we actually uh, did the entire biological checkup with the help of uh, experienced veterinary doctors and then we collected the biological samples and we did the morphometry and after that we used the UMTS uh, bird solar tag uh, obtained from EOX. Uh, uh, we put it on the back uh, which uh, this technique is named as uh, backpack technique and then we released the vultures and once we released we started getting the data through MoveBank which is a third party data repository. So we could capture four species of vultures, uh, 25 individuals, 13 individuals from Indian vulture, two from red-headed, and two from Eurasian griffon, and eight for uh, Himalayan griffon. Uh, this actually gave two species from resident vulture and two species from migratory vulture. So further, we did the data analysis in uh, R and we used a continuous time movement modeling for the uh, estimation of home range. We also uh, check the range residency through plotting the variogram and we estimated the quarterly home range starting from March uh, 2022 and we also estimated the home range of the migratory vultures as breeding home range and wintering home range separately. So coming to the result, we found that the first quarter of the study, uh, almost all the resident vultures showed highest amount of daily average movement and also highest amount of total uh, movement throughout that quarter. And as the bulk, we approach the last quarter, that is the December, February, uh, they have uh, drastically reduced their movement activity. And the question arises naturally that why so? So the March to May, that is the first quarter, it is actually the pre-monsoon season and which is actually non-breeding season and the vultures showed highest movement. So after this, the monsoon comes and it actually restricts the movement of the vultures. If there is raining, is raining, then the vultures don't move much. And 
Another factor which comes into play that is the movement of the floaters. Floaters are the individuals which don't breed. Therefore, they don't have the tendency to come back to the nest to take care of the vulture chicks. Uh, one important point to mention here that vulture ch chicks need uh, continuous parental care because there are multiple kinds of natural threats like from Shaheen Falcon and other predatory birds. Uh, that's why vulture nests never go unattended uh, if successful breeding is required. Uh, that's why uh, if we look at the movement of breeding vultures, then we will see that they have moved very less with compared to the floaters. And we also found that the Indian vultures showed highest daily average distance movement. This can also be uh, our result uh, because we have 13 vultures from Indian and two only from red-headed vultures. So talking about the estimation of the home range, uh, we will see that again those same factors come into play. Uh, the floaters show the higher, I mean larger home range size and the breeders show very uh, small home range size, the one you can see on the uh, on this side. And also uh, in the middle one, when we tagged this particular individual, it was actually floaters. We didn't see any brooding patch in the body. And uh, you can uh, see that initially the home range was very large in size. And as it approached the breeding season, the home range actually shrink because again, that attending of nest comes into play. Talking about the migratory vultures, uh, we've uh, tagged two Himalayan vultures and one Eurasian griffon. So the Eurasian griffon was found to come from all the way to Central Asian region and they, their home range actually spread over Turkmenistan, uh, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. And it crossed a linear distance. I'm talking about only the linear distance of more than uh, 2300 kilometers. We found that the Himalayan griffons, which are coming from two different parts of China to the central Indian landscape. One is from the middle part of China, that is the northern boundary of uh, Tibetan Plateau. And uh, the other uh, individual was coming from the uh, border of Central Asian region and China. And it also has a very larger uh, span home, ra uh, home range in uh, breeding ground. So these vultures actually uh, came to India and then again did the return migration and then again came back, uh, which we got to know for the first time in India that uh, about their movement. And we also found these stopover sites uh, in Nepal, China, and also in Afghanistan. Uh, while doing the migration, sometimes the data which gets transmitted is irregular. That's why we cannot uh, pinpoint all the stopover sites totally, but still uh, these four sites we confirmed and the, you can see that the vulture which is coming from the middle part of China that is crossing the Mount Everest uh, while coming to India. And these, of, these vultures we didn't get actually not uh, irregular data or complete data for one year that we didn't include in our analysis, but still these individuals gave uh, very important data about their breeding ground. Uh, again, the Eurasian griffon was found to come from Central Asian region, crossing around 2400 kilometers, and the uh, most distant individual came from almost uh, Mongolian border, the Himalayan griffon, crossing a linear distance of 2700 kilometers. Other vultures were also coming from the eastern part of China, uh, and uh, they have a tendency to visit the India-China border near Arunachal. So further this telemetry study uh, revealed our uh, data for, uh, or the findings for the third objective which were the critical areas uh, for the vultures. So we found two bathing sites uh, for the vultures apart from the known bathing sites. One was found inside the Panna Tiger Reserve and one was found outside Panna Tiger Reserve, which is in unprotected area. And we also found seven dumping sites for the vultures, uh, I mean, uh, for carcass, which were regularly visited by the vultures for foraging. And these dumping sites are not actually monitored or 
they are not designated dumping site those are in practice and lastly we actually incorporated all these uh, findings into the integrated landscape management plan for greater panda landscape we have a dedicated chapter for vulture conservation there we suggested to uh, protect the bathing areas or even the other nesting areas or roosting sites and even the uh, foraging sites which are in unprotected area because uh, inside the protected area uh, there is not much challenge to face but outside protected area uh, there is high chance of mortality through toxicity uh, like during the study period only there was an incidence in Assam everybody must know that in one day there was more than 100 vultures died uh, due to toxicity so we should know where these vultures are going actually otherwise we can't control this kind of uh, situations so to conclude I would say the resident vultures are uh, nesting inside the protected area but however I mean they are actually um, using a huge amount of area outside protected area and they are also connecting other protected areas uh, and they are using the human dominated landscape uh, very severely and the telemetry data further revealed that the Eurasian griffons they are coming from the uh, Central Asian region now we know like where these vultures are coming from where they are stopovers uh, this actually will help us to uh, progress in the field of one health where we can actually estimate or we can actually uh, think about uh, from where the where many kind of zoonotic diseases can spread and two of the Himalayan griffon which made their return migration in China and then again return uh, back to PTR and then again visited China and we now we know about the proper stop her sites in between and they are we, we know that these vultures are coming from different part of China and this GPS telemetry data actually helped us in finding two, uh, uh, two new bathing sites which were not known earlier and hence the conservation effort we will say for the resident vultures should be more landscape oriented and for the migratory vultures it should be transboundary oriented. So I want to acknowledge the following people and my teammates and lab mates. Thank you for listening. Thank you, uh, Peter. Uh, now I uh, invite uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Pramod. And uh, he's going to talk about bird hazards uh, to aircraft in Indian airfields, a very, very important topic, especially that uh, a lot of airfields, uh, airports are coming up across the country. Dr. Pramod is an ornithologist by profession, working in Sepan for the last 23 years. He is a senior principal scientist and head of the division of nature education. He is also principal investigator of bird and wildlife hazards to the aircraft project. My humble uh, salutations to everyone who are assembled in this hall. One year back, I did not think that I will be coming here and giving a presentation in Wildlife Institute of India ARS as a family member of Wildlife Institute of India. Now I am in front of you and uh, we, uh, most of our, us in SACO, we believe that whatever is happening and happened in the last uh, few months and one year uh, to SACON is good for SACON good for the wildlife history of India and also good for the country. So before I start my presentation, it's my duty to uh, thank uh, every, every, all our well-wishers who are uh, support, supporting us in this uh, period of time. Thank you, thank you, Ananda. Today what I'm going to present uh, is not one simple uh, project, but it's a program in SACON for the last uh, almost a decade, we are doing so many small, small research, I mean, uh, study studies of various Indian civil as well as uh, 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 military airfields. But now I am just sticking to only the civil airfield studies, which is here. Uh, SACON is having have taken now last uh, uh, five six years. We have completed about some twelve airfields, Indian civil airfield studies. 
the main study of the bird hazards, bird hazards to the selected airfields. In the main, uh, uh, the objective of this program is to mitig uh, to uh, come up with uh, a package of uh, suggestions and recommendations based on our systematic study and observations and uh, scientific uh, observations to mitigate and uh, reduce the bird hazards to the aircraft. And uh, this, uh, to say the history, uh, a decade back, it is Indian Air Force who pushed, pulled me as well as SAC on to these studies. Indian Air Force has sent uh, one uh, wing commander on deputation to SAC on to work on this issue of about 21 airfields in the country. And he has completed a PhD also, and we had we have done a study on that. Seeing that uh, success of the program, our ministry our ministry has given a study of a, to study a detailed study on three civil airfields in the country. We have taken a study between 19, uh, uh, 17, 2017 to 2019. And 2020, the success of the program, our uh, airport authority of India was very happy and they called us for a discussion. And then uh, airport other, airports authority of India has signed an MOU with the SACON to take up uh, regularly the studies of different different airports, whichever is concerned for them, to, to give them the suggestions and to travel with them to manage this situation. So actually, just to give you a picture, that's what I said, that we have uh, the phase one, uh, which we have taken up uh, three studies in uh, Kannur, Ahmedabad, and Coimbatore uh, Airport. And Coimbatore Airport, at that point of time, Coimbatore and Ahmedabad was the, the as per the DGCRA, the, the airports with the highest bird hits records. We have done a study and there are some good suggestions given based on that, that implementation of that uh, uh, suggestions actually resulted in some good reduction of the bird, bird hits at, in Coimbatore. So based on that, later on we have uh, airport, we have signed an MOU with the Airports Authority of India and we have started taking the studies one out of the other. The, the approach of uh, the study, which was generally, whenever we talk about the bird hazard, people will say, okay, if you handle all the uh, garbage and dumping area and all, that is the first thing everybody look into it. But there are, it's a, actually the problem is much more complicated. So what we have started looking at every, uh, uh, the birds of a, an airport is a subset of a birds of a larger landscape. Unless we understand the whole larger landscape, the birds and their movements in the larger landscape, we will not be able to very pinpointly come to the actual issues. Which, for which, first we have started looking at the overall larger landscape, the bird populations and movements, and also the study the whole uh, landscape, actually landscape, uh, LULC, our uh, land use and land cover uh, mapping, and also take all that information to understand the whole landscape level dynamics and movement of the birds. Then go to actually inside the airport, look into the kind of inside the airport micro habitat variations and uh, issues within the airport. There are a lot of issues of the management of the grasses, locations of the where the bird, to attractions of the birds within the airport itself. Identify such minor issues, everything together and uh, addressing that specifically. Then finally identifying in this uh, the subset of birds which are available inside the airport, what, what are the real problematic birds? Mostly, most of the airport, we will get something like a 70 to 80, something even 100 species of birds inside the airport. But of which, actually the problematic birds will be only five or six or seven. So I, after identifying this set of five, six uh, problematic birds, we will go for a detailed ecological study and observation study, behavioral study, how the birds are actually using the airport environment, understanding what is the movement within the airport and what exactly we can suggest. We will So we'll go to the actually ecological aspect of the special detailed movement pattern of the birds within the airport and its surrounding. Then the other issue comes, then the other issues come. It is not only the issue, the many times the birds of the surrounding area, many things which you, people are doing outside is affecting. The dumping areas, the fish stalls, mutton, these all meat stalls, all that will have an influence. We have to address that, that is also a very critical factor. On top of everything, even some cultural aspects of the people is directly started, we have examples affecting the bird uh, issue of the airports. For example, bird feeding. Many of the uh, Maharashtra, sorry, in Gujarat and Rajasthan, surrounding area, the people have a habit of regularly bird feeding, which, which, which makes the birds very, very large number available, very close to the airport, which makes a lot of issue. Even some area, kite feeding, and so all kinds of things. So all this cultural aspect is directly affecting the bird. That also has to be addressed separately. 
all when we are for it and because of all these thing actually the the re, real reason coming back to the uh, to each airport in it, it, it is varies for with respect to each airport that's what we are we have studied about a 12 airport the real the, the major reason for the bird hits of each of the airports are actually different not the same generally have a habit there is a problem there is a prescription you can go and implement it it, it, it doesn't work like that so just to just to, the basic objective as i told you we have decided to study a 10 kilometer surrounding as a, as a total study area and then uh, to actually analyze the whole landscape which include the all the uh, anthropogenic factors like uh, uh, um, uh, the, all this uh, distribution of the dumping areas and uh, uh, mutton stall, fish stall, and all that kind of even water bodies and all home and roosting areas of the birds, all that thing. Then finally, identifying the problematic species, study the behavior and movement of the problematic species specifically, and then come up with a is very clear location specific airport specific recommendation with the proof and based on data then in our project what we do one year do complete study and give the recommendation and give to them the next two years every three months we'll again visit and see how the uh, agencies authorities are implementing our recommendation how the birds community is responding to that that is a critical factor. Now we are doing, next two years we are going, the, even the, our recommendation is now is something faulty, we are correcting it. We need to adaptively modify it, correcting. All that is going on. So as I said, the methodology we have, very, very, this methodology also we have, uh, it is not uh, taken from anywhere. We have developed our own, the whole 10 kilometer area we have uh, made into horizontal, uh, actually uh, as a three zones we have divided within airport in detail outside two kilometers surrounding little by little lesser than and then five kilometer and ten kilometer and when it comes closer to the airport uh, airport it will be intensity of the observations will be more close to the runway we have more uh, very large number of runway transect point counter and everything is more in towards the closest because the kind of data we will get will represent what the effect of the uh, birds into the i mean the real impact of the birds and the potential of the airport for the uh, strike will be evaluated through that. Of course, as I said, the mapping, uh, all the, every airport, we have meticulously mapped the uh, 10 kilometer surrounding area. And inside the airport, both the sides of the uh, runway, we have done a detailed uh, uh, um, vegetation study, what kind of grasses. Sometimes the kind of grasses, actually, uh, we, uh, it is given us clue how, what is the kind of intervention that is required. Because some of the grasses with the higher seeds as well. The only reason in one of the airport, one of the grass issue was the main issue of the pit over there in Ahmedabad for that matter. We had, had such kind of issues. Well. So now, just coming to one or two small examples I am giving because it's a lot of things it can be done, but just how the, our uh, intervention could uh, save some of the issue. One of uh, the best example is the Coimbatore airport. When we went inside the, to start the study, that area, uh, the major 90, 95% of the heat was because of one species uh, lapping. And we found out the reason happened to be the, the whole area, because the intensive herbicide use, the whole area was completely, uh, grass is taken out to make, to make the whole airport clean. And the open uh, soil patches, has created the whole area as a very highly CIF of protected breeding ground for the lappings. So whole region lappings were there. Within a two days, we could even collect about 200 eggs from this 1.7 kilometer area. When the whole grasses brought in properly, within another two to three years, that's, uh, the bird heat due to the lapping has suddenly come down. Similarly, uh, there are, when we go to study, the details of the study goes to the diurnal activity of the, each of the problematic bird, within a, what time the, each of the birds are more active, and what kind of activity they are doing inside, all that details. Also, how, what are the movement of the problematic birds within the airport. All these data will be presented in the report, and which will be uh, uh, presented to them after one year study to the airport. And this, and then the next two year, we will be monitoring the recommendation which we have given to them, how they are uh, uh, implementing it. 
So, of course, with a copy of our report, we'll go to the headquarters, because sometimes headquarters from that bamboo from there is required to actually implement it, otherwise they will not take it up into that. So, uh, uh, also, the, we do training to the, uh, air, the BSCT uh, uh, combat field staff for the mitigation of these measures along as a part of our project. So, as it is, uh, when we talk about this bird hazard aircraft, even just, uh, just, just outside when you are talking, basis of hazard said is only managing the, uh, all the uh, waste to waste outside, is, that's the only thing, that's the point everybody talks. Many day people ask, is it anything is possible, the solution, is there any possible uh, solutions is possible at all? So our answer based on our 12 uh, airport study, our answer to that, uh, uh, this question is, Whereas even uh, there is a, there is some standard procedural uh, protocol is available to to mitigate most of the simple direct problems. If everybody, if the airport authorities are in implementing the uh, that standard procedure and protocol to manage the inside airport ecosystem, uh, and even SACON has published a uh, uh, one uh, basic best practice guide. We have very listed what are, what minimum what needs to be done in an airport. If everybody strictly follow that thing, strictly means 100%. There is a 95% uh, following that this will not actually work. Sometimes uh, there is a lot of difference between 95% and 100%. Because if that sometimes what, if, what is all or non low, what we have studied, that, that actually works in this case. If something half heartedly, 90% is we have done something that will not work. 100, if you are able to 100%, that strictly if you can do, many problems of the bird hazards to aircraft can be handled. But unfortunately, whatever I have seen across the country, none of the airport do this 100% implementation of the basic things to be done. Second, even if everything is done, still there will be an issue specific to that airports, which can has to be handled separately, which we have to, that has, needs a study, that needs a specific suggestion, that needs to be done. And most important factor is, if we wanted to take it as a long term, the birds, are flying in this world 150 million years. We are still flying over the last 220 years only. Whatever suggestion we are doing, they will have a, some, they will have it today, they will adjust to that. So we need an adaptive modification of our own strategies for which we need data, systematic data collected that never, never happens in any of our airports. So we are now developing in every airport a system of collecting data of the bird heat as well as the bird movement and bird population thing and trying to bring that culture of collecting and systematically analyzing data and taking an informed decision when with respect to the bird hazards to aircraft. Even uh, most important, even if we do all these things, this VR researchers after two, three, four years research, we will come out of it. If we have to handle this issue systematically, the final answer is the people who know about how to handle, how to this should be there inside the airport. So what we are doing, along with doing this study, along with the analysis, we will put, even in the data collection, everything, we will involve the people who are actually ground staff and also training them. And we have now, uh, yesterday I was in uh, Delhi, uh, today uh, uh, we are discussing about in, with Indian Air Force and uh, Airport Authority of India, we have now uh, developing a system, regular training program for the Indian Air Force, Indian Air Force as well as the Airport Authority of India, ground staff who is actually handling this issue in the airfield. Already in Indian Air Force we have conducted a one um, a training program, they are now asking for more and more. Airport Authority we are going to the next month, we are going to sign an MOU with them to have a regular systematic training so that inside the airfield, inside the, within the uh, uh, the managers or within the people who are managing, we should have, we should develop a, a proper uh, um, uh, capacity building has to be done. And then this system of collecting, managing, analyzing and using the data uh, for the uh, uh, managing all these mitigation measures to the bird hazard has to come in. So each of these airport which we are entering is a learning pr process for us, our team and that we hopefully we will be, as and, as and when we get more and more airports, then this month we are again starting one more airport, the Raipur airport. This keeps going, but as I said, we have to, this is a continuous process of learning, which in which 
be the researchers plus the managers has to come hand in hand to work together. Thank you. Uh, I have a lot of people to thank, uh, starting from Airport Authority of India, Indian Air Force, Director of SACON, now the present Director of New SACON, and uh, also uh, 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 my colleagues at SACON, Administration and Finance Division, people who are helping me to do all these things, SACON. Also, the ARS uh, organizing team of ILF District of India for inviting me and to come and giving a presentation here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pramod. Uh, the next presenter is Dr. Nishan, and that's the last presentation of uh, this session for today. Uh, he will be talking about e ecological impacts of poultry waste on urban raptors, conflicts, diseases, and climate change implications amidst pandemic threats. Nishan has been associated with Bali Institute of since 2011. Uh, he came here as a MSc student. He completed his B.Sc. honors in zoology from Sri Ramakrishna College, University of Delhi. And he has been a part of the uh, in WI, He has been a part of the research group that established the Dark Eye project. And currently, he is a deputy welcome trust UK India Alliance fellow, hosted by Wider uh, Institute of India at the University of Oxford. He is also associate professor at uh, Ambedkar University, Delhi. Richard. Thank you, Ritesh and Suresh, sir. Hello, everyone. I must apologize to half of the hall here because I bore you with this same image. But it's a good occasion to recall what we did in the last 10, 11 years as part of this institution while establishing a continuous bird monitoring program. On your screen, we have the largest landfill in Asia. I guess quantities are not well known and I started monitoring it from 2008 and 9 as part of my BSc second year undergrad project. Of course, this is a top view of the same landfill, and it has become a site my faculty colleagues and my friends constantly remind me about. So, this has become a constant reminder for me for the last 10 years. Today, I'm going to center my arguments with respect to the research which we did through the funding support from RRCF Mumbai, which allowed us to track the movement of black kites from Central Asia to South Asia. On the screen, those tracks are roughly overlapped with Zhu and colleagues' work with respect to how very pathogenic strains of avian flu are distributed along these migratory pathways, in different colors and shades out here. The interesting thing which you can notice in gray shade is the gradient of amount of poultry which is reared. The South Asian system, is it? Okay. So South Asia and Africa and Latin America are going to contribute to 98% of further increase in poultry farming. For South Asia, fortunately or unfortunately, because Poor people rear poultry in their backyards. It is the basis of the livelihood for millions of people in our country, and it also becomes a double-edged sword, which I'm going to explain. But before I go and give you a very site-specific information with respect to Ghazipur landfill, I'll give you a bit of like pointers and snippets. On the pan out here, I'm comparing the biomass of fowl and biomass of all wild birds. Progressively, through genetic engineering and advancement of technology, average size of poultry bird has reached from less than a kg to more than four kgs. Any guesses in terms of what is the relationship in current times, the biomass of wild birds and the biomass of poultry fowl? So, our chicken, we just had chicken biryani this afternoon. It weighs 300% more than the wild birds on earth combined. So that sets a thought process in every ecologist's mind. Why? Because we are slaughtering close to 70 billion fowls every year for human consumption. There is a standing crop of 25 billion chickens ready every day for you. 
It yields more than 525 million tons of chicken paste, which comes from the slaughter of each bird. I guess for people who are experts here in multiple aspects, it's not a wild guess that it is going to homogenize gene pool, it is going to homogenize cultures, and it is going to homogenize ways in which we interact with pathogens. And we have just brushed with one such pathogen because in ways and means of our livelihoods, we are homogenizing and perpetuating humanity to multiple threats. My talk today is going to contextualize what we have been missing in context of how biomass is sequestered on our planet. This particular paper from Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences, USA, tries to depict that. This small triangle is roughly what we just talked about through the day. I guess tomorrow we'll hear more about plants, but they sequester most of the carbon on Earth in terms of gigatons of carbon sequestered in each forms. Interestingly, most of what we get to see on wildlife movies is circled in these red zones. Imagine the small size of these triangles. And we generally miss this polygon on the base, which we must have created in just two, three hundred years. Of course, this, cannot, this carbon cannot come from space. You must have taken biomass from the plant base or animal base, and you have created livestock bases, which are much more than wild animals and birds combined. It sets our thought process in rolling. Although I appreciate this paper, what it does not bring up is the idea of waste biomass, processing of livestock, raising of livestock. Raising our own food brings a lot of challenge in terms of creating biomass, which can support life farms. And while we are very bothered and we want earthlings to remain and coexist with us, in 95% of India, these are the animals we interact with. And I'm here to just give a snippet of what chicken consumption in one corner of Delhi is going to regulate us. So on the screen, there is a bit of a prelude in terms of how the study design takes the benefit of 32 well-monitored one square kilometer sites distributed on the gradient of urbanization and sociocultural factors. We try and understand how intrinsic and extrinsic factors are regulated and which impact the demography. I guess in the past ARS, I'm happy to talk to people who are not part of the previous ARSs, but I'm happy to talk about the demographic consequences. And I will start from this point in terms of congregations of birds on biomass created by human generated waste. So this is not a COVID-19 pick. It is in terms of one research agenda which I wanted to achieve with my mentors in master's dissertation. We started from the base. My mentors were trying to say, by the time we went upstairs, because there are thousands of birds moving in very peculiar formations, and the general ways of enumerating birds does not succeed. So what did we do? At least for the part of the dissertation, we stationed 10 people in different zones, and they started doing counts of the aerial birds, and they started taking photographic images in circular fashion by doing 60 degree turns with each successive waves. So it's not a wild guess that you'll have to have like six turns and you will take a final top photo and you'll use images software to count the birds and get a proportion of the birds which are sitting each to fly. So the task was to quantify this wastefulness in terms of how we are attracting sizable populations of birds from Central Asia. The tracking, which was supported by the funding agency, because it was the first major investment of about 30 lakhs, allowed us to understand that 95% of the birds on major landfills, which are kites, are essentially black-eared kites. And by understanding their home ranges and the time they spent on the landfills, we could ascertain some, sight of, some insights in terms of how many birds could actually be there. So this was a question which was asked by Vivas sir. Ki agar ek time mein tune itna gina hai, to pure din mein kitna? So I have the answer, sir. Roughly. So more than 33,000 birds daily forage on these landfills, 
which has been ascertained on the basis of major congregations which happen roughly three times a day. On an average, they spend three hours to four hours and there is about 10, 11 hours of daylight. So you can say that the birds which are coming are spending four hours there, consuming about 200 grams. And it enumerates to about birds which are in flight 30,000 and the others which are sitting. So the trouble is we continue to slaughter these birds throughout the year while in the phases when these birds return to their breeding zones, you do not have their support. What happens then? It perpetuates new ecological relationships. A lot of arguments today in the latest literature discuss novel ecosystems. There are other set of literatures which talk about social ecological systems. And I guess in terms of better theorizing it for our part of the world, we need major investment from researchers. And for that, I'm giving you a comparative account in terms of what kites have been doing in from October to March, when they're wintering here, and when they return back. So I have just for the sake of convenience, of course, there would be variations. I've equated the amount of biomass which is produced from slaughter of one lakh chickens per day. And we can say that about eight to nine percent of biomass is consumed by these birds when they are around. This is a sizable ecosystem service. We can understand that on the basis of the amount of methane production and its constituency from the phases when kites are there versus when kites are not there. In terms of 2.68 gigagrams of uh, methane which is produced from the rotting garbage on Ghazipur, for comparison I will say that the whole of the United States gas stoves which use natural gas, they produce 28.2 giga grams. So Ghazipur itself is producing more than that. And my colleagues who are like uh, collaborators working from Stanford are trying to understand the satellite imagery where use these imageries have very distinct signatures of how methane can be kind of literally observed from the space. Of course, one component which I wanted to discuss here is the aspect of circular economy, which is not ecologically foolproof. When we were doing deployment of transmitters, West Bengal government stopped the movement of waste from Delhi to Kolkata. So mangor, which people in Delhi are eating, are grown in Kolkata, and they are grown on the chicken waste on, on the basis of what chicken which people in Delhi are consuming. So an ecological or economical relationship so I want to summarize this aspect of the talk by signaling the aspect that one health is not singular. If we want to make interventions of whether or not to do poultry farming in backyards when migratory birds interact with resident birds, we need to take socio-ecological relationship into consideration. We need to factor these new relationships which are being maintained by biomass in our backyards. Then, with dogs and other mammalian scavengers. They tend to shoo away these birds and the future of vulture conservation cannot just look about replenishing them from captive breeding. We also need to take the idea of what ecological settings are there into which these vultures would be seeded. I will also introduce the aspect of political ecology as a component of this research and when these transformations were happening on Ghazipur landfill, when we stopped slaughtering of chicken because somebody felt we were not doing it in a very humane way, people from Bhojpuri land started propagating false ideas. It brought down the sale of chicken and it started moving kites away from the dump yard itself. So we are in the process of analyzing that data and next six months you will have an understanding of how it changed the home ranges and probably the relationship with people. This is the aerial view of how they are changing the slaughter facility. So the open space in which kites were getting food from these people who were processing chicken as an act of philanthropy has been stopped for the last several years. This essentially means that these birds are moving in different new areas. Are there consequences of that? We are not sure. So the good part would be to follow up the preliminary study with more telemetered birds and of course, it makes sense to get interested in these ideas as ecologists, but our politicians are not far behind. 
They are taking cognizance of the fact that the society is gaining huge, uh, like hugely interested in what is happening in their surroundings, which has somehow pushed the political agenda of municipality polls in the last session. And all of these political parties started clamoring support for removing these landfills, which are essentially somehow going to be clubbed as socio-ecological systems or like human-mediated ecosystems. So you cannot just remove the dump or you cannot just remove where you're putting a lot of human refuse. As ecologists, we need to be mindful about these movements. And out there, black kites again serve as good model when we introduce them as backyard birds which are using the Central Asian flyway. So the ministers of our ministry got to understand the movement of these birds better when they held one in their hand. I will just give a slight snippet of this exercise we have been doing with the Ministry of Defense and Air Force and Delhi Forest Department in order to understand how and which air pockets contain birds which might entangle with the flying engines in air. And although there are situations where they are slightly avoiding it, we have just tagged about 18, 19, 20 birds. Imagine if we tag enough birds to get a clear representation of what is happening in our backyard. We are also trying to incorporate the meat tossing activity across the flight path, and it is going to help us to maintain safe flight formations about which we are very proud of each 26th January. So it's again implication of a long research which was done in Delhi and which has been quickly applied to solve the problem for the past two years. We are also developing literature which allows us to understand the importance of how people respond to birds and other life forms around them. We have been, I think the world celebrates Indian consciousness about, about non-human life forms, but as researchers, we have not been able to document them well enough. So our research unit is also trying to make grand efforts towards that. And we have like two papers lined up which talk about the importance of birds like vultures, not just as scavengers, which have ecosystem functions, but they are also serving cultural functions, which somehow allowed 40 million of these birds to coexist with them. The final slide out here tries to argue, why is it necessary to put forth the argument of creating research understanding, which will allow us to create homogeneity in Indian ethos and Western infrastructure? The morning started with the idea of using Western infrastructure, but can we do more uh, about incorporating Indian ethos and explaining ecological paradigms? So with that, I would rest my case. I'm just representing a large team of mentors and colleagues, and I'm very thankful to the administrators here who have supported me for the past 10 years and the funding agencies. This is how we conduct this research in Delhi, and we are very thankful to funding agencies who are going to support us further. Happy to answer questions. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Nishant. Uh, now we come to the end of the uh, presentations. I would request uh, all the presenters to come up to the stage. So the first presenter, Devanjit, uh, you have one question so far. Uh, and this is from Amarjit Kaur. She's a through presentation. You mentioned that five cuckoos of northern India are not migrating to southern India and rather to Africa. Considering very low sample size, is it truly the pattern or the case? It's most likely the case. That Chances are, I don't think so. There, I think the population over there is only a resident population. Okay, that's that's all for you. The next person, So I start with the most important question when we talk about Panna, and that question is by uh, B.C. Chaudhary sir, and what he wants to know is what would be the impact of Ken Bethwari River Lake project related to development 
related developments as the resident vulture species on the resident vulture species in Banda Tiger Reserve. Okay, uh, so obviously, Cane uh, Beto River linking this project is uh, will be resulting in a submergent zone, and there is a breeding ground, a critical breeding ground, nesting ground is coming under that zone. So, in the full capacity of the submergent zone, that area will be submerged. Obviously, those nesting sites will be lost. But in the beginning part of the I mean, initial part of the project, we have also uh, estimated. Uh, potential vulture sites. We have uh, estimated, uh, I mean, di done distribution modeling where their vultures can occupy, but so far there is no vulture. So, I mean, we don't know that where those vultures will go from that particular area, but obviously they will move out. And that's why you, this study actually shows how far these vultures are going. So, we have an idea that when these vultures will leave this place, that particular nesting ground, so where they can go, how far they can go. And within that, we have estimated uh, the, I mean, suitable areas for the vultures. And we have also suggested to the competent authority for protection. Thank you, sir. Okay, uh, the next question is by uh, Bilal Habib. Uh, do you think Gaushanas are an opportunity to provide or arrange non-toxic food for vultures? Gaushalas, eh? Gaush. <laughs> so, Gaushalas are an opportunity to provide a food or arrange non-toxic food for vultures. So, he's basically trying to ask whether Gaushalas are, are, are important from the point of providing for food or also that uh, food will be non-toxic because they maintain that. Okay, so first point is that whether we want or not, the gaussians will be there. Second point, there will be carcass available from those gaussians, and they will be dumped. Though there is the mandate for the gaussian is there that the carcass must be buried, but due to funding issues and many other issues, I have never seen in the landscape that any carcass is buried, and anyhow these vultures are using those carcass. And now the present condition is that uh, since these gauchalas are uh, supervised by veterinary doctors, so they, these particular cattle are not uh, treated with, uh, I mean, NSID drugs which are toxic for vultures. So obviously these gauchalas are effectively source for, uh, I mean, safe food for vultures. And if we can actually uh, protect these uh, dumping grounds, which are currently mostly in uh, revenue area or in forest area, if we can just protect these areas so that it will uh, eliminate the chance of other interaction of other wildlife and feral dogs and also the chance of disease spread. So it's a win-win situation. Yeah. Okay, one Thank more you, question to you. Hmm. What is the status of transboundary sites for vulture conservation? Any insights overall? Uh, overall watchful insights, something like that. And this question is by Dr. Salvador. So, what is the status of transboundary sites for vulture conservation? So, many of your vultures migrated across okay. the Central Asian climate. So, beyond the Indian region, what is the status of those sites from the point of vulture conservation? That's what he's asking. It might be difficult for you to. Yeah, I mean, so, so far we don't have much insight, but uh, whatever literature we have uh, discussed so far, the, those say that uh, there are multiple practices going around for, uh, I mean, wantedly or unwantedly for vulture conservation, like there are, uh, I mean, in Bhutan, there are monasteries where uh, vultures are fed for their religious purpose. And uh, in Nepal region also it happens. Uh, but far in Central Asia, we, uh, so far we don't have much idea about those areas, yeah. So there's one question by Kumar Ankit Padavi Tropic. Uh, it's a very simple question. You can talk to him later. Okay. Uh, the next question is by uh, the next question is for uh, Dr. Pramod, please. Uh, this is uh, by B.C. Chaudhary, sir. Uh, do you think all airports in India should appoint an ornithologist to monitor the recommendations of your project being followed 100%? 
and also work out site specific guidelines already started sir already already started some private private efforts are now poaching my team members <laughs> that is happening now other uh, others are also it's already it's in the pipeline that is <laughs> but airport authority and all is a very difficult because they are that is the main issue with the airport authority a recommendation in your report that they should have a marking color we will do henceforth <laughs> okay so there's one uh, uh, basic question from amit curious to know what are the suggested measures for vegetation management in the airfields and uh, and around if you, you may also take this up later but yeah yeah just a very couple of quick things which you can say but many of the there is a big issue of the large uh, uh, grass and small grass debate is there some are some are some there is a two schools of thoughts large grass is better for and small but in that it is now the our understanding says that it depends upon the kind of species problematic to that airport some species shorter grass will be supportive and that depending after the studies only we can suggest is done second definitely one other point is the grass cutting should be done before the flowering season which many people don't do that creates another problem like that there are a series of thing and there's a lot of things to discuss uh, thank you dr pramod and uh, nishant uh, there are no questions uh, your presentation thank was you. very clear <laughs> 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 so uh, Uh, thank you to all the presenters. Thank you very much. Uh, now that the session has come to an end, I will now request my uh, session chair, Dr. Garo, as well as uh, Arindam sir, for their comments. So, first to Dr. Garo. Namaskar. All that four presentations uh, which uh, in this session. Uh, those are excellent, and whatever we have seen in 15 minutes, that is the depth of work which they have done for five years, 10 years, and 20 years, and that is uh, uh, for the new researchers, those who are here, uh, they will learn from that, and uh, it's a good uh, platform for all of us and the new techniques which they are using, satellite tagging and uh, other monitoring things and. Uh, analysis and whatever it is for that it requires time and uh, learning lot of things and uh, my wishes is to all of you and uh, thank you good afternoon everyone uh, as a former faculty of uh, ignf i understand it that the last session is a uh, very difficult session to keep away but such was the quality of the presentation that i didn't see many people sleeping that is uh, i would say hats off to the presenters a uh, lot has been said and lot lot of work has been done on birds but i believe there is a lot more to be done especially because the central asian highway uh passes through my state of rajasthan and uh, as uh, some of you pointed out the migratory birds are in the greatest of danger because of the climate change and because the staging post or the intermediate stop over sites are disappearing so we need more studies on that and the whole thing uh got me to wonder that how do you design a conservation program or a conservation landscape for these birds we have done very well with our tigers and the polar landscapes we have started with our grassland landscape i would just say that we have started with the great indian bird and flora of the cheetah we are we have started the uh, aquatic landscape also the aquatic habitat with this uh, dolphin project and hopefully we'll have a few more but the avian ecology is such that it's almost everywhere that you find a bird and as we see we need to control them we need to not allow them at the airports and at the same time at other places we need to conserve them so barring the wetlands where we can uh, we have been able to protect or conserve our 
Breton birds, the other terrestrial birds, and especially the migratory birds, need a lot of conservation design, I would say. And that's where I think Wildlife Institute has to work a lot, lot more than what is being done now. Uh, I, I understand that there are limitations of resources and personnel and all. Uh, I would uh, only request the Wildlife Institute of India and the fact that we are meeting the day after uh, that we can put more focus on this. Thank you. I'd like to uh, end the session by thanking both the chair as well as the co-chair and the session facilitator Ritesh Dautam for him as the first time. Thank you so much uh, for putting together those questions and uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, uh, you know, be part of this uh, session and uh, I would like to hand over the mic to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would request uh, our session co chair Dr. Suresh to kindly present our chair and co-chairs with a token of uh, gratitude. So first, uh, I'll move if you can come forward. Thank you. Um, so we now come to the end of the first day. Uh, not exactly the end, but the end of the technical session. So we will take a break here and we'll meet here back at 7.30 for the cultural program, followed by dinner. So I think we should decorate the hall so that people can do their preparations. So thank you so much.